Thank you.
I'm here with Nagura and Zyro. Of course, later on, Tendles and Dratnas will also be joining us. But first, Nagura, we really didn't get to talk as much yesterday, and I want to catch up. So far, of course, two teams we haven't seen just yet. We'll talk about that in a second. But who are you most excited for today? I mean, I'm definitely excited to see Cheese, right? Because we haven't seen that team uh, at all. And I think we're all really excited to see how they're performing because they haven't really played together before, but they have all of these mm -hmm. star players in that team. So I'm excited to see that. I'm also excited to see what MMDT has to show because they're one of our lower seats, but they played really well yesterday against Thunderstruck. So I'm excited to see them. And of course, Monka, our favorite to win this whole weekend um in the quarterfinals here in the first match yeah looking at that first match Zyro, we have monka going up against thundered now thundered actually looked pretty strong yesterday given uh for what seat they were actually coming in right yeah and you know at the start of the day we weren't quite too sure you know how good their times looked but as we were able to compare them to some of the times we saw from our other you know front runner teams like thunderstruck later on in the day like you said, they did look end up looking pretty strong, and they could definitely pose a little bit of a challenge for Monka here in the quarterfinal. Now, I still do expect Monka to take that series, but it could be a little closer than we initially expected. Yeah, um, we'll talk about the maps in a second, but right after that, you already mentioned it, Nagura, we are going to see Cheese for the very first time going against Thunderstruck. Now, how, how did you feel about what you saw from Thunderstruck so far? Yeah, I'm not sure about Thunderstruck because, I mean, I think they, they looked pretty good, but um, some of their strategies almost seemed like they were maybe like they looked flashy, but then maybe they aren't as efficient as because they were innovative, right? They, they had new things. They, they snapped the breakers onto the last boss in Asher Vault, for example, and it looked like a cool strategy. But then when we looked at the time at the end of the dungeon, it wasn't as fast as Thundered and Thundered is the lower seated team. So I'm a little bit worried about them, but um, again, I mean, they, they come up with new strategies all the time. So it is possible that they have something completely new. So I'm really excited for the Cheese versus Thunderstruck series as well. Yeah, me too. I think that's going to be real exciting. We're going to have a look at our match pool for today. Of course, that first game, we're going to start with the Ruby Life Pool's first dungeon of a series, always the one they have to play which also means we're going to get a little bit more of that Algathar Academy that we saw yesterday for the first time, Zyro. How, how did you like the, the Algathar Academy at the moment? We're running Fortified Boltstring Storming in there. Yeah, Boltstring Algathar is a pretty rough dungeon because it's pretty well known for its really large trash pulls. And we saw some interesting strategies coming out from the teams that played Algathar Academy yesterday. You know, one of the major problems in that dungeon in regards to Boltstring is that area around the Croth boss, where there's a ton, ton of tiny eagle, eagles and the two big eagles that you want to focus down. We saw teams actually mass-rooting the small pack of eagles in the sky so that they could focus down the large eagles, and then once the large eagles' HP got low, they then pulled those mass-rooted mobs in. That was kind of a, a cool idea on how to deal with bolstering in that dungeon. But we've also seen less of snapping so far this week and i'm not sure if that's just a safety play for the early rounds because you know you're faster than the teams you're playing against or if we could potentially see some faster strategies coming out you know potentially today or tomorrow yeah that's a really good point i'm very curious if teams are going to shift their strategy just a little bit more uh before we go away from this graphic though nagura uh the last two games of today bring us two new dungeons that we maybe will see before i'm not too sure on whether or not they will be kept open they're both our 23 dungeons that shadow moon burial grounds has been on 23 for the past two weekends as well but that knockout this weekend looking pretty scary right yeah, for sure. I mean, we asked the teams which dungeons they're most afraid of and which they think the easiest are. And I think a lot of the teams actually said Shadow Moon Bureau Grounds is going to be the easiest, which is uh, interesting because it's at 23, right? And that's the highest key level. And we've seen other teams before and in the previous weekends, um, teams struggled the most with those higher key levels. But then No Code Offensive, on the other hand, I think a lot of teams said that that's going to be one of the most difficult dungeons for them. Because, I mean, we also know on live keys, SPG being one of those easier keys, so maybe they're not too worried about the higher key level there. But No Code Offensive, with Sanguine especially, is making yeah. the dungeon quite a bit harder. 
I absolutely agree. When I first saw that, I think I was on broadcast with Jatnas and Tettles and we were all kind of like, ha, huh, we really did that. The knockout looking scary. I think that's the, that's the dungeon to look out for in this uh, match pool for me personally, at least. Uh, so really curious to see how our game 10 is going to deal with that and whether or not we're going to see it before. We never know, right? Um, but yeah, with that, I think our first team is getting ready. It's going to be Monka against Thundered. Uh, I, before we go there, I want to know who predicted Thundered as wildcard because I know I did, but I asked yesterday and other people were also looking for Thunder's truck. So, Saro, uh, what about you? You you were Thunder's truck, right? We're having a lot of Thunder this MDI. Players. Yeah, a couple <laughs> Thunder teams. I'd love to see what everyone else is on. Oh, a lot of Thundered. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Looking at the weekend winner and the runner-up seems to be, I think this is the first time ever we have a unified winner and runner-up. I'm not sure. I think there's always been like <laughs> one outlier before. Not even Tettles this time. Everyone has gone with Monka and Cheese. And that's really something. Speaking about a team we haven't really we haven't really seen before in that constellation, like you said earlier in Agora, right? Like they're not new players, but a new constellation. So it's really exciting to me to see everybody kind of get behind them and feel like, oh yeah, they're definitely going to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's very cool because a lot of the players, I mean, we, we know of them, right? I think everyone knows Fragnans, used to play in Echo, of course. And then we know um, Femme, he's a very famous uh, live key pushing player, but he also participated in the MDA before. I've played with Femme a lot, and I know that he is just very smart when it comes to um, strategies. And I think that is something that is incredibly important, especially when you form a new team, because if you have experience with each other, at some point you'll realize okay maybe this is more efficient maybe we'll practice this instead of that but uh if you're a completely new team then you really need this one person that knows what you should be doing and you need a smart person when it comes to routes and efficiency and i do think that fam oh. has for this team and that's why i'm so excited for them yeah, we're going to see them in the second game of the day. But first, it's going to be Monka versus Thunder, Zyro. And I saw your eyes looking at these map bands. So tell me a little bit about that. I am very surprised. We're going to see that not good offensive guaranteed here as the second map of the series. Interesting. Algathar being mm -hmm. banned up by Thunder and Court being banned up by Monka. Huh. I wonder what the reasoning for the Court ban would be for Monka, but... We'll have to ask them later on. Of course, we're going to see the Ruby Life Pools, but then going to Knock Hood, then Azure Vault, if we do get to a third map. This is going to be a crazy series. That Knock Hood, like we've been talking about, that's, that's going to be a difficult dungeon. <laughs> yeah, they, they bended before, right? Like, they bended against Dismissed as well in their first series yesterday. So there's actually, something okay. in Court of Stars they either just, I don't know, maybe they're really scared of the dungeon, or they just really want to keep a strategy a secret, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Oh, we'll have to ask them or find out about that later. Teams are getting ready right now. Yesterday, both of these teams played that Mage and Disc Priest, which is something I'm always very excited about, mostly for the Disc side of things. So I'm curious if they're going to play it against each other, and we'll see Miro match up in the teams here with the Mages, Nagura. I think so. I mean, yesterday we saw them both, as you said, play that Fire Mage. And when we look at the timers, yesterday Monka cleared this dungeon in 15 minutes and 45 seconds with zero deaths, while Thunder had cleared in 18 minutes and 33 seconds with four deaths. But you also have to mention that Monka actually made a mistake and they pulled Thunderhead on accident. So Monka yeah. can probably go even faster. But I also think Thunder can go faster because they had those four deaths. So. Yeah, even though there's a three minute difference in those timers from yesterday, I still think Thunder can go a little bit faster, but it's going to be very difficult because uh, Monka is looking really good in Ruby. Remember, Thunder actually can make up a ton of time because they had to form in the first boss, right? So they have a lot yeah. of time they can make up. This could be a lot closer than we initially expected, but we're already underway, both teams using that pre timer and visibility potion to get past the first Juggernaut. Juggernaut. We're off to the races here with this first massive pull here. If I remember correctly, Krim's actually peaked over a million damage yesterday, so let's see if he can recreate that magic here once again. 
Yeah, we do see the Bloodlust being popped and all offensive cooldowns plus defensives being used as well with all of the passive healing coming in from Nature's Vigil from the Feral Druids here. And then the Disc Priest, of course, providing all of that damage reduction and the um, Absorbs as well, really helping them out here. Skylark and Alex also popping all of their defenses to make sure they can survive this pool. And it's looking really good for Monka here, but they bolstered some of these mobs pretty highly. Now they're using their CC, their knockbacks, and so on to make sure that Skylark is not getting hit by any of those bolstered mobs. But you can see just how big they are on both sides. And now they are engaging the mini boss as well on Thunder's side. Yesterday, we saw that they're actually pulling all of this into the boss. But they have to be a little bit careful because all of those extra bolstering sex on the mini boss can cause some issues for the tanks because of that tank attack that this mini boss does. Check this out from Thunder, though. Just pulling everything into the boss, they don't care about the bolstering stacks. They're just going with it right away, and they actually end up pulling the first boss quite a bit earlier because of that. However, they will have to worry about those bolstering stacks on the mini boss. Quite a few more than Munka had on their side. And look at the damage coming out on the group every time those hail bombs come out on these teams. So much for that Disc Priest to deal with. But now, it's just the mini boss plus the boss for Thunder. And Monka, I do. They do have that one Earth Shaper in as well, which could end up being a problem. You know that can cause some issues. Sky, look at Skylux HP. Got to interrupt the slam. Good knockback there to make sure that doesn't go off. They still have that Earth Shaper alive, even now, and that's going to be another bolstering stack. Once it dies, so there's going to be a lot of damage on Skylux for a long time here. Thundered. Don't have to worry about any of that. Yeah, look at that steel barrage coming through with that bolster stacks. Um, Skylark running out of cooldown, still have one shield while left, and last time just came back off uh, cooldown as well. So there's some extra cooldowns available now. But yeah, very difficult, very scary for the tanks here on this boss. Not only on the tanks, but also on the group. I mean, we all know how much damage this boss can do on Tyrannical. It is a 22 key level as well. So whenever those whelps come out, whenever the boss shields uh, herself, there's going to be so much AoE damage. Plus, whenever the shield storm comes out as well, just so much to watch out for. And then additionally, you have to watch out for the charge of the mini boss. You always have to make sure that you dodge out of the blazing rush. And then on top of that, you get those red swirlies on the ground as well from that other ability from the mini boss. So definitely very risky pull for both of these teams. But it's looking really good. And look at the boss's HP. They're so close to each other. Monka just um, getting ahead a little bit. They were actually behind in boss damage for most of this boss, and now they managed to get ahead, just really focusing the boss here and just passively cleaving down the mini boss, while Thunder maybe focuses the mini boss a little bit more. It's really hard to say because they've just been neck and neck the entire time here, and I think there's a really good point to be made about what Thunder has done to their strategy between yesterday and today. I remember at the start of their dungeon yesterday, they kited their trash once it started to bolster on the first pull backwards toward the toward the entrance of the dungeon. They completely changed the strategy. They saw Monk is right. They saw that it was so much faster than theirs, and they were wondering, well, what can we do to go faster here? Yeah, they just kited the trash into the boss, just like Monka did yesterday. That's a huge, huge time increase for them. And see, it's really keeping them neck and neck with Monka. Both teams now have dealt with that mini boss and have the boss below the 10% mark here. So we're going to be within seconds of each other as the first boss goes down. This is a crazy matchup already. Whew. Yeah, this is so cool to see that Thunder is keeping up with Monka. Of course, Monka being our number one seed coming in this week, in, into this weekend, really being the, the favorites here. But Thunder is really so close behind as Monka is now moving to that um, ring area. And remember, last time we saw Monka doing Ruby Life Balls yesterday, they actually accidentally pulled Thunderhead. Now, I don't imagine they're going to make the same mistake again, but watch out what Monka is doing here. They are going to be using that Mind Sooth from Mode Mode onto Thunderhead, and they're, they're trying to move past. But the dangerous thing here is that these Scorchlings, if you pull them, the Mind Sooth is not really going to help you out because they're still going to be body pulling the boss. But this time around, they actually managed just fine, and now they are pulling two Destroyer. It looks like they're on their way to attack that second Destroyer plus the patrol in between. But this is going to be a pretty dangerous pull for Monka, as Thunder is almost doing the same thing on their side too. Yep, going for the same strategy, but not quite grouping it as nicely as Monka. Everything now stacked together. For both teams, got to keep an eye on the Inferno damage coming out on the group. That ticking damage from both of the Blazebound Destroyers. There's so much damage to the group. Double debuffs for Bazook to heal through for Thundered here. He has the help of the Nature's Vigil. Hasn't popped his own VE just yet. 
But you, the, the pack is not done yet. With those first AoEs, you have to remember, it's a bolstering dungeon. You need to focus down these two destroyers. If they start getting too, too many bolstering stacks and an Inferno goes off, it could be a lot of damage on the group here, and that is a, that is a bolstered Inferno that just went on the group. Look at the size of these destroyers for Thundered. They cannot let another Inferno go off. Another one goes off for Monka here. Mode is dead. Instantly battle rest. Crims and Bastion also go down. They're going to instantly release up. That destroyer is bolstered. Like crazy, though, Mode actually cancels the res and opts to release as well, knowing that the next Inferno cast will just kill him, and it does go off onto Skylark. And it actually ends up killing off RX as well, so this is a problem for Monka. Four deaths. The pull is still alive, though. They can release and run back, but this is problems for Monka. They're behind Thundered now. Thundered has finished off that pull. Yeah, for Thunder, it looked a little bit sketchy as well at the end of this pull because some of these destroyers were really highly bolstered and one of the destroyers also casted another Inferno at the very end, doing so much more damage because of the bolstering stacks. But somehow Thunder managed to actually heal through that and survive that bolstered um, destroyer AoE cast at Inferno and they managed to move on. So this is really good for Thunder, just executing that so well and making sure they can heal through that bolstered uh, Inferno cast. And now they're onto their third the story pool doesn't look like they're having any issues here they are of course recovering the cooldowns they're not going to do any crazy pull just now as they're gearing up to pull the boss in just a second yeah monka definitely a little bit behind now considering that they have those four extra deaths on the board meaning they're 20 seconds behind and they're a little bit behind in just dungeon speed as well as the thunder is already done with that third destroyer and the other thing as well is there was a little minor detail that we could have missed very easily that normally wouldn't be an issue with the way that you pull this dungeon, the cadence of the pulls for the teams. Monka actually had to wait even more time. They had to wait like 10 or 15 seconds there because of the Flame Goulet patrol timing, where it flies around, you, you just can't run past otherwise it'll proximity pull. And when you're already behind, waiting those 5 to 10 seconds, and they're doing it again now with the mind suit, they're just waiting for it to fly away, they're just losing so much time because they aren't on the same you know, cadence of dungeon pulls that they're used to. They're just falling even further and further behind here. Look, look at how low this destroyer is for Thunder. Almost dead by the time Monka just gets to the pole here. Not to mention, still, 20 seconds of death timers that they have to chew through. Monka has to have an absolute insane amount of poles, an insane execution of poles for the rest of the dungeon to even have a chance to come back in this thing. This is, this is crazy. Monka on the back foot in the first 10 minutes of the first dungeon of their series. This is crazy. Thunder looking really strong. Hey, that's... An incredible performance by Thunder so far. They are now engaging the second boss here. Now, of course, they have a little bit less space because they skipped both of the dragons. That means that they are dragging the boss all the way to the right side here, and then they're going to be kiting backwards to where the boss in originally spawned. But their rogue actually goes down here. Sorry, their feral goes down here as they have to use the battle rest immediately to get them back up. And it looks like they might have recovered, but this is going to be a little bit of a time loss as the Incarnation has already been popped. So the cooldowns have already been used by their Feral before they went down. So that means they're going to be losing quite a lot of boss damage here on Thunder's side. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but... You know, I think they still have a little bit of a lead. But Monka definitely will take any and every nook and cranny to claw themselves back into this one, and that is definitely going to help. Look at the boss damage. Monka absolutely optimizing as much boss damage as possible and already have pulled ahead on the second boss here. Absolutely insane burst damage coming out of them. Yeah, it looks like the loss of that Incarn was definitely a heavy, heavy loss for Thundered here as Monka already 5% ahead on the boss. Doing a good job clawing themselves back into it. But remember, they can't just win by a little bit. They have to win by a lot. They have to win by over 15 seconds in order to take this dungeon home from this point onwards, and Thundered are doing their best to keep it as close as possible. Yeah, neither of the warriors are actually playing Dwarf. They both play Blood Elf to make sure they have that Arcane Torrent to get rid of all of those magic debuffs in this dungeon. So that means that this boss is actually quite scary for them, not being able to get rid of those that bleed effect that this boss applies with that tank attack. But looking at the defensive cooldowns, Kylark actually having quite a lot available still, while Alex only has one shield wall charge for that ability, so we'll see how that works out for them. The mana on the healer, on Basuk, on Thunder, is also really low. The boss is still 38%, and looking at the mana, it's going to be a little bit scary for them, having to heal through all of these Inferno casts and through the tank damage, having such little mana available to them. Got the Nature's Vigil, Vigil active right now, but it's not really healing anything. Everyone's already top. 
I guess it was for the previous Inferno that I used it for, but for the next one, it's going to be all Bazook, all Personals just to stay alive. And Monk uh, just pulling a little bit further ahead now. The boss, diff boss damage difference now up to around that 7 or 8%. Roughly as they finish towards this boss, but thundered no! The worst possible scenario has happened! Everyone is dead! Oh no! 10% on the boss! This is just That's... so unfortunate for Thunder. They were doing so well. I mean, against Monka being in the lead, that is crazy. But then unfortunately, their Feral going down again, and their tank following immediately after not having any of those battle rests available to get the tank up immediately just cost them to wipe here things can go wrong so quickly on this boss especially at the very end when you're running out of space some of they had actually spawned the, um, the elemental the destroyer past one of those lava pools on the ground so they had to walk over it which caused so many issues for them and the healer being so low on mana actually just made them wipe there at the very end so heartbreaking for thundered as they were doing so well up until this point but monkana already on that last trash pool before they can do the last boss of course still having that blood dust available for the boss they're going to be saving it for that second phase of the last boss and this time around it doesn't look like they have ninja pulled any of these warriors that they <laughs> tried to skip last time around no random halo casts from uh, from mode <laughs> accidentally hitting the warriors this time around you love to see it you love to see the mistakes being kept to a minimum and playing as perfectly as possible when they need to thundered definitely was looking like a strong team 10 minutes into this dungeon, but the dude, that, that one mistake, just not pulling the boss with a little bit extra mana and seeing them bleed out there to that last to that last destroyer, that's just a rough way to lose the dungeon here. Monka looking strong here, only have the warriors left on this pull, and that will be the majority of the trash they have remaining. I believe they need to pull a couple more things. I believe these two warrior patrols, they'll pull them into the boss, and that'll be... All they need to do to finish off the rest of the dungeon here. Now, of course, the boss on its own right on 22 Tyrannical Key is not exactly the easiest thing in the world to deal with. These Flame Spit debuffs do do a lot of damage here. But Mode is a master of the crap. There's no way he lets anyone die to that debuff. Yeah, they should be fine for sure. It is still a high key level, so they have to watch out a little bit. But yeah, I mean, this would have been such a close match if Thundered wouldn't have wiped there at the very end on uh, that boss. Very, very unfortunate. But yeah, there we go. We do see them finishing off those warriors. Of course, bosses do not bolster anymore, so they don't, they don't have to worry about that at all. They can just passively cleave them down as they push the boss into second phase. Holding on to those cooldowns as well, you can see Incarn being available. Army also being held onto by RX, making sure they have all of that available with the Bloodlust, PI as well. And still a lot of defensives available by Skylark 2, plus two battle rests in case something does go wrong. Yeah, and of course they're going to try to milk this as much as possible just to do as much Karaka damage as they possibly can. There's a little bit of a free buffer here, and I imagine the next time the dragon comes down is is when they'll lust here, because you can actually get a bunch of free chip damage in on the boss before he actually flies up. And there it is, the bloodlust has popped and we're off to the races. Double lust, everything being committed here. We even have the army of the dead available once he's free to use it. And this boss is going to absolutely melt, eventually. Hasn't really started melting yet. <laughs> there we go. Now that everything's stacked up, we should see a ton of damage coming out. But this boss really isn't that low, Nagura. They're, they're probably going to get at least two sets of debuffs here. This is going to be a little bit of a rough one for them to heal with. They should have plenty of cooldowns to deal with. I think so as well. PI and all offensive, of course, being used here. They might get one more set of debuffs. We'll see in just a second. But yeah, they, they have Nature's Vigil running, they have all of the defensives available, they also have uh, one Dwarf Racial and Crims plus Ice Block, plus Pain Stuff as well, so they should be alright. As the boss is going lower and lower, and there it is, Monka winning that first Ruby Life Pulse against Thundered, and how close it could have been if Thundered didn't end up wiping on a second boss. And Monka taking that first win, but it didn't feel like that was guaranteed. I think going into the match, we were expecting maybe a harder stomp. Now, obviously that team wipe heavily contributed, but on both sides, there was a little bit of oopsie daisies happening. So we're going to take a look. Before we go in, I want to mention something that I thought was really, really interesting. 
I was looking at the items and the talents that both teams had equipped. And the healers who were both on Disc Priest had a little bit different trinkets. So Motmot was actually running the Desperate Invokers Codex we have seen from Resto Shamans and Temple before, which just gives you a very focused single target damage. And he was using that on the prior targets in the big pulls, like the Juggernaut in that very first pull, making sure that targets like that go down fast and don't get bolstered up, which I think is really, really smart min-maxing of trying to deal with this affix. Uh, and maybe something other teams will pick up on. But yeah, in the beginning, it looked like Thunder actually had the lead here. Both of the teams skipping the dragons. No accidental Thunder hat pulls. Both rounding up these double destroyer pulls here. And I think that's such a scary pull that I just need to call it out every single time. It's just there's so much that goes into this that sometimes you can't even fathom. You can see it here from the other side as well. There are so many interrupts, there's so much CC, the healer needs to pump, everybody needs to keep everything under control, the tank needs to survive, and that in that case was just a little bit too much for Manka. Uh, some deaths coming out there, four people died, I believe, it was first Moat, Crims, Maestine, and then RX followed while the others were running up. Very smart, I think, to deny that battle rest here, knowing that you'll be back with the team in a little bit. But then on the side of Thunder, things took a turn south. Look at that roaring blaze. The interrupt just comes a half a second too late, kills that Pharaoh. Maskin and Bazoo can barely live. They use their battle rest and you think the worst is over. But right after that, uh, well, a little bit after that, they had not much space left and then baiting got a little bit messy and it's something we have seen in the MDI before. These boulders, if you angle them towards the curb here, sometimes they catch on and they just explode the team. They had a full wipe and Monka was able to carry this one home, but it feels like it wasn't really super Grant it to me. So I'm very curious for that knockout that's coming up. Yeah, and looking the other at thing, that, yeah. The other thing as well is that even though this was not the cleanest dungeon for Monk, it's still a whole 45 seconds faster than what we saw from them yesterday. Which kind of goes to show when you pull one of those mini boss mobs, it really puts a damper on the dungeon. It really messes your pull kids, really, me really messes with your cooldowns allocation throughout the rest of the dungeon. So even though there were deaths at the end of one of the pull, the fact that the fact that the tank and their DK were able to finish off the, those last two trash mobs and just kind of save the pull really set Monka in a spot where they could capitalize on the mistake from Thunder. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can see it here. How even? <laughs> yeah, they are Nagura. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, that first pull, they peaked at the same amount of DPS and also, I mean, also, it literally just looks like the same thing. Like, they did the like, exact same pull. <laughs> And then the same thing happens at five minutes again. That is pretty crazy to see. And then, of course, afterwards, things changed with um, the wipes that we've seen and also the differences in uh, pulls. But either way, it's still pretty impressive to see that Thunder kept up with Bonka, right? In DPS and also in the pulls that they did. Yeah, absolutely. That's a feat you can be proud of. Monka is one of the few teams in MDI history that was able to eke out wins against Echo. So definitely the team to look out for. <laughs> but uh, they have another match to go. And that is going to be the knockout. It is the first time we see it. Is there anything you think we can expect in terms of classes? Or are we going to see kind of the thing that has become a little bit of standard with the Feral, the DK, and the Shadow Priest? I don't know. What do you think, Nagura? It's pro uh, probably... mm, I, don't th I don't think we're going to see anything different. No, I don't think so either. Okay. I, think, I think the standard comp, probably. Are we doing Prevoker or are we doing Shaman? Because we've seen both in, in Knockout before. Any, uh, any takers yeah, that, on that one? That's an interesting one. That one I'm not really sure about, because we've seen both. And I think we've asked some teams why they prefer one over the other. And teams said like different things. I'm not even sure if the teams know what's best in this dungeon. Uh, <laughs> They're just curse. maybe it also has to do with the <laughs> Yeah, maybe it also has a little bit to do with the affixes as well. It yeah. is tyrannical. And I did hear that the rest of shamans technically do have more single targets. And especially in the first boss, I think shaman is a bit better because they're not you don't have to run out of range to click on the ballistas. 
right? So, but then at the same time, they're less mobile compared to an evoker. So, yeah, just depends what the team's yeah. like more, maybe. Spirit Walker's Grace has to save the day sometimes as they go in. Of course, that Shaman also brings an interrupt. And this week is not raging. I think last week we saw a lot of evokers due to the affixes, like you said. But uh, I'm excited. I think Moat's Rest of Shaman is called Sad Mode or something. So maybe not too excited <laughs> to play that one. Maybe he is going to go for that evoker. I am very much looking forward to both of these teams going in. We've seen both classes out of both healers. And I mean, maybe we see a rogue, something we've seen a lot in the time trials of the teams. I'm I'm always open for a little bit of variety. Don't don't count me out here. But uh, yeah, it definitely very scary dungeon that we're going to approach here. One of our two plus twenty three dungeons, knockout tyrannical sanguine explosive. There we go. All right. Oh, both ah. teams opting for the provoker. So yeah, I guess that's not too surprising. see what kind of pull they have in store for us here at the start of the dungeon here. We've seen some crazy things. Some of our weekends we've seen triple pulls, but both teams opting to go for a very typical double pull here. It makes sense considering we're on a 23, the highest key level of the tournament. It is, it is tyrannical, so these bosses are going to be very dangerous. But check this out, the pre-time time delay on Crims, just for any errant bleeds that might go out on him, just to keep him alive. Also helps him live through those shoots as well, but this pack being dealt with so quickly and so cleanly from both teams. The damage from Crims is wild here, though. I wonder what differences in Shadow Priest builds there are that allow him to do that much damage. 800k is a massive amount for a, di for a priest to be doing. Yeah, that's definitely a lot of damage coming out of Monka there. As they're now moving on, they are dragging some of these muffs with the higher HP, like some of these Lance Masters. They're just dragging them along because, of course, uh, you don't want to sit there hitting a single target muff for 30% of their HP, so just uh, dragging it forward. It also does look like Thunder was a little bit slower on that first pull, as you mentioned. Mainly the difference looked like it was the Shadow Priest DPS, but uh, we'll see if they actually do something different later on. Sanguine, of course, being a really big problem in this dungeon, especially here on these first couple of pulls. Because you have these archers that don't want to move, they stand still, cast shoot constantly, so that have to make sure they use their knocks and their grips properly. But they have a lot of tools, right? They have all of the evoker knocks and the tail swipes. They have May signs, um, typhoon vortex in case they need it as well for the war spear bleed charge. And then on top of that, they of course also have the grips from the annually decays. So they just need to make sure they use it properly because some of these mobs cannot be displaced. So if you have a Lance Master cast inside a Sanguine Pool, then that's going to be an issue. But to Thunder, it, having their Anomaly DK die here. It looked like he went down to one of those frontal cleaves. Just a straight one shot. He didn't get hit by anything else. So it's a really, really, little weird, but I do commit the battle res instead of having him release and fly back. Which, you know, it is faster. Releasing and flying back would cost you about 15 minutes, you know, 15, 15 seconds of time to fly back. So... Definitely a little faster, and they do need to keep pulling here. They do need to get onto this next trash pack. I wonder, are they just going to pull this into the boss? Monka has done on their side, and yep, Thunder also has pulled that in as well. Neither of the teams doing this with Bloodlust. This is just natty cooldowns going into the boss here. Now, the other question I have about how we're going to deal with this boss on a 23 Tyrannical. At what point do you start see seeing these mobs? Do you see, this, you see them just right away, right off the bat? Or do you have to kill the first few of them? I'm actually not sure, so let's keep an eye on what they're doing here. They did? Okay, I didn't quite see, actually. One month they have a lot of tools, right? They have the mind control from the Shadow Priest. I'm sure they went with the talent that uh, makes the mind control be like a pet of yours, so you don't, you don't have to constantly channel the mind control, of course. So that's probably one thing they're going to do. You can see it on Thunder's side right now. Maskin just used that mind control on one of these saboteurs. And then they also have roots from the the druid in fact the druid can root one single root plus mass root we actually see um thunder does have mass root on their feral druid that they can use and then on top of that they do also have some evokers to see that they can technically use as well so we'll see what they're doing but so far i haven't necessarily seen them focus down any of them at the start when they were pulling the trash on top 
it didn't look like it would have been a time loss to just AoE it down with the rest of the mobs. But now that the trash is going down slowly, they definitely want to make sure just to see them. Because at this point, they would actually have to actively lower their single target damage to kill them. And that is not something they want to do. Yep, for sure. Okay, well, looks like, yeah. Like you mentioned, they're only CCing when they absolutely have to. You know, they're, they're not actually killing any of them, so eh, just playing it safe. Monka has pulled a little bit ahead on the boss here, even though they pulled it roughly the same time, the focus damage just being a little bit better from them. And also, since they pulled the boss first, they're getting those spears off first, those, those dragon killer lances, so this boss will go down first for Monka, but by how much time? Looks like it'll probably be in the realm of, if I had to guess, about 15 seconds, so this first section of the dungeon going that much better for Monka here. Actually, if this next Lance actually kills the boss for them, and the next one doesn't kill for Thunder, it could be a little bit of a longer damage increase for them. Now look at that. Going down right after the Lance here, and th that Lance is about 7% of the HP, so this next Lance isn't going to kill the boss for Thunder. They're going to have to do a solid 3 or 4% more HP than Monka had to do there, so Monka actually quite a bit ahead here. It's going to be... Okay, actually, about 15 seconds. Never mind. <laughs> I thought it was bigger than it was going to be. <laughs> Yeah, the oh, percentage seconds. is the same right. on Trash, right? So the boss yeah, yeah. split is going to be the exact difference between those teams that we see. So Monka definitely ahead a little bit. Taking a look at the cooldowns here, uh, we don't actually see Incarnation for the Feral Druid, unfortunately, for the Thunder side, because Mass Root is uh, moving out that cooldown. Maybe we can fix that for next time. But either way, Monka is now pulling that um, Waterfall pool, which means that there's going to be a lot of mobs there. They also pulled more trash on top of it. It looks like they added some storm shields, plus maybe another pack on the side too. So lots of counts are going to be uh, happening here for Monk in just a second. But this pool very dangerous, especially with Sanguine. You saw some of the knocks coming out here, making sure none of these heal, especially the mini boss that cannot be knocked. You have to be very careful, but it does look like they focused it down using all of their funnel damage onto that uh, mini boss, making sure none of the Sanguine heal does go off on it. And there we go. That was really well done by Monka. Extremely clean from them as well. Thunder is having some issues though. Look at how low Alex is, dro Alex is dropping, trying to kite this trash pack out. Oh, the CC just isn't there from him, and they're so worried about their Sanguine management that the pole really hasn't been stacked on top of itself for that long, and they're just losing more and more and more time to Monka here. Oh no, those those arc blades are just insanguine. They just got healed to 40%. That's that's definitely rough. Look at the healing meters for Thundered here. Four million sanguine healing, and Alex, Alex has had enough. He's just pulling these into the next trash pack. They, they can't afford to lose any more time. This is so dangerous, though, because these... Um... These arc blades, they do so much tank damage if those um, tank attacks actually go through those arcing strikes. So Alex has to be very careful now having... Oh, Basuk actually goes down for Thundered. They do have oh, no. no banners available, so they actually have to release here. Their healer has to fly all the way back. That means Alex has to survive here without a healer and only one shield, board, shield wall charge left as he is using it there to make sure he does survive these arc blades that are still alive from the previous pool. Now, kiting away from that Sanguine that is dropping already, we have Asuka to come back to the group quickly to make sure they're not going to wipe to this pool. Okay, Alright, well... Also on Monka's side, they've decided to pull that Thunder Beast plus two Storm Shield combo into what we typically would deem a cooldown pull on the left side of this area here, where there's only three mobs. Not a cooldown pull at all, actually committing cooldowns to this pull to make it work. There's a lot of tank damage coming out here as well, and Monka makes it look easy. Oh, and Thunder, no more Sanguine problems. Also, another death onto their Feral Druid as well, as Stormcaller Solongo gets healed up by another, like, two and a half million HP. Oh, uh, sanguine, these Sanguine problems for Thunder are just, they're not going away. Yeah, this is just so unfortunate. Of course, losing a player here and there is going to cause everyone else to maybe deviate from their plan, using things a little bit differently, and making sure they play a little bit more defensive, forgetting about certain uh, utility or interrupts possibly. So definitely a little bit of a problem here for Thunder, but it looks like they have recovered now. They can make sure they're moving on from here, but of course they're out of battle rests at this point for another two minutes, so they have to watch out for that. As Monka though, they are about to pull the boss at this point. They do not have Bloodlust available. Raging Tempest has been engaged. None of these affixes necessarily do make the boss more difficult, other than, of 
course, tyrannical. So that is something they have to watch out for. We'll see. But I don't think mode mode is going to have an issue healing up this boss. But, of course, that um, Raging Tempest, that Storm, Lightning Storm can do a lot of damage to your group. We'll see how they deal with the stacks as well, because we've noticed that these teams are trying to extend their stacks as much as they can, trying to keep those 10 stacks on the damage dealers, while the healers, they are just, you know, getting a stack here and there. You can see the Lightning Storm coming out right now, and not having zero extra healing stacks here, while the damage dealers do have up to 7 on their side. But no problem yeah. for a mode at all. It doesn't even look like they're taking any damage at this point, as VE and Nature's Vigil is also being used. Yeah, let's see actually if any of the DPS players for Monka are able to keep their stacks as well. Let's see, Crims, Maystein, RX, do they get the extend? Maystein gets his, Crims gets his, RX gets his, all three of their DPS players got their buff extend, so that is massive for boss damage here, and they're going to have these 10 stacks ramping into their lust when it comes in about 20 seconds here, so this boss looks like it's going down very slowly here, but look at the cooldowns coming up across the board. We've got Army of the Dead coming up in 10 seconds. We got well, They just use power infusion, so that's not going to be up, but I imagine the lust will be used here when it comes up, unless they really want to save it for something massive later on in the dungeon, because I would imagine that this is probably just a 2-lust dungeon. You might be able to get a little bit of a third, like at the end of the last boss. Let's see, do they just pop the Bloodlust? There it is, the Bloodlust with 10 stacks on all of their players. I imagine the Raging Tempest is not long for this world for Monka. Yeah, I do think so as well, as all of their clothes, of course, being popped. Unfortunately, as you said, no PI available here in combination with the army. They're still just going to do so much boss damage as the boss is melting. Thundered on the other side, now also managed to engage the boss too, but of course a little bit behind because of all of the issues they had on this trash. They also are popping their bloodlust on their side during that first lightning storm coming out. There being some issues as Basuk did drop incredibly low on that first AoE. And look at the difference here as well on the boss. Basuk, their um, preservation evoker, actually picked up seven stacks for that first lightning storm, while mm -hmm. Monka had... It, they actually had zero stacks of lightning storm on mode. So Thunder yeah, really had, focusing some of these stacks on their healer to make sure they can survive. Mode had like one or two stacks just from accidentally, just from soaking them to make sure they didn't hit the boss, but he wasn't actively soaking them. The stacks dropped off before the first lightning storm. So yeah, you're right. Like they were really focusing on making sure their damage was as high as possible. And look at the damage we just for the boss there. All three DPS well over 110k. Mode doing 50k on his own. Skylark 75k. Those numbers are absolutely nuts and they are easily moving on to this third section of the dungeon here with plenty of time to spare over thundered here the the the, the gap has opened significantly here and it's not like anything too crazily wrong has happened for thundered right they've had a couple spot deaths here or there which happen but i think the big outlier is that sanguine healing the management for monka has been almost pristine we haven't really seen it pop up on the damage meters at all for them but for Thunder, it has been very present on a couple of those pulls, especially in this Raging Tempest area, where the mini boss heals for a ton, you know, the trash, the arc blades healed for a ton, and it's just setting them so far behind. Yeah, I would also say that Sanguine management was the major difference between the teams so far, as Monka is now in another area where Sanguine can be difficult, though. So Monka does have to look out for Sanguine again on this area. Plus, we haven't really talked about Explosive yet. Um, but Explosive is also a pretty dangerous affix in no quit specifically because you're doing all of these big pulls back to back, especially in that first area that we have seen already, plus this third boss trash pull. So you can see there's 7 to 10 mobs in all of these pulls and of course the healer being the main person that is responsible to finishing off these explosives can be pretty difficult, but Mode doing a really good job handling all of these explosives while uh, Skylark is making sure He's cutting all of these mobs backwards as soon as they're dropped low to make sure none of these Sanguine pools are healing any of the mobs. And you can see Sanguine not even showing up on the, on the healing meter at all. Perfectly mm -hmm. executed by Monka. And again, you know, Sanguine is going to be featured heavily in this dungeon in terms of like what we think is going wrong, especially when you pull this many mobs together, because there are so many casters in these groups, right? You have a misallocated kick somewhere, somebody decides to kick something they don't normally kick, and then you have no way to remove them off from the Sanguine. Right? You have very specific amounts of tools to deal with that Sanguine ethics, and you cannot do anything extra, otherwise you just fall so far behind. 
But as Monka deals with a second pull here, check out this first pull from Thundered here, going for a massive double pull, also pulling the Ahuna Patrol in as well, and this could go really, really well, or it could set them even further behind. Let's see how this plays out for them. Maybe getting clipped by one of the frontals there, dropping him incredibly low. Bazook doing everything he can to keep him alive. But it's, you know, the setup is pretty good for them here. They've got it, everything pretty well stacked. The explosive has gone off, though. This could be scary. There's the Shatter Soul. Everyone getting their clones as quickly as possible. A knockback to make sure things don't get sanguine healing, but that has spread the pull out so far that any real AoE damage can't really happen for them. Yeah, when I was watching them gather up this pool, I was pretty impressed. I was like, oh my god, they're pulling all of this together. But at the end of this pool, I'm not even sure if it was worth it, considering just how much they have to deal with these affixes, right? They have to knock everything apart. There's these death speakers that just stand still for, it feels like an hour, and just channel this cast that you can't really stop. So they're just so spread out that it really, um, it just really takes them so long to finish up the pool at the very end. At the start, they managed to gather up everything, but then at the end, because of Sanguine, it just cost them so much time to actually finish it off. But look how much percent they got from, from this pool. Thunder actually caught up a little bit. But then Thunder, uh, Monk on the other hand, they're close to 90% trash already. They are going to be about to engage the boss as well in just a second. And I wouldn't be mm -hmm. surprised if they pulled this last couple of trash packs into the boss as well. That would be pretty crazy but I could see them doing it. The only reason I would think they wouldn't do it would be because of that Sanguine, right? You really don't want to, you really want to make sure you don't get any Sanguine pools on the boss room, because the boss can just jump to random spots, right? So you'd probably yeah. want to kill them up outside of the room. Let's see, it looks like they are pulling this Beast call Caller in, even committing the men at Grief Torch to getting as much damage on it as possible. If they do drop the Sanguine Puddle in this room, we have to keep an eye on the leaps from the boss here. And actually, the timing might work out really well for here. If they just kill the Beast Caller right here, it's going to leap away and they won't have to worry about that Sanguine Pool. Let's see, do they just focus it down just to, just, just to get the Sanguine Pool down? Looks like they do. Okay, so the Beast Caller's dead. And I think it's in a spot that won't get leapt to, so that's good management for Monka there. And here we go, on to the third boss here. Let's see how much damage does the Gale Arrow do on the 23 Tyrannical. Look at the HP bars. That was quite a bit, but it looks like they used a pretty significant amount of cooldowns to live through that. So, we'll have to keep an eye on every single one of those Gale, gale Arrows. That's, that is a lot of AoE group damage that they have to deal with, especially when you factor in the quick shot damage as well on top of that. It could easily 100 to 0 somebody over the course of a couple seconds. Yeah, definitely can. You do have to make sure you use all of your... or you rotate your defensives for those Gale Arrows, otherwise they can easily one-shot you, even on a 23. But it does look like Monka is doing a really good job. Thundered now on their... It looks like their last trash pull before they are going to be pulling something into the boss here. But yeah, just a little bit behind, unfortunately. All of their pulls look really good. Like, all of their pulls seem very competitive, similar size to Monka. Some pulls even bigger than what Monka is doing. But the Sanguine management is really lacking. You can see again on this pull, the Sanguine healing up to 4 million almost. And it's just costing them so much time, unfortunately. Monka, on the other hand, is now 50% on the boss. And it's not going to be an issue for them at all to finish this off. They are missing 6% on the enemy forces. And very likely that's going to be trash they're going to be making up on the last boss. Either they're pulling the mini bosses into the last boss. Or they're going to pull one of the trash packs next to it. That we've seen some other teams do as well. But I would assume this, the mini bosses are a little bit safer. Considering that it is sanguine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be my guess. They'd go for the mini bosses for the rest of their trash count. I think that's what their count number does intend, if I remember correctly. That is, it is like a little less than six percent that the too many bosses are worth. Thundered looked like they have so essentially the exact same. Is it five percent? Maybe it's. A I know it's maybe it's, a it's bit thirty-two more. count. I'm not sure. Okay, this is gonna sound. Yeah, also only know the count. count. It's it's difficult. <laughs> and the dungeon is five hundred. You do the math. Count. Hold on. Calculator, 32 divided <laughs> by 520, 6.1%. Okay, so yeah, it is a little, oh, it's a little over 6%, actually. Interesting. It's okay, yeah, I mean, the, 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 they could they could do either the mini boss or the trash count. It, it, does, it doesn't matter. They're, they're so far ahead that they could probably pull the trash by itself and not have to worry about pulling them to the boss. But I seriously doubt that is the strategy that Monka will go for. This team is amongst the best. They'll go for the fastest strategy just to try to put that time up on the board and give themselves that confidence going into tomorrow after they take this series. 
third boss is going down for them, and like we said, like we've been saying, only thing between them and a 2-0 victory in this quarter final match is that final boss area. So let's see how they deal with it. Thunder on their side, they're keeping it close as, as close as they can with the problems they've had in this dungeon, right? And you can keep an eye on that Sanguine Icar meter. It's gone wrong for them on this boss while we were talking about that, that count shenanigans. But they're doing a good job to keep it as close as possible. Keeping it within half a boss is pretty impressive considering all the mistakes they've made in this dungeon with that Sanguine Icar. But uh, yeah, Monka just looks like they're that tiny bit better in this dungeon. Yeah, it also looked like they're having some mana issues under Evoker here for Thundered. Now, Evokers, of course, with the Disintegrate and making, getting mana back, um, usually we don't necessarily see Evokers struggling with mana. But because Thundered hasn't been leaving combat for so long, Bastuk not being able to sit down to drink for even a second, and just constantly having to finish off these explosives as well, just barely finding time to cast, uh, to channel this Disintegrate, uh, dropping quite a lot of mana. I don't think it's going to be an issue for them, but definitely something to watch out for a little bit. As Monka now did pull Balakar Khan with those two mini-bosses, as we've mentioned. Now, this is another thing that can be pretty dangerous, right? We have those mini-bosses that have to be interrupted, otherwise the whole group gets feared. Plus, there's a lot of damage on the tank. The bleed being stacked on the mini bosses, plus the extra um, tank attack from the boss itself. Whenever spell reflect is not ready, it can be pretty dangerous. And then on top of that, you have these mini bosses charging around, throwing spears around, plus the boss throwing a spear as well. So it can be a little bit tricky. And it looks like they maybe even focused the ads a little bit here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're focusing them or if they're just really just completely passively cleaving them. But it looks like they are dying decently fast. It looks like they were just full cleaving for the entire first part of the boss here. And now that they've got it very close to the intermission boss HP, they're just going to finish off the two mobs and drop the sanguine puddles in this corner. This is actually like almost perfect damage allocation if you do want to kill them off right before you get to the intermission phase, because of course it faces a 60%. You want to kill these off in the corner where the Sanguine won't be an issue, and there you go. Both mini-bosses dead, 100% count as we go into the intermission phase for Monka here. They do have that third Bloodlust available. I don't think they'll be using it on the intermission itself. They'll probably save it afterwards for pure boss damage to get it th that as quickly as possible. But it definitely could be a play for teams to just say, you know what, we want to be as safe as possible and pop the Bloodlust. Because look at the damage on the team when you get to this intermission phase. The a just the passive AoE storm damage that comes out during this intermission is so incredibly high. They've got the tools to deal with it. The Vampiric Embrace, the Nature's Vigil, even a couple cooldowns being committed just to just to kill that trash there. And here we are into the last phase. Haven't popped the Bloodlust yet, but I imagine they're waiting for that power infusion for the Army of the Dead on the DK to absolutely burst this boss down. Yeah, there it is. Bloodlust and PI being used, plus that army from the Unholy DK. So much single target damage come, gonna come out from this group here. Ooh. Plus, of course, the spell reflect damage on the Prod Warrior doing so much damage on Belakar Khan. So that's gonna be incredibly valuable as well. They do not have any Shadow Melts available anymore on their side. Actually, we do see one Shadow Melt being available on our, on our mm -hmm. X. Um, so if the spear goes on him, they can get rid of that as well. They did use both of them in phase one, so really good value on those racials too. But look how fast the boss is melting, already down to nine percent. Even they, they had the they had the free prowl from the incarn on Mastin on that first first yeah. spear. Just that, that that's pretty nice. They will get this last spear at the very last second. Actually, no, he's got the shadow meld. They don't get any spears. Perfect RNG from Monkey here as Belkar Khan goes down with a pretty quick time, twenty two twenty seven. But zero deaths, minimal sanguine healing. I cannot actually wait to see the damage meters. I want to see what the overall sanguine healing was. But I digress. 2-0 yeah. victory for Monka, moving themselves into the upper finals for tomorrow. Just a fantastic performance from them. Absolutely. I think that is kind of what we expected from them going into today. Of course, that Ruby Life Pulse was a little bit rougher, but the knockout truly showing what Monka as a team is capable of. Before we go into the replays, I have something that I thought was very interesting. I think you brought it up as well, Zyro. Crimson Maskin deciding to play a little bit different builds here. On Crimsite, we have Dark Ascension. And then for Maskin, we have Void Eruption. And both of these come with different idols. So it's overall a little bit of a different build in the Shadow Priest tree. Uh, this translates to how they're pulling, which is why I'm bringing it up. In the very first pull in that knockout, you could see exactly why Crims chose to play that build. It's a lot more bursty. It's a lot more suited for shorter pulls. And then that allows you to have that 700k we saw in the very first pull 
uh, in these spikes. And then on the other side, the build that Maskin was running is a little bit more for elongated pulls, for chain pulling. So just different priority for these teams here. But let's get into it. We have the first boss. Something we saw from both teams is great ad control here. You don't want to spend too much time here dealing with these plane stompers. So we saw control mine being brought out by the Shadow Priest. We saw the roots come out from Maystein um, as well as from the other feral making sure everything is rooted in place even chains of ice coming out in one place here so really really cool to see that but then things went a little bit south for thundered and uh, i heard you guys mention it as well it was a little bit of an affix stiff i feel like sanguine Iker really gave them so much trouble when they moved on to the tempest area like you can see all the puddles here you can see it in the meters that's four million they needed to do more i'm sure we're going to see it in the overall comparison later on and then this next poll is actually really crazy from thundered and it cost their healer his life as well unfortunately so lots and lots of stuff going on there for thundered and then here monka was actually able if you're looking at the player bars you can see the buff from these orbs here they were able to nearly always extend on all of the dps and then use that into that bloodlust that came ready during the fight and moat was the one that wasn't really stacking them up which is a little bit contrary to what we've seen in the past and i thought that was really really cool to see them prioritize the dps just taking these buffs here and then this was where i thought okay maybe can maybe thundered can take it back it was a pretty big pull two pulls together into one but because these Ahuna are not really great at moving around, it felt like it took too long. But here you can see the, the Shadow Priest shine again. Just because it was a rather long pull, Maskin was able to do a lot of damage with the build that he had chosen. And then Monka in the end taking Batak and Balara into Balaka Khan, making sure they finish up the percentage, just passively cleaving them off right before they hit the face. I thought that was very very lovely and a great time overall from monka for sure you can see the overall let's uh, let's have a look at sanguine Iker. wow and if you're looking at monka 7.9 million zyro against 22 million like nearly a third of the healing from sanguine Iker from monka i mean that that is almost the entire difference of the dungeon right there it's that's that's pretty wild yeah, look how much I mean, damage keep in mind did, they actually. Have... <laughs> I just wanted to say <laughs> he is this still mode, running that it's explosive. Yeah, right. It's yeah. explosive, which means that healers on big pools. I mean, all you do is just like global on explosive, global on explosive. All these Asher strikes coming out of the Evoker, still being able to do fifty-one k overall DPS. That is pretty crazy. You know what we should I think we should do. Yeah, we should we should we should add another column for explosives killed whenever it's the explosive. Oh, <laughs> it would just be zero yeah, I'm zero sure zero all of the one hundred fifty would zero. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I think that that also comes down to his trinket choice. Mode mode once again going with uh, the invoker codex, having that single target on demand rather than just trying to passively deal DPS is a really smart choice when you have something like explosive i think um but yeah you can see overall the routing looked pretty similar a little bit of a higher spike in that first pull I i'm going to go ahead and attribute that to crims just blasting that first pull. i was really excited to see shadow priest up there yep. hey, but yeah see, it, uh, was, it was pretty close but yeah at, at around the mm -hmm. six minute mark that's where monka really started taking off and pulling into the lead and you can see that spike around 12 minutes for Monka and 14 minutes for for Thunder. They were just about two minutes behind at that point in the dungeon from Sanguine Management and Spot Deaths. It, this was just yeah. a, a very, very clean dungeon for Monka. It, it was wild how, how easily they were able to pull off a 23 with no mistakes, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, 22 minutes, 27 was their overall time, which I think is really fast for a 23 Tyrannical. That just has to be something you respect uh, out of the other teams that are in this cup. Now, coming up, we do have something we're very excited about after that 2-0. Of course, that means Monka is going to move on into the upper semifinals, and Thundered has to fight in the lower bracket, but I kind of feel like... Or an 11th seed. They did exceptionally well 
I mean, yes, the Sanguine Healing was a lot, but Nagura, I don't think we expected that much from an 11th seat, right? Keeping up with Monka for the most part? Yeah, I mean, 11th seat is good, right? But Monka is this team yeah. that we are hyping up and they're like, you know, they can compete with Echo and they're so good. And then seeing Thunder do so well, especially in that Ruby life pool, was really impressive. And I thought the closest series here is going to be Cheese versus Thunderstruck, the one that is coming up. But now I'm not so sure anymore because the series is really close. So yeah, we'll see. But still, Cheese, uh, of course, coming up. We haven't seen them play yet because uh, they got a pass yesterday. And Thunderstruck, this team, Dr. J, you know, we have these innovative strategies where they come up with completely new things we haven't seen before. So it's going to be a very interesting one, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be right back with that. Don't go anywhere. We'll go into a short break. And then we have Cheese against Thunderstruck coming up.
Welcome back to day two of the MDI. We have got an exciting one for you in this one. We have the Cheese Thunderstruck matchup, which for me, this was the highlight of the day, looking at the bracket going in. Tettles, what are you looking at in this uh, in this matchup? Who, who do you think is going to come out on top? I think chat's probably already spamming that stinky cheese emote, so I think that... <laughs> I think that I'm kind of with chat on this one. I'm a man of the people, and I think that okay, have, this one should be cheese favored. How about you, Makes? Well, I also personally really love cheese, so I'm going to go with cheese, but I also want to say that we saw Thunderstruck in that first dungeon, the Agathar Academy, yesterday, and maybe that was just what they needed to capitalize and be like, oh, you know, this worked well and this didn't work as well and we can maybe save a little bit more time. We saw that from Thundered coming into that Ruby Life Pool, so, so maybe they'll be uh, a lot faster. I mean, Dragonus, you, you were casting that that AA yesterday and like I was I was as analyst on that on that uh, map. I really did not like Thunderstruck's route and it came off like a bit slow. What, what were your general thoughts on that Algothar Academy as it is going to be like the first map in the series? Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about Thunderstruck in that one as well. Of course, you can get a little look at the team here. It's different than Thundered. We have Thundered and Thunderstruck in our <laughs> do not confuse weekend the here. Two. <laughs> so do not confuse the two. Thunderstruck is the, uh, the, it's the Dr. J team, as many have been asking for. But you've also got four other amazing players on this team in Velo, LeMike, Soda, and Yoda. It's a nice uh, cross-region team with the MDI veterans from several winning teams in the past. They're up against Cheese, though, who are a higher-seeded team. And Cheese includes some people that you may recognize, such as Frag, uh, from Echo, previously played on, on the Echo team. We've also got Zatsy, who's an Echo healer. You got Ricky, you got Femme, you got Dranako, right? These are players you'll recognize from the highest level of key pushing, from the Race to World First as well. So uh, some very powerful players, fifth seed in our time trials overall as well. So very, uh, very much one of the favorites to come out of this group. Do you think there was Keep ever a chance mind. that Thunderstruck... Oh, sorry, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, with that time trial, we're saying they're fifth in the time trials, but they played Havoc Demon Hunter in every single run. Yeah, so, uh, that's true. Like, n not hating on the Havoc Demon Hunters. I love that class. I play it myself, but uh, it's not the strongest MDI type style of class. Um, so I think they have a lot more potential going into this, but we're seeing our bands here come in that Azure Vault and the Court of Stars, which means we're also going to see the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds for the first time today. Excited for that. Is there, a is there a chance that Thunderstruck, like, was sandbagging strats yesterday? I mean, we see that sometimes, right, where teams will hide strats, but typically they don't hide strats over the course of, like, the whole entire weekend. They'll hide strats, try to uh, save them between weekends and stuff like that to not fully reveal their hand. Is there a chance that you would, like, first map of the weekend or something like that not go as hard as possible because you know you're against like the 17th seed is that a thing i think I don't so i think so i don't i don't think, i don't think that's something you do in an in like I don't a, think so Algatha 22 on it like and it's not like it's a it's a day three map that you're saving it for i guess this is one of the most important matches in the bracket though but even if you win here you still have to win the upper finals i don't know i i don't think it's realistic to have developed like two different strategies for Algathar and have something that's, you know, good enough to I win day mean... one for sure and then not play it on day two. Maybe, maybe, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm skeptical. So, <laughs> like, looking at the bracket, right? Thunderstruck must have figured out that they can't avoid that Algathar Academy and they're, that their most likely uh, opponent was going to be Cheese, a team that they expect to be really good. Now, if they figured that out and they were like, okay, let's not... Let's not do all the crazy strats. Let's do our normal route, but take it just like a little bit slower um, to not leak everything. I think that is within the realms of possibility. Yeah, it's it would be you would be <laughs> developing like a. I guess if there's something that's like dangerous but faster, you maybe don't do it on day one, and you maybe break it out on day two. But I don't know. I think when you're when you're like saving a strat, you know you're. You, You'd be saving it for one match, right? Like, I think I think usually yeah. when you see teams do that, it's like, oh, we're gonna save our strat on day one and then save it all the way until day three, right? And get get a lot of value out of it when that map shows up here. Whereas this time, 
I don't think I don't think you do it unless it will. I think the the more reasonable thing though is what you said, like the safety. <laughs> you know, let's let's mm-hmm. just not do some of our craziest pulls because we don't want to run yeah. the risk of of wiping on them, and maybe we'll get to see them bust out something new here. Although, I mean, it's bolstering. Really, there's only a couple of spots in this dungeon you could even potentially go bigger. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the rest of the maps in the series too, I, I think that if this goes to a three map series for whatever reason, I do think that Thunderstruck may have the advantage in Ruby Life Pools. They have multiple mage players on their team, and that seems like a dungeon that mage is very, very good at. And and so with the ability to be able to play mage at such a high level in, inside of some of your dungeons, I, I think that that could give Thunderstruck the advantage. Now, it's more of a question is, is Cheese the higher seeded team going to just like 2-0 them in the Algothar Academy and Chatham Imperial Grounds? That, that definitely can happen. But uh, I, I think that like if it does go to a three game series, Thunderstruck and Ruby Life Pulls, I think I think it's a good uh, setup for them. Cheese just a team that we have no idea how fast they are this weekend as well, right? We didn't see them play yesterday, so it's gonna be a big question mark. Are they going to use that Havoc Demon Hunter that Fragments used for all of their time trial uh, <laughs> runs as well? I don't believe that. I mean, <laughs> teams have been using Havoc Demon Multiple teams have used Havoc Demon Hunter. It's yeah? If it's bad, it's not bad by much, and uh, it was good enough to get them the fifth seed in the time trials, right? That's That's gotta count for something, I don't know. Do you think that was a fem I mean, gap then? Maybe. Just looking at what Thunderstruck played yesterday, I mean, obviously we kind of expect a rogue going into the Alcathar Academy to to do all of the snapping, right? You need tricks and you need yeah. vanish kind of to make sure that the snapping works. So we should see at least one rogue, right? Now yeah. We probably also see a DK, because I think most teams have been running a DK. Like, even the teams that play with Havoc Demon Hunter, they run a DK. So, the question is, what is going to be the third DPS to me? Havoc Demon yeah. Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you, you could have Fragnance play the DK, or you could have Ricky play the DK, and then, uh, and then Fragnance on DH or something. But, I don't know, maybe, maybe you put Ricky on, like, a Shadow Priest or something, or... Uh... A feral yeah. druid, Spreast, although feral? he's been like spreest rogue, right? That's been, yeah. been what he's been on a lot. Yeah, and I mean, then you have so to play feral. For this. Yeah. yeah, I'm also very curious to see what the uh, what the teams say. I wonder if this is a place where you could play magician as well. I mean, we uh, we know that Thunderstruck. I don't, I don't think we're getting that in there baited right attempt, now. Maybe production is I mean, saying dr- the talent doesn't know. <laughs> They'll never guess the comp. Now I'm Dranaka even more okay, okay. enticed. So. So hear me out. <laughs> Dranaka loves Warlock. Warlock main. Oh, it's think... an affliction dungeon. It's an affliction dungeon. You play. Okay. You play the dot spec. You could. Is that it's right? not very good on bolstering. That's the, the, the <laughs> problem. Is it's, it's not very good on bolstering. Is the but mm. you could. You could. The, this is the dungeon where you play affliction. If it's any dungeon. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if it's Ath. But I mean, like. <laughs> if you, if, yeah, probably Destro if they're playing it. Yeah, twenty-two four. I could I could see Destro in here, but I don't know. I think I think that the I think that compositions aren't uh, super static in this dungeon. Uh, but I do think the rogue is going to be a mainstay in pretty much every single composition. Could play two rogues, outlaw sub, two great tastes that taste <laughs> great together. Right. I don't yeah, know about that yeah. one either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <It's a> <laughs> I think uh, I think we're, we're going to see when we see it, and I kind of expect the demon hunter to be there, but I'm not really sure. If I want the Demon Hunter to be there, I'm happy to be proven wrong, though. Of course, Thunderstruck, we are expecting them to play the same thing they did yesterday, right? Or is anyone thinking they'll they'll change something class-wise? Uh, no, right? Probably not. I think it'll be the same, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think if anything's going to change with Thunderstruck, it's going to be the route. I don't think it's going to be the classes that they played. That would, that would be even wilder if they showed up with new classes. Oh! Huh? There we go! Let's go! Oh, 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 oh. No, Russian. <laughs> okay, wait. We were, uh-huh? we were getting there. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's Affliction Warlock, Havoc Demon Hunter, Shadow Priest for Cheese versus Thunderstruck's very standard composition of an Holy Death Knight, Rogue, Feral Druid. And let's see what's going on in the Algathar Academy. 
Holy moly! I this? mean, what is this? Yeah, it's 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 an academy. We have came here to learn something, I think, uh, and that's something we're going to get done. I'm just very curious if there's going to be any snapping on the side of cheese, and if yes, how they're going to accomplish it. But for now, we saw both teams do a little bit of skibbity skip and into that big pull here, which uh, I'm always so scared for. They're going to go for that triple pull, and that's one that has has cost teams the entire key. Now, okay. it is fortified bolstering, so they need to make sure they have even damage on everything. Now, this is one of the big <laughs> advantages of that Destro Warlock. You have the Infernal, you have the Blasphemy Stuns, you have the Shadow Fury. On top of that, you saw like the Oppressive Roar coming out from Zatsy on, on the side of Cheese to be able to make sure that those stuns came down perfectly, and that first pack gets obliterated. And that Unruly Textbook they banished it for a second as well to make sure that it uh, didn't bolster up because they saw it was a little bit higher HP. Actually, they don't have blasphemy. I'm I'm, I'm trolling. They're playing affliction. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, of course, of course, they wouldn't have blasphemy. <laughs> That's um, okay. I get a little bit of flustered when teams pull this too. <laughs> Af, Af is actually insane for the tree boss, though. That's that's one of the big advantages of Affliction. In addition to that, like their uh, their funnel damage, it can be very high as well. I'm surprised that we're not seeing a rogue, I guess, on the side of cheese. That's a bit more concerning yeah. mix, uh, especially for like snapping with how popular snapping has been here. I, I wonder if like the upfront damage that cheese is going to bring is going to be able to uh, kind of counter that. But cheese gets Veximus pulled first. Absolutely. I'm just checking up on Fragments' talents because he's neither running Fodder to the Flame nor Legion Decree, but rather going for like a heavy momentum build. I think it's very interesting. Most of the Demon Hunters we have seen so far would rather opt into either Father to the Flame uh, or Legion Decree. So really cool to see that here as well. And if you have been paying attention to the details side on Cheese, th that Demon Hunter has been blasting that first pack as well. So really, really cool to see that come out here. But of course, Thunderstruck is also on Vaximus and actually leading just a little bit. They're still finishing off some of the trash here while dealing with the boss, same as Cheese. Now the last one has gone down. There's still one Ravager that they're going to passively cleave, and they have a little bit more trash count. So looking really, really good here from Thunderstruck. All right, Veximus. I mean, Veximus is dying so fast for them, whereas Cheese is grabbing a little bit more of these uh, foragers and pulling it into the boss. This is. A this is a surprising amount more boss damage, I would say, for uh, on the side of Thunderstruck. They were able... Cheese pulled the boss, what, five to maybe almost ten seconds before Thunderstruck, but Thunderstruck are going to kill the boss somewhere in the order of like 20 to 30 seconds ahead. Yeah, I mean, we're going we're gonna to see is... how it plays out in the long run, right? Of Ooh. course. That Demon Hunter is going to allow you to have a little Jake bit more single target heavy damage rather than the Demon Hunter, I feel like. But yeah, Jay is down is... Uh... Wait, has he taken that battle rest and died instantly? No, no, no. The, he Did he I see declined that? it, I think. I think he declined it. But it... Is he still the battle oh, rest, Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They still have it. Okay. All good. For a second, I was like, no. Well... There was a tick. But yeah, we can see Cheese moving <gasps> on oh. here. No did you way. see that? Yeah, dude, they dropped the Sigil of Misery on that pack. Is, are they going to snap it with the... There's no way that they snap with, like, Sigil of Misery, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's... We'll have to see. I oh, think that okay. was a Here really cool I see skip. what happened. I see what... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fragnus dropped the Sigil of Misery on the pack, and then he melt... Like, yeah. he gets threat with all the mobs and then melds it off. Okay, yeah, so they're he not going to be snapping it. with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this, okay. Makes, this makes way more sense. <laughs> Just figuring it, stuff out in real time. I mean, it's the first time we are seeing that it, that demon hunter here in that dungeon. It feels like so we'll we'll keep a look out on what's going on. But really, really nice little play of Ricky here on that line of sight corner, making sure most of the damage is being avoided rather than putting it on Zatsy. I think that's really really nice. And uh, Thunderstruck, they're moving on as well. I think they played. Uh, no, no, they also skipped the bridge. Okay, so. Basically, same route so far. Okay, now, now here is the this next pull is typically what teams have been snapping um, on bolstering. They're at least snapping one potentially one pack into this guardian uh, guardian sentry. 
Now, I wonder if Cheese has found a way to be able to snap the mobs not utilizing a rogue, or if they're just going to play that Guardian Sentry straight up. I think that, for me, that that's something that's going to cost them a little bit of time. Whereas if you look on the side of Thunderstruck here, you see that it's like Soda uh, had tricks on Lamike, and then once they have uh, hit that wind tunnel, there are some packs that are already on top of this Guardian Sentry where for Cheese, they have some mobs as well. How do they get those mobs, Makes? Did you see? No, I was actually looking at the Bloodlust timing from Cheese because they used it on Vaximus and Thunderstruck yeah. still had that available up until now, so they saved a little bit. But I'm, I'm going to check uh, uh, and see how they got that because I'm not too sure because you can't really drag them on unless you leave combat. We do have a Shadow Melt on the side of Fragments, but it's ready and it hasn't been used for that. Um, so, so it's a little bit of a question, but I'm sure we, we, we will be able to figure it out in just a few seconds. I guess there's a world where it could be like a warlock pet, but that, that Maybe. seems really complicated as well. I don't know. It's it's really interesting that Cheese was able to get this snap dealt with. I wonder, maybe Dratnus will be able to figure it out in the analyst booth, but that's a... Huh, that's really good that they figured out how to snap <laughs> some mobs over here. Um, and look at that. Thunderstruck are able to get their Guardian Sentry killed off. Uh, Cheese pretty close behind. Uh, both, at, both of these teams at 44% enemy forces. Now, it is important to know that Cheese have a 5 second uh, death differential advantage, but I think that the, the routes are going to look very similar for these two teams. Okay, let's just see, because they, they don't snap anything onto these here, right? That's something we saw before from other teams, but it seems like both teams, Cheese and Thundered, not deciding to snap any of, of the planned ads. Mm -hmm. from the ancient onto this so just going to play the eagles by itself and it is bolstering so you really need to target damage the alpha eagles yeah and, and actually one of the advantages of havoc demon hunter on bolstering is like they can drop sigil of misery on top of all those small eagles and leave them cc permanently um whereas for thunderstruck they have that mass root available and if you look underneath the other's frame you can see that like whenever those small eagles come down they'll just utilize that mass root on top of them uh to make sure that they're, they're not going to be like, bolstering them up because those those small eagles do um, bolster. I just uh, watched in a replay and tried to figure out how they got the ads. It didn't seem <laughs> like Dranico was doing something. It looked like they came with fragments, but I'm, I'm, I don't know how that will work. But yeah, we'll, we'll wait for Dratnos to figure that one out, I'm sure. Well, uh, so maybe it is the Warlock pet. Because... It so the reason that it's difficult to do is because you have to be out of combat to be able to hit those wind tunnels at all. And, and I think yeah. that's like the important thing to know is like, oh, so that's why that's why rogues typically do it. And so they have like vanish, right? They, they'll vanish off combat. I just, hmm. Oh, I wonder how they did it. <laughs> it's, just, it's such good tech. We, we are I need, going, we I are going to find keys. it out. <laughs> I need this for my dungeons, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, really cool to see that come out here as both teams chew through those ads, making sure that they have everything down and are able to spawn craft. You can see that right now, the uh, trash count that they have is basically the same. Thunderstruck being able to kill just a little bit quicker, now spawning the boss here, trying to get ahead. But still, they have those five seconds. And I think within that five seconds realm, these two teams are crazy close. On the side of Cheese, you can see everything seems to be ready. They do have that PI, Hunt is coming back up, Meta will still be a little bit, but Adrenico also seems to have all cooldowns available. So everything ready for Cheese. Uh, I'm just not sure if they have the single target damage because on Veximus, it seemed like Thunderstruck had a little bit of an edge over them when it came to that single target prio damage. I think that Affliction Warlock is absolutely cracked at Overgrown Ancient and is going to be doing like 400,000 DPS or something <laughs> like that. So I believe that if there is a way that this composition is going to catch up, it is going to be that Affliction Warlock on uh, <clears throat> on, on uh, Overgrown Ancient. Now, I do think that mm -hmm. she act actually has a decent amount of single target for Croth as well. Like the, the Affliction Warlock, I mean, if you look at the damage meter, it's yeah. doing over 100k DPS. Of course, it did get that power infusion, but that's one of the, the big advantages of that Aflock is like there's their single target and, and specific. Like, they do a lot of single target damage and they do a lot of damage to pulls that are over eight targets. They don't do a lot of like stuff that's in between, but this is a great situation for like the Af Warlock is like, oh yeah, um, it's going to be absolutely pumping on Croth. Where if you look on the other side at Thunderstruck, like 
that feral druid is not necessarily known for having the greatest single target damage to be able to just like burn straight through bosses and whatnot. Yeah, I mean the same could be said for the DK, but uh, DK is also going to be really, really good on that Ancient Overgrown. I think that's one of the fights yeah. for Unholy DK, even on like life push keys. It's just so good there. Um, so they definitely do have that available to them as well on the side of Thunderstruck. But like you're saying, not as strong on pure single target, both the DK and the Feral. But still, Ooh. Thunderstruck has so crossed down to 18% and Cheese is still on 45 I mean, we have a little bit of difference in strategy. Look at this Cheese here. Um, oh my gosh, they, they just triple through the orb. So they, they immediately activated the Wind Gust. Um, uh, goal, and then they triple through the fire orb immediately to activate that um, that burst of damage as well. And I think that the, both yeah. of these teams are going to kill Croth around the same time, Makes. Yeah, look at the damage now coming in from Cheese. Like you said, a little bit of a different approach to that boss here. But now, Croth is just, he's falling over Keeling. 2% on both sides and Thunderstruck and Cheese. Basically a photo wow. finish from both teams on that boss here as they're now moving on. Look at Drenico already having that Warlock portal down, making his team go super fast here and zooming across the platforms. Every single player on Cheese did more than their counterparts on Thunderstruck on that boss. I think that that setup for how they were able to push that boss was absolutely spectacular. And so here is the part where we're looking at the Affliction Warlock. This is the Affliction Warlock show on this next pull and on Overgrown Ancient. A lot of this is going to be due to like Soul Flame damage. Um, now, uh, Soul, Soul Flame is a talent that like whenever you uh, kill a target, it just like does AOE to targets around it. And so once you watch these little lashers die, every single mob is going to like explode, dealing infinite damage to the uh, other mobs around it. Look at Femme, he is taking so much damage, but being safe here, Satsi taking care of his tank, the stagger oh, Femme God. going down here. They oh, do have a battle rest, no. but of course that pole is not under control. Drenico has to run here. You can see the feet burning, trying to get away from them as Femme has been rest and they're trying to get aggro back, but stuff is still out for the kill on Drenico and he needs to keep his feet moving. On the side of Thunderstruck, things are looking a little bit more easy breezy, but that pull that Cheese is doing is just so dangerous and Femme going down here. I feel like they're doing a great oh, job died. of recovering this. Ricky also dies. Ooh, so Ricky releases and he's going to be running back to the group. Um, Thunderstruck have already killed off all of the uh, small um, small adds. They're going to be just dealing with all these lashers. These skitterflies are going to continue to jump around, but the lashers are the ones that are preventing the group from spawning the Overgrown Ancient. At a similar-ish HP, maybe maybe thirty percent for Cheese, where the uh, Lashers are you know around the ten percent mark for Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck are going to get the Overgrown Ancient pulled just a little bit in advance, and that's uh, off the back of that Fem and Ricky death. That's so bad for them. Uh, makes. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, there's still uh, some of these flies that Thunderstruck hasn't dealt with, but on the side of Cheese, you can see those those lashers, and they're pretty big. And now, slowly but surely, they are dying. But of course, with those seeds, they're making Dranico move a lot, which isn't the preferred state for any caster, really. But look, wait, what, what, Satsi is pulling the Echo Knights. Oh. Okay. That's really nice. I love that. Okay, so... Some some little evoker attack here, being able to pull them across the wall, and you can see them come in here. They have a skull mark. Fem is going to walk towards them, make sure he has the acro on them. And that means there's even more AOE targets for the team to have fun with. Yeah. One of the big things about this boss too is you actually want to make sure that the branches spawned in in like on top of the boss as well because soul flame is going to be doing a lot of work here um also so uh, these small lashers that get summoned on this boss are going to just absolutely explode and do infinite amounts of damage um to these echo knights and to the uh the boss itself and to the branch but you have to make sure that everything is going to be stacked up like on top of these lashers because they have such a low amount of hp yeah, absolutely. But look Dude, at the boss boss's is so low. HP. <laughs> how, how is? How, I mean, it is a fortified key, right? So we're we're kind of still in the oh. feeling of tyrannical. It's been a lot of tyrannical in the past keys, but Overgrown Ancient for Thunderstruck is down to fourteen percent, and she is with those extra Echo Knights, also trying to pull very close here, thirty-four. 
on their side. Bloodlust available to both teams. Seems like they're going to hold on to that for the final boss in this dungeon here. But look at the trash can for cheese. They are speeding through this dungeon. Yeah, I mean, that bo that bonus count, I wonder if that's going to allow them to just do one pull into the Echo Dorgosa. I, I wonder if they're going to have to do another pull here, where we know for Thunderstruck, they need to take this area a little bit slower, since it is bolstering, they're not going to be able to just, like, slam all of this trash straight into the boss, whereas for Cheese, that's not super clear, as Overgrown Ancient goes down for them. If they're going into the boss with the remaining, you know, about 15% count, this could oh, be Yoda. very heavily Cheese favored. Yeah, I mean, she's favored Ooh, and she's flavored. Dead. Looks at what they're doing now. Yoda fell for Thunderstruck, but they're working through that pull. And on the side of Cheese, you can see a Mind Soothe being deployed here. I think they're yeah. waiting for Fem to try and round up this pack here. I'm not really sure where he's on the left here. They're waiting for the patrol, and then they're yeah. going to pull this into this, into the boss, and okay. that's going to be bloodlust for them, I would say. And I think that's really smart, because they have the classes to be exceptionally good at that. We just saw Dranico's damage on that Overgrown Ancient, and so they'll be super, super good with this pull here, but on the side of Thunderstruck, they're trying to make way. They're also on the way to that boss pull. Bargainy deaths, this should be a uh, should be a cheese victory here. Now, this is very dangerous, right? All of this trash on top of this boss, especially with these invokers, uh, the invokers, you need to make sure that you're getting kicks on the arcane missiles. You need to make sure that you're not going to get uh, gripped by that um, by that power grip into the uh, Echo Knight's AoE. That's very dangerous as well. But overall, uh, assuming that they don't have any deaths, this should be great for them, as you do see uh, that grip coming in. But ah, Dranaco lovely portal. Away. The Echo Door Ghost is already 60% HP here, Makes, as... Their lust is still rolling. Holy moly. Yeah. Lust is still on. Some of the Echo Knights are slowly but surely dying, but that also means Bolsering is going out on the rest. You can see the skull mark being deployed to the original Restorer, making sure that that's a target we also want to focus since it has a lot of HP right now and it is going to get bolstered. But like you said, the boss is melting we are on 35 percent for cheese and even though thunderstruck is dealing with their stuff really really well right now it is going to come down right to the wire bloodlust now gone for both teams cheese is five seconds in the lead just by default due to the death penalty on the side of thunderstruck but you can see how close it is going to be the restorer now slowly but surely dropping oh. as well making sure they have the trash count that they need and now it's only those eight Eight percent on Echo of Doragosa for cheese, and I think, like you said, we can look at that as a cheese victory in that Algathar Academy with breathtaking 18 minutes and 24 seconds. Wow! Uh, hello, Dratnos. Ah, there we go. Wow, indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike muted Dratnos? Oh, that wasn't me, lying. that was production, that was production's fault this time. <laughs> he's lying, he's lying, he's lying, that was him. This time, this time. Where's our victory screen as All well, right, production? Dratnos. This is getting downright embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, yeah, that was, a, that was a great match for Cheese. You know, I'm sure that Dratnos is, is saying something incredibly... <laughs> incredibly smart and or maybe potentially stupid uh, oh welcome back right now. sorry uh oh, you good make to be it. here yeah uh speaking of things that i'm glad happened wow that was that was a really cool run out of cheese really awesome to see the uh the affliction warlock getting used like that and there was so much cool stuff that they were doing in this run as well so um we'll just go through there's there were about five different things that happened in this run that I think are, are worth pointing out. And it's kind of worth noting that the general texture of this run is if Cheese don't do cool stuff, they're going to probably lose to the the general slight, I would say, DPS edge that on an average pull, Thunderstruck are going to have, right? Uh, like if you're looking on an average pulls where they don't have, particularly where they don't have less and stuff going, uh, Thunderstruck seems to be generally gaining 5, 10 seconds on a lot of those pulls. So it was really a case of, all right, Cheese have got to find some, they got to find some big time saves. And now they're playing without a Rogue as well, right? So they're missing some key pieces of utility that Rogue bring here. Shroud of Concealment uh, is one of them as well. So uh, to get past this next pull, they do the old Sigil of Misery into Shadow Meld trick, 
which is the, the demon hunter <laughs> shroud. Before <laughs> scene tech. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very cool. Yeah, we yeah. all know it, of course. <laughs> so if you're ever playing with it a Havoc demon cool. hunter, just ask them to shroud, and they'll they'll know what you mean. They'll do that. It's it's very good. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Not me though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's really cool way that they, they handled that. But of course, the other problem that you have when you don't have a rogue is you don't have a good way of snapping mobs. Now, that's somewhat solved in this dungeon by the fact you only want to do the snap once. But you can see, okay, so two people got left behind, and there's actually Fragments that was the last person to come up. So what I think happened, and we don't actually have the video of it, I think you dropped a Sigil of Flame and then took the jump, right? Because Sigil of Flame isn't going to get you in combat immediately. So you drop the Sigil yeah. of Flame, you have two seconds before it arms, and you take the jump, and then you get in combat midair, but you're already uh, you're already airborne, and you get to do the snap as a Demon Hunter that way. So that's that's the uh, the Demon Hunter tricks of the trade, is Sigil of Flame. If you're ever uh, awesome. if you ever have a Demon Hunter, you know, you need them to do that snap, you can just ask them and they'll, they'll yeah, know what they, you need. Yeah, they just do everything. Shroud, snap, Demon yeah. Hunter, new utility it's, class. Everybody learned that here first. It's the new Then the Affliction Rogue. Warlock. It does, uh, this is, this is like the strength of the Affliction Warlock is this pull, right? But the thing is, it's also the strength of the Unholy DK, and the Unholy DK yeah. is, you know, it's also kind of a strength yeah. of the Barrel Druid, right? So, uh, the Affliction Warlock was looking good, but... It's not like Thunderstruck weren't also doing really well in this pull. Now, Cheese ended up having like a, a tank death into a bit of a, a disaster pull. I think they would have been a little bit faster on this pull had it not been for that. But it would have only been a little bit because, yeah, the Unholy Feral combo is, is just so strong for uh, that as well. But setting up for this Echo Knights into boss thing here, this cut a pull out of the dungeon for them. And I think this was the, uh, the breaker at the end of the run. Dude, I think that tank death actually cost him so much time because then like the yeah. ads were so spread and then like Soul Flame didn't wasn't able to hit yes. those lashers and they were just like solo DPSing down the lashers forever. That seemed like that was a pretty large time sink. That tree boss as well, the the tree boss is a huge time sink. That's where the affliction lock saved you time, right? Like you kill that yes. tree boss so quickly with an aft lock compared to anything <laughs> yes. else. So uh that was it was that, and then the fact that they pulled trash onto that boss and and saved a pull from their run. That's how they end up being, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes faster. Were deaths on both sides? Uh, although, if you look at Thunderstruck's death counter, a lot of that's going to be the deaths after they knew they they had lost, right, at the end of the run. So those look those don't count. Look at that warlock DPS, though. Holy yeah, moly! Yeah, wow. Is that a new record for us? Two twenty one k overall. I'm not sure I've seen over higher than that. That's uh, that's just an so average far. warlock player. Yeah. <laughs> That's just an average warlock True. player. <laughs> Affliction warlock now undefeated in the in the MDI this season as well. That's crazy. <laughs> when are other teams going to get the memo? All right, <laughs> somebody, all right, somebody tell Echo. After seeing that, do you think we're going to have the same comp in that Shadow Moon burial grounds? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. You, uh, you never play after. I didn't you never think we were going to see Man. that. Okay. It's it's an Algathar Academy only spec. It's it's really all right, bad. All right. I think it's I think it would be really bad in Shadow Moon. <laughs> we could we could see Destro. Destro Destro I don't see see yeah. why it would be bad in there. No, it would be surprising we need to, to see. I need to say know. some demo. Get the uh, oh. like the three infinity yeah. spec <laughs> of Warlock. I think it could happen. <laughs> I, I guess it probably couldn't happen, but yeah, I think Af you're only gonna see Af and Algathar, I think. Although maybe Maybe if there's like a 20 ruby life pools, you could play it there as well. But the thing is, Destro is just so good at that dungeon too, so. So is yeah. Jimmy just going to play, uh, is Fragnus just going to play Havoc Demon Hunter every dungeon again? I think Look so. Look at that! So, wow okay, here's Croth. Here's the, the thing about Croth as well that was so cool, is the way that both teams oh played around. Look at the size of these spikes, right? right? Uh, <laughs> maximizing into, particularly you can multiply, right, with the thundering buff. Uh, yes. Thundering buff, your cooldowns, the stun, uh, potentially the haste buff as well, depending on uh, how much you set it up. Uh, you can get some really insane value on Karoth, and you can see, look particularly at the top there at Cheese, you can see just how much they were holding for the end of this fight when they when they lined everything up and just sent the boss home. Because uh, it was it was looking like they were losing time on this boss. You know, we saw a really good opener for Janako with the, with the PI, but... After that, they were really slowing down relative to Thunderstruck until they got to that big spike at the end and just deleted it. Yeah, that was uh, super cool that... to see, and it's great to see that graph as well. Uh, I mean, Demon Hunter being so bursty, you know, if you have all of your damage ready for that, I think that's so good and so smart of them to do. Yeah, I, I think that like uh, the DPS numbers there 
are not exact. They're not perfect because like the DPS numbers are relative to that like uh, the length of time that's on that Warcraft logs graph. But I think that just like if you're looking at the amount of damage that the classes are doing and stuff like that, and I think that particularly what Dratnus was pointing out, like the the major spikes being the difference there, it, it is uh, uh, quite impressive that the cheese were able to kill that boss so much faster than Thunderstruck. Wow. Well, I don't know how we're going to top that Algathar Academy, but we're going to try and Shadow Moon Burial Grounds up next. The key level is also going up. This dungeon is one where we could see a lot of different stuff as well, right? We could see, uh, you can see mages in here. You could see, okay. I think Havoc, I think it's a good Havoc Demon Hunter dungeon. I'm not sure. I but think so too. I think it, so, you, except for the very it, first right? pull. Except for yeah. the very first pull where they go very big, you ah. usually have like Ooh. five targets. But okay. we're going to see the DK come out here and Thunderstruck Tittles <laughs> has a mage. Yeah. Oh, the doctor is wow. in the house. It, exactly. For anybody that's not familiar, this is the main of Dr. J. He has been playing mage for a long time. And uh, that's definitely something we can ex expect to be very great for Thunderstruck. And now on the side of Cheese, of course, the turnaround to what we found was a little bit more meta uh, throughout the last weekends with the Feral, Unholy DK and the Shadow Priest. But let's see how big they go. I think that this pull has been uh, fairly standard for MDI teams at this point, doing this double, um, doing like these double ritual bones packs into the boss. Now it's very dangerous, and it's one of those situations where we see tanks. It feels like a 50 50 on whether or not your tank lives or dies. It is a 23 raging fortified, by the way. <laughs> and this is yeah. a pull that just it puts so much pressure on your tank. Um, those void slashes, especially whenever you like, Fem right now has shield block or not shield block. He has a spell block and a wall available to him right now. And then once that goes down, you're in a, you're in a lot of trouble. For the side of cheese, we just saw something that makes me so happy every single time. Uh, the Shadow Moon Bender it was control minded by the Shadow Priest. You can see okay. it in the background still. It has an orange mark there on its head keeping that mob under control, and that's one that casts a debuff, and this is not on a timer, making oh. this really, really difficult. So if it gets out and it instantly casts a debuff, you can see it on the left side here for cheese, that is going to be so crucial to dispel instantly, because if it ticks two times, your your player is going to be dead. So that Shadow Moon Bender needs to be kept under control, and keeping it out of that first pull makes that pull so much more controllable, and I love this it tech that the teams boss? are doing it. Thunderstruck is committing to the boss on... Is this the second Dark Communion? Is this boss a Dr. J gap? My god, they, they killed this boss 25% faster than Cheese! All right! Yeah! <laughs> not not yeah. bad for Thunderstruck. <laughs> Holy moly! I mean, we expected great things from that mage, and uh, we got them. I assume he's going to be the target of that PI, of course, so Soda buffing him up on top of that. But really, look at that damage. That's so crazy. Of course, it's not a tyrannical key, so that boss will have a little bit less HP, but still, 23 is not something you just blast through. And I really, really love seeing this here, and I'm curious how teams move on, but Cheese trying to pull even here. They have the same trash that they pulled into boss, but she's a little bit slower on this boss here. 45 seconds slow. Ooh. I, I think that's actually the mage difference. That's just like the, the amount of priority damage that that mage was able to provide to that pack on top of just like doing full damage to the boss um, really helped them push that boss so much faster. Uh, I'm surprised that they were able to get, get it killed off that fast. And look at this, Thunderstruck now down this pack that Cheese is working on. I'm interested to see what they do next. Uh, they are deploying some mine suits. That's the, the modern day shroud as well, where you just mine soothe all of these mobs, you walk to the side, and then you are able to skip pulling the Exhumer and... Um, any of these, any of these dreadbolt cast mobs, and, and looking at cheese, they have a better pat. So, so cheese actually made up a lot of time with their pat being just in a uh, in the correct spot. So they're going to save probably fifteen to twenty seconds off of that patrol. That's good for them. All right, let's see. So something we have seen teams do here on Nalish, which is very common tech, and we're seeing it out of Thunderstruck right now. The Mike pulling these ads here into Nalish before. 
the soul cast goes out now some teams have even opted to do both packs but with fortified uh Ooh. i'm not sure if we're going to see that here this key will have the void vortex first so these mobs have been pulled actually just a tiny bit early but allowing the players to do damage but now the soul steel comes in and that's just gonna make the ads not do anything anymore you can see them stand there they're yeah. not really stunned they're not really rooted but they're kind of now passive uh, allowing you to to do that damage and you can see the souls being used here by the players coming back up for thunderstruck and uh, dr j now making use of that buff look at the dps players just shooting up there wow we that's a lot of damage jay jay alter timed himself and actually sat down in that downstairs phase for a few extra seconds not collecting his soul to make sure that he had his combustion back available for him um so then he could absolutely just pop off on the boss just being able to do full damage with that damage buff having that ignite spread to all of the bonus targets um and, and just cleave off of them like that is it's quite impressive, and they're going to get Nalish down. There's already a 30% gap in boss HP between these two teams, and they pulled the boss within 15 seconds of one another? Like, Thunderstruck's boss damage is, is impressively strong right now. Yeah, absolutely. But then on the other side, if you're looking at that first damage difference and then the pull time difference, Cheese is a little bit faster on the pure AoE, it seems like. So uh, I feel like they can catch back up. There is a lot of trash that comes after Nalish before we go yeah. to the worm. But looking at the worm, even on plus 23, he has so much HP that I'm, I'm really liking that mage pick here. Lovely little tech coming out from Thunderstruck here, making sure that they can clear the Thundering buff, something we've seen in the past week as well. They just uh, killed the boss while they were in that soul phase, and because you don't get out instantly, uh, they just decided to start running, but they still had Thundering, so they put down a World Mark and then another because that one was too far back, making sure that they can stack on it and all come out at the same time, which is really, really cool. Um, making sure you make the most out of the time that you have, just a couple of seconds, but in the end, okay. that's something that always matters in the MDI, right? I think that um, this next boss, and like you were saying, I, I think that this next boss is going to be heavily Thunderstruck favored. Having the double range DPS is, is a is a pretty sizable advantage. Bone Maw, especially after they do their inhale, it, like depending on how fast this Bone Maw fight is for Cheese, um, this could be problematic because like that Feral Druid, that DK, like they, they really can start to lose a decent amount of like boss uptime. Um, especially as compared to, you know, the, the mage plus priest combo on the side of Thunderstruck. Um, but but I think it's going to come down to like this last couple of segments. Thunderstruck already on that carrion worm. They're making sure to cleave down all these bats and spiders. The worm is going to be the mob that uh, dictates the pace of this area the most. It just, it, so they're going to be focusing it down. The, 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 the doctor is in the house. Worm. <laughs> I think wow. that we we saw a record uh, from Drenaco in the previous dungeon on that affliction warlock breaking 200k DPS. Uh, there is a possibility that Dr. J may break 200k DPS in a Shadow Moon Burial Grounds, which is a, a weird one. He is doing the most damage on a lot of these pulls. Now, this is this pull, uh, they're kind of waiting for these bats to come in. He also doesn't have his... Uh, he, he just popped his combustion into that worm, so his damage is going to go up. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he here is in a second. blasting. But like, holy moly, he's doing a lot. Yeah, I mean, just look at it. Like you said, combustion was popped at the beginning of this poll, and this carrion worm it is dropping slowly but surely. Soda also doing so much damage here, and cheese. I mean, they, they are close, but they're still just a little bit behind Thunderstruck, and we're moving into the next boss now. The question is, you're probably going to see the trash being added before Bone Mom, making sure that they have the more trash count out of it. But like you call them, the blueberries in a 23 <laughs> fortified raging, there are another challenge that waits for these oh teams my God, here. Look at Thunderstruck here. Thunderstruck here. Uh, uh, Velo jumped around the wall. He pulled that pack, and that allows him to get 10 bonus count from these uh, little skitterlings as well, um, which which is a way that you can get some count in the boss. Now, this means that you have to do this pack. Typically with the boss in an MDI situation, I wonder if Cheese are going to be doing something similar as we, we can see Zatsy. Oh, yep, Zatsy's also tagging that pack and, the, and Cheese is going to be yep. doing something similar, which is incredibly efficient. 
this match has kind of felt like a little bit of tug and, uh, a tug of war kind of situation where every single time Thunderstruck reaches a boss, they speed up, and every single time Cheese reaches trash, they kind of claw it back a little bit. Now, I wonder what this boss yeah. is going to be looking like. And look at Bone Maw's HP for Thunderstruck. Velo oh. going down. Oh. They do have a battle rest. Lemike dies Lemike. too, though, for Thunderstruck. And I think this is going to be a full no. wipe for them. Oh, my God. That is devastating. Thunderstruck looked so good in that entire dungeon. They always had a little bit of a lead, but like you said, now wiping here, completely resetting that boss. If they just held out a little bit longer, but they weren't able to get everything back under control after the mic died. First Velo, then the mic. The healer was not there. The tank was not there. Dr. J then followed and they had to lay it down, oh, which just throws them back man. so much. Look at all the way they have to run now, trying to get back to this boss. And cheese in the meantime, they're just having a good old time on Boma. Of course, also taking some damage, but the trash has been dealt with. The spiders are down. It's only this worm and two blueberries that stand away from the final boss for cheese. Dude, look at... <laughs> They are so sl It's like I was talking about earlier. They are so slow on killing Bone with this composition. It's... Uh, dude, if Thunderstruck didn't wipe, I'm pretty sure they just win the map. Uh, it's so sad. Now, look at this. Thunderstruck, they have to do that pull again. Uh, they're, they're pulling the bats and those spiders into the boss. Um, Bone Maw has been engaged, but Cheese has something in the order of a 70% boss H uh, HP lead. In addition to that, they have 30 seconds of death differential boss. on top of it. That's true. <laughs> Bonma is a This, this very is not long a normal endeavor. boss. <laughs> like he has so much HP. That is something oh, that, wow. I mean, that's heartbreaking. I felt like this was going to be the one one for Thunderstruck and now it's looking a little bit more cheese favorite. But like you said, Thunderstruck was looking so much better on those bosses and there is still another boss after that. So maybe it's just not over just yet, but those 30 uh, seconds from the deaths are also hurting them. They're opting to use that bloodlust now and here, trying to make the most out of it. But of course, cheese still has it. I think that it, it's it's really easy to like look at the pull that both Cheese and Thunderstruck did in the boss with those spiders um, and with those bats and be like, oh yeah, this, this should be free. But I, I think that that kind of just shows, especially on a 23 fortified raging, just how difficult that pull is. Um, and and Cheese lose, lose fragments, but he does uh, release immediately once once the boss does go down. And so that's just one second. Um, off the or one death off the timer here and now they just have these double blueberries to play solo and then they have Nerzul and barring a catastrophe on Nerzul which can happen it Nerzul is not the easiest boss in the game but barring a catastrophe on Nerzul this should be uh cheese kind of wrapping things up Thunderstruck are going to be downing Bone Maw here in just a couple of seconds and I think that it's going to be close on Nerzul but I I do expect it to be somewhere in the order of like 30 percent boss HP difference um, whenever Cheese is able to finish Nurzel, again, barring any, like, wipes or something. Yeah, but first they need to get through these Void Spawns, and they're not easy. First one has been oh enraged. The Void That's Pole's strange. going <laughs> out before the Void Spawn has been soothed. They're deciding to only soothe the other one, keeping this one okay. enraged now that they're in the Void Eruptions, making sure that this Void Pulse that just now had gone out is not going to be enraged, knowing that they could lift one. Really, really interesting technique from Cheese here as they move for Nerzul, they did a really good job of dealing with these blueberries and still have bloodlust available to them. Now for this final boss, Thunderstruck on the other side. They're now approaching them, looking a so, little bit weaker-ish, but uh, yeah, I mean, they, ha, I don't think they can claw it back here. What do you think we're saving our lust for? You think, you think it's going to line up with like uh, Thundering plus Power Infusion plus Incarn kind of thing? We're, we're just going to save it for like another minute? Kind of what I'm expecting. Yeah, I think that's probably what they're going to do. Just looking at the cooldowns. I mean, Incarn, yeah. Like like you said, maybe a minute. Although, Nerzul is dropping pretty fast. So, maybe we're going to see it pop yeah. just a little bit early as soon as that PI is ready. Making sure they can use it together with the army. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. It should be 20, 22 seconds until that Bloodlust gets popped for cheese. And Thunderstruck. Dealing with these Void Spawns really quickly, now also moving on to Nerzul, and like you said, 30% boss HP roughly between the two teams. 
Chiefs get their Chiefs get their next thundering around like the the thirteen forty five mark here, and so maybe we're going to be sa- saving it for that. Uh, just just looking at their loss, they still haven't popped it. They could they could use it to just like down the wall if they're really concerned about like um, damage on that. But I think it's just going to be that that fourteen forty five mark where um, they're going to be popping that just just to coincide with oh, the here we um, go. with the thundering. But they they actually jam it on the wall, which which again makes sense. This is like a safety play. If they were worried with their, about their wall damage at all, they just they press all their offensive CDs. They burn that ritual of bones, and and this is definitely the safe play. Yeah, for sure. I mean, now they had everything ready, like you said, oh, right? Oh, Drenacol going down here. They do have uh, the battle rest, so it's not all terrible. Uh, Incarn had just gone out, so um, not ideal, kind of but at least. <laughs> It wasn't instantly, you know, there was a few seconds between that. Uh, Ricky now also taking a lot of damage, but Nerzul is down to 6%, 5%. It's dropping constantly. Bloodlust is still running. And in what could have been a turnaround, but wasn't a 2-0 for Cheese here in that second game of the day. The first <laughs> show up in the tournament overall. You can see Femme being pretty, pretty happy with them. Feb looks dead into the camera and smiles for all the fans as he knows they're spamming the cheese emote. Wow, there it is. Uh, the big cheese coming in for, for Feb <laughs> and the gamers. Look at the feta. <laughs> wow. Well, well played by a cheese. But also, I mean, this one was kind of a reverse of the Algathar Academy where I loved seeing what... Uh, Thunderstruck we're up to, right? Taking that mage into the first boss and just dumping a combustion into it and <laughs> melting all of those other mobs around was really uh, Dude. really cool thing to see. Jay did a gross amount of DPS. And like the fact that you yeah. know that he's just combusting the boss and doing 450k DPS to all of this trash is absolutely absurd. He was doing so much damage. Yeah, I mean, this, this is not remotely realistic amounts of damage coming out of Dr. J there. And that's part of the reason that you got to pair it as well with the priest, right? It's just huge value out of the power infusion combined with that with that combustion, especially in the lust, right? And they're just those mages are just ascending when you when you give them all of those tools. Uh, and then of course you have the, the second boss as well, right? Where again you have a big ignite spreading uh, for value onto the onto the ads that you've pulled in, right? You have that spirit that you just pull uh, Bring it over to the side, shackle it. Don't worry about it, and it will uh, it will disappear at the end of the fight, right? A uh, nice little bit of of tech there as well. Uh, so that fight was I, again, I think, looking pretty good for Thunderstruck, but then just disaster struck for them on the old quaking with a bunch of ads that need to get kicked oh. into maybe some of those kicks get missed Oof. into the worms in the back are spitting into the ads are raging and. Yeah, uh, that ends up costing Thunderstruck a run where I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, otherwise, right, they they win this map and we go to a game three. But yeah, it's just it's such a lethal key, right? When you have raging active on those mobs, when the key level is that high, we saw a bunch of random deaths coming out, right? We saw uh, a death coming out on this fight for Cheese as well, but they were able to preserve their battle reses and uh, they were able to recover pretty nicely and they were able to take the <laughs> take the series with the life grip to clear Thundering, one of the other big benefits of the priest of course with this affix something that we didn't get into too much is that frack was also playing gargoyle here allowing him to okay. have a little bit more single target so trying to keep up a little bit with those yeah with the, there that's yeah. i think the second boss you can see <laughs> that this that, is that dk dam first boss first yeah. boss so, okay yeah fair. that's more aoe so <laughs> Well, you can see, yeah, the the PI on the on the DK though with lust on on the pull, right? That's that is huge, and a lot of that, especially with the gargoyle, right? All that gargoyle damage is that's single target, right? Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's big value. Similarly with Doctor J, like a lot of that is the ignite spreading, but yeah. a lot of it is just done to the primary target too. So insane. Well, they saved they saved one fa like phase on that boss, right? And on, on yeah. the first boss by not having to kill like a second ad. Or for cheese, we saw them have to kill a second ad, and that's why they were behind a lot in a lot of the dungeons. Yeah. Like their single target damage on the first boss is a little bit lower. Cheese did get to like grip the ad in, stun it, and just have it die and it's done. It's not, too, but it still is, is slower. Yeah, here's the second boss as well. You can see again. Just look at. It, it is kind of a reverse of the Algathar story where this time it was Thunderstruck that just had everything multiplied all together all at once, right? All of their cooldowns with their damage amp. Uh, and instead it was it was Cheese with the sort of more consistent damage. That's, I think, the benefit of, you know, the unholy feral comps, right? Is just 
you're kind of always doing doing good damage. Yeah, you're you know you got cooldowns yeah. that are really big too, but you're also just kind of always blowing up that AOE. It's just interesting because like if you looked at all the trash packs, it seemed like she's continued to catch up on the trash pulls. Like they, they started to get those uh, those graphs a little bit closer to yeah. one another after every single trash pack, and then it's just like the boss happens and uh, Thunderstruck just immediately just gaps them by thirty percent on the boss, and you're like. Oh my god. All right. Well, this is going to yeah. be a very interesting one. Yeah, if Absolutely. it weren't for that wipe, this one uh this one probably does go the other way, which is really good news for Thunderstruck. Unfortunately, however, they're still getting set down to the lower bracket, so uh they are going to have to fight their way down there. That does mean our chances of a thundered versus thunderstruck thunderdome yeah. in the lower bracket have gone up as well. Oh, so you just called the thunderdome. Uh, they just have to <laughs> the if they each win. The lower semis thunderdome. If they each win their I'm next series, then it's happening, right? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we get the thunderdome in that case. That would be something that's, that's what I'm rooting very for. Very likely. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stand either of you. <laughs> there, you can see. That's TBD lie, versus TBD. You know it. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Yeah. Could be happening. Uh, could but be. first, we so could we get to go to four elimination matches in a row now. That's the the Saturday special here on the MDR. We're gonna have dismissed and bone buds followed by Breaker and MMDT, and then we get to see Thundered and Thunderstruck once again as they play against the winners of those series and. Four teams will be going home off of these next four series, so... Uh, wow, but first is going to be that Dismissed versus Bone Buds matchup. We didn't actually get to see all that much out of uh, these teams as they were 2-0'd yesterday, but I'm curious to see how well... And I, I assume that they both have probably kind of prepped for this lower bracket uh, as something that they were expecting to get into as well, so... We know in the Dismissed versus Bone Buds matchup, I think that uh, two of the maps are two of the ones that Bone Buds played yesterday in that in that Azure Vault and Ruby Life Pools, whereas uh, Dismissed played the Ruby Life Pools and Temple the Jade Serpent. And so they should have a lot of practice and experience on these two dungeons. I think that just like looking at the times, that Azure Vault is very heavily Bone Buds favored if that doesn't get banned out by Dismissed. But that's one of the dungeons that like, we know that almost like consistently across the board teams were citing Azure Vault as one of the easier dungeons to play across the weekend. But uh, the fact that Bone Buds had to practice it early, they, they probably should have a little bit more experience on it. Their timer was, I don't want to say like super close to Thunderds, but it was like competitive enough to where I'm like, oh, okay, they, they were actually going to be able to put up a good time in that Azure Vault. I would be a little bit concerned about that AV if I was dismissed and maybe look to ban it. Yeah, yeah. maybe. I'm really curious for that, for that matchup because obviously dismissed has to be a favorite just because of the logo. And then okay. Bone Buds looked really good yesterday, so both teams looking really good to me. And I'm very curious to see what what actually they're going to ban. I think I agree with you, Thomas. I think that Azure Vault maybe should be a target ban, but uh, we'll see about that. All right, yeah. Which map will they ban? Will the logo decide the series, or will it be the World of Warcraft gameplay? Find out the answer to all these <laughs> questions and more <laughs> after the break. <laughs>
well, well. We lobbed Dratnos after uh, his muting debacle, and now have received Nagura. Uh, welcome back, Nagura. How did you like that last series between Cheese and Thunderstruck? That was really exciting. I loved every second of it. There's so many cool things to see, different comps, different strategies. It was uh, everything I expected and more between those two teams. Really excited. Next up, we got Dismissed and Bone Buds, which uh, we talked a little bit about uh, before the break. Mix was saying that Dismissed is a favorite to win because of their logo. Do you still believe that? Obviously. Yeah, I asked Gosh. chat. They confirmed as logo diff. Easy. I Okay, I got interrupted by go? the break. I was trying to make a coffin dance meme where Bone Buds was going to be carrying Dismiss to their grave. The Bone Buds logo was carrying Dismiss <laughs> logo to the grave, but I uh, I couldn't do it in time, unfortunately. <laughs> As we do have here both of the uh, team's players who stream and uh, their socials attached to them, so go check them out. Hima was streaming yesterday during the broadcast, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, streaming exactly. Indicated. Let's see. Uh, we can sneakily check as no one is noticing that we are doing that. And uh, yeah, he is. Yeah. All right. Um, and, and so the first map we have here is the Algathar Academy. 22 fortified bolstering storming. A very dangerous dungeon. Um, but I think it's going to be super interesting between the two teams if they're going to be doing any strategy differences. Compositions we know aren't always going to be set in stone here uh, with this dungeon. Your girl, what do you think the main choke points are going to be for this dungeon for the the teams to kind of be looking out for like what do you what do you think like the audience needs to be looking out for as well as like oh these are the biggest points to be watching it's interesting right because academy is one of those dungeons where we have seen so many different things like we have seen lots of different comps we have seen lots different strategies different snapping different ways of using their cooldowns so I mean, literally anything can happen in Academy. I don't think there's anything like in particular that uh, we can really look out for. I think the whole dungeon is just exciting. Um, but one thing I wonder mm -hmm. about is their comp they're running, right? Because we have seen some crazy things in Academy. We've seen Fire Mages in Shadow Moon Brewery Grounds. We've seen Fire Mages in Academy. <laughs> we have seen Warlocks in Academy, Havoc Demon Hunters. So we'll see what uh, those two teams are going to okay, be playing here. If you could see any class in spec, what would you want to see? Like, name one. <laughs> Is it Boomkin? Do you want Boomkin? I, I no. can message the teams. I think we can still get that ready. <laughs> I personally don't Don't's think Moonkin is that good in Academy because they are like <laughs> lacking funnel damage, which is really good here. But I, I, I All right. really want to see Enhancement Shaman. I always think Enhancement Shaman is so good here. <laughs> But we never see them. So Dismissed and Bone Buds actually sticking to that uh, meta comp that we've seen a lot of teams play. So no interesting differences here or interesting picks. But uh, both of the teams are going to go to that uh, Veximus area first. We do see the double Shroud come out uh, on both sides. Actually, it looks like Dismissed is holding on to the Shroud. Might be using it later on. So they're just using their Invis pots here. But yeah, they're going to yeah. be gearing up for a big pull, and you got to watch out for bolstering. Absolutely. Something we've seen from teams before is that they invis skip this and then use Shroud for the bridge. Uh, seeing that they didn't bring the clearly superior Demon Hunter for the Sigil of Misery tech into Shadow Melt, but now it is going to be Bloodlust, and they have to be very careful with those bolstering stacks. Like you said, both teams opting to full send it here, and look how beautiful they're dealing with these triple pulls here. That's a very, very scary pull, making what? it look so easy on both sides. As Maggot actually goes down for Dismissed, they did use that Battle Rest and are trying to keep that pull back alive. But Kevin now also taking so much damage and Fuzzy going down. No! Very, very unfortunate as the team is wiping, I'm afraid. Oh no, tragedy for Dismissed. Yeah, there was a battle axe that was so highly bolstered. And then I think a bleed went through on their tank, just one-shotting the tank, basically. And then after the tank went down, they were losing damage because they had to stay alive, making sure they get the tank back up. And then they were just not able to finish off those elementals that were bolstered all the way up. And any cast going through on that elemental, if you have any search cast going through with 10 bolster stacks, it is going to one-shot you on a 22 45. So we saw all of these cast just completely one-shotting the members one after the other. And now they had to completely reset the pool and they're going to go to the tree area now because uh, they just decided, you know what? 
Uh, left didn't work out. Let's try the tree side. Let's see how that works out for us. As they're gathering up everything there. But Bone Butts not having any of those issues on their side. As they managed to finish off all of that trash. And now they actually also pulled a Ravager pack into Veximus as well. And it looks like that they're doing a pretty good job on their side. But yeah, very scary pull on Bolstering especially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and like you said, that's something we've seen from teams before, that they are opting to then play a different route because the route that they originally had planned requires a certain CDs, requires a certain lineup, and that's not given anymore after a team wipe. And they would much rather uh, go here, which is what this Mist are doing. And uh, Bombas, like you said, sneaky breezing through this boss and everything on it they have some foragers here that they're just passively cleaving down making sure that they're kind of just taking passive damage throughout rather than one getting killed off way before the others not getting anything bolstered here but looking really really good it is a 22 fortified bolstering so that is going to be something to look out for and you can see actually Drifty for bone butts taking a lot of the stormings here out for his team making sure that none of the dps players are getting hit by those yeah a really good job by bone butts dismissed now also about to finish off those last few vile lashers that they have to finish off before the boss spawns and I really appreciate Dismiss going to the tree array here because now we have two different points of view, right? We can see Bone Butts doing the Veximus area first and on the other side we can see the tree area. This is perfect for our viewing experience. So big shout out to Dismiss as they're now pulling those last three skitter flies on top of Overgrown Ancient while they wait for it to spawn. And Bone Butts on the other hand is now skipping that second bridge. Yeah, exactly. That's something we said going into that we've seen a lot of the teams do. Now, noticeably, they also have the rogue, so they will be able to actually snap some of the mobs up to the mini boss that's waiting on the area there. But first, they need to get through. You can see the skull mark being deployed to the Ravager that just has the most HP here in this pool, making sure everybody just kind of focuses that one, not letting it get buffed up too much by these bolstering stacks and hoping that everything else takes a little bit of that cleave here. I know that's definitely the target that Hemoglobin is, is taking those wounds down on, making sure that that gets the most damage out of everything. Yeah, Boomba's now getting closer to finishing off that Ravager pool there. They did make sure to, um, obviously, um, deal with bolstering really well. It just looked like they got one more charge though on that bolstered up Ravager, but no problem for their Evoker as they're just line of sighting that charge, making sure it doesn't go out. Making sure they don't get one shot either as the Smith st still working on Overgrown Ancient. But yeah, Overgrown Ancient on a 22 fortified shouldn't really be a problem for the Smith at all. Um, but of course, they're really far behind now after that wipe. Not only the 30 second staff oh, timer, look. but they didn't finish up that so that means they're gonna have to make that trash up later on that was so cute so some of the few classes that doesn't have a lot of mobility like heroic leap is dk and in order to skip the pack that they're then snapping later because you can't get in fight with it it's not going to allow you to take those flight bridges you need to walk around it they don't have a priest so they can't mind soothe it so actually the Prevoker took the DK here and rescued him over across uh, the, the little edge. Looked really, really cute there, making sure that everybody can make it over. And then of course, if you're unfamiliar with snapping, uh, Chippy, I assume, was staying over uh, on the platform, getting in fight with the mob stare, but tricksing Druffy before it, Dr Druffy actually took the flight. And then just vanishing it off, allowing these mobs to snap on over onto the sentry. That way they can make sure that they're not fighting uh, this mob by itself. You can see the same thing now being done by Dismissed. It's really cool tech. We've seen a lot of it last week in the Algathar Academy as well. And if you're interested in that, you should check out the YouTube video that Dratnos did on all of the snapping in Algathar Academy. But for now, Bone Butts do have a little bit of a lead after that unfortunate wipe for Dismissed. They're now moving on to Kroth. You should actually watch the video that I made about Echo's Asher Vault. I think that is a much better video. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, yeah, especially on snapping, right? <laughs> <laughs> they did snap something there too. <laughs> yeah, 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 they did. 
<laughs> but anyway, Bombas is now on that um, Eagle area, and Eagles is something we've talked about a lot this weekend. Just because we have, of course, a bolstering, which means that the bigger eagles are going to be bolstered by the smaller eagles. And the teams have been using different kinds of tools to make sure that doesn't happen, especially on the last eagle pack. Because on the last pack, you have two alpha eagles and small ones. On the previous pack, you only have one big eagle and you can just... Oh, actually, Megat goes down for dismiss and Kevin follows immediately afterwards. As those mobs are really low and the sentry actually has been bolstered a little bit by some of those mobs dying. And they're trying to recover, Ooh. but they're out of battle rests now. Megat is back up, but they're just trying to cut it out. As the sentry just reset on 1% HP, it looks like. That is so unfortunate for dismiss. That's going to be another big time loss for them. Yeah, I mean, Tragedy just has it out for the Smith here after that first swipe. Now also losing that sentry pull. You can kind of see that Maggot is taking it uh, a little bit harshly there, but hopefully that's not going to affect their mental state too much going into the next game. I don't think that this one is just over yet, but it's definitely clearly Bonebutt's favorite now that there is at least... 55 seconds between the two teams, but of course you also have to keep in mind that Dismiss now needs to do this pull here again, and that's just going to cost them so much extra time as Boneboats have moved on to the Eagles and are making sure these go down one by one. Now last week, we did see Rogues snapping additional lashers onto this. It's not going to be a cause for this week just because it adds too much bolstering. But it is a very cool tech that is available in that dungeon if one team ever wanted to go really big with these. Yeah, and it also does look like um, Bone Butts didn't go with the mass route, right? So they didn't have that spell available to make sure that the smaller eagles stay away from the bigger eagles here. At least I don't see it uh, in the frames at the top. So uh, yeah, that is that is something that we have seen most barrel players do. Unless you have a Havoc Demon Hunter, then you can also go with that um, Sigil of Mystery. You can also use the Evoker route, actually. Evoker does have that um, that ability, I forgot, Landslide or something that is called. That will mm -hmm. actually uh, root the mobs as well for a long time. And we've seen that being used as well. So that is also something you can do. But either way, Bone Butts now did summon Croth. And we'll see what kind of strategy they're doing here, right? Because last time around, we saw Cheese just add up both of the buffs. So they were pushing the boss low enough to be able to get the, the fire buff and the wind buff. So you have the extra damage and the haste stacking up. And they also had thundering on top of that. So they managed to nuke the boss so quickly whenever they had all of those buffs lining up. Yeah, they burnt the boss for like 30% of its HP in what felt like 5 seconds. Uh, but we're, like you said, gonna see what bone butts are opting to do here. We have seen teams opt to go for haste first, especially in the more melee heavy flavored comms, because they obviously don't need to cast as much. So having these storming tornadoes around, not as much of an issue for them, but it seems like bone butts are opting to go for fire first. That is going to be Chazazard, who is running those orbs here, as the rest of the team is trying to do more dam. In the meantime, chipping, taking a lot of damage here, as dismissed, I think they're, they're also spawning the boss. I'm not really sure what Magad is doing. Uh, can't see right now. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they have eagles to deal with still. Okay. Yeah, it did look like they were maybe bolstering the eagle a little bit there. But um, yeah, they're going to be fine in just a second. Either way, there's so much time for Dismiss to catch up to anyway with those 11 deaths plus that extra trash they're going to be doing on that Maximus area. But Bone Butts now, down to 27%. They are going to be throwing those orbs into that wind goal as well. So they are going to be getting that haste buff in just a second. And then the boss is going to die in no time. They do have Bloodless available now, but they decide to hold on to it. Actually, one of their players does go down here. It looks like they went down to either a fire puddle or one of those tornadoes that have been spawning oh. right there. But they did use the bell rest to get their DK back up. But yeah, that means the boss is going to die a little bit slower, losing the buff here on their DK. 
Yeah, you could see how they cleared Thundering here as well, making sure that they keep it up until the last second. It's actually really close, but Kraft knows slowly but surely is dropping 6% remaining. As DK actually have a lot to deal with the AoEs here, as you can AMS them. Um, it's going to give you a little bit more to work with. Maybe that was planned there and then not available or something. We don't know. We're going to see uh, what exactly it was. But Bone Buds now moving on to the Overgrown Ancient. That is the penultimate boss that they still need to do in this dungeon other than Echo of Dragosa. And I'm curious if we're going to see a really big pull up here next, Nagura. Yeah, there's some differences we've seen in this area as well, right? Some teams completely opted to skip all of the skitterflies. They walked all the way into the middle where the uh, overgrown ancient stands, pulled all of the lashes there and skipped the skitterflies to make sure they prevent bolstering from applying to those lashers to make sure they can spawn the boss quicker. But it doesn't look like Bonebus is doing that as they're pulling those skitterflies into the lasher packs as well. And then there's one more lasher pack that didn't even aggro yet. It does look like the rogue is going to be tricksing it in just a moment. But yeah, bolstering is going to cause some issues for Bonebus here as that third vile lasher came into the pool a little bit late. Yeah, this poll is really something to look out for. We saw teams do similar polls and actually have wipes and deaths everywhere, but we're going to see how Bone Buds are dealing with it. We just saw the stun from the Evoker coming out, rooting some of them in place or stunning them rather. You can see Nature's Vigil now also up by Luffer, making sure that the team receives some additional healing as they're trying to chew through the pack. Bolstering is going to become relevant in a few seconds. The first mobs are dying off here and the Lashers still have a lot of HP. So that is something that they need to keep in mind. The Skitterflies are dropping though, and it is only the Lashers that will remain now. Yeah, you can see they are bolstered a little bit there from all of those skitter flies going down, but it's not going to be too much of a problem because they don't do that much tank damage. Their tank does use last stand to make sure nothing does go wrong here with those bolstered lashers, and then they're going to be able to engage that boss. Of course, bone butts, they must be aware at this point that they are ahead by quite a lot, considering that this mist had those two full team wipes. So bone butts can also take it a little bit easier if they want to, if they want to maybe not do the last pull into the last boss, for example, which is something we've seen a lot. Um, if they maybe even want to play those skitterflies without pulling it into the boss as well. But it doesn't look like that they're waiting. They are pulling the skitterflies into Overgrown Ancient as soon as it spawns. Yeah, absolutely. We're going into the boss and I just want you to keep your eyes open for that details because right now it's ruled by the rogue. But in just a few seconds, as soon as all of these small at spawn, we're going to see that DK rise up in that meter. And you can see it right now. The first ones have spawned. Army has been popped. All of the cooldowns are now going out. And that unholy DK is loving this moment. Epidemic is going to do massive amounts of damage here. And actually, Luffer keeping up there and even being in front of Hemoglobin for the moment. Really, really showing off that feral dam as well. Lovely to see these two classes shine here, and that's just, that's the boss for it, right? Yeah, I'm sure Laffer was uh, only doing uh, single target damage here, only using those um, bites. As fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only funneling. Sure. I um, <laughs> <laughs> but this miss did finish off Karath now, so they're going to be finally able to move on. But... Because they wiped earlier on that Bexum's area, they're going to have to go back there. They're going to have to make up all of this trash percentage that they didn't manage to do earlier on. And because they have to backtrack, that means they're also going to have to double skip. And they only have one shroud available here. So they either have to use the shroud to get to Bexumus, or um, they have to use it backwards. Either know, way, they're, they're going to have to use trash, an invis huh? spot. Yeah, yeah, but there's two bridges, right? That they're going to have to skip True. eventually. So... Uh, we'll see what they do with that. Either they use the Invis pot or, I mean, they can even technically uh, death skip after the boss and be faster. But oh, yeah, that's a lot of whoa, 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 death whoa, whoa, whoa. timers. We'll see Bone what bats. they do. <laughs> they actually, they pulled the pack at the bottom of the stairs, at the top of the stairs, and then Hemoglobin even gripped the pack on the right end. So this is actually a triple Echo Knights pack 
which is pretty dangerous on bolstering nonetheless. So you can keep these under control with a lot. You can CC them, you can grit them, you can you can send them like any CC will work on those whirlwinds. But of course, you can also just kite it. The problem if you're just always stepping away from those whirlwinds is that people like your DK and your Feral are just not going to have an as fun time and some of these mobs are probably going to have a little bit more HP so ideally you want to try and keep them all together you can see uh, the Grief Torch also being deployed here and these Echo Knights are now growing the bolstering stacks are coming in and Drifty needs to survive this yeah, that's going to be a lot of damage here on the on the tank until those bolstering stacks do run out we can see the tank just not even trying to tank those mobs, just kiting them backwards while they're being slowed by the rest of the team. And it does look like they are good to go. They they have a little bit less than 10% trash left to do. And that is definitely something they could be pulling on the boss if they want to risk it. I don't necessarily think they have to, right? They could just pull this trash by itself and then pull the boss afterwards. But they have all cooldowns available. They have Bloodlust, they have everything available. So sometimes it's safer to do the bigger pull, because if you have all cooldowns available, then things are just going to be melting, especially with this comp that they're running. So it does look like that's exactly what they're going to be doing. They are holding on to Bloodlust for a little while, maybe for the army and for Incarnation to come back for um, the Feral and the Unholy DK. Yeah, I think that's absolutely what is happening. There is going to be eight seconds, two seconds as it gets reduced by that DK. And in a few seconds, we are going to pop that lust. There we go. And now this pull should get a lot easier. It's going to help your healer make sure that they can heal through it. And it's going to allow your DPS, like you said, to really melt all of those Echo Knights. You can see that there's a skull mark also being deployed on one of them, trying to keep some interrupts there, making sure that they're not having any additional casts go out to the team. But they're doing a fantastic job of that, looking really, really good in that Algathar Academy here from Bone Butts. I'm really liking this. And yeah, slowly but surely, Trash is dying off, and it will only be the boss that remains after that. Yeah, really well executed by Bone Butts as their last is running out now. And those last few Echo Knights that they uh, still have to deal with are not going to be an issue at all. They did stun the Echo Knights right before they got pulled in by a Duragosa. So that is always a really cool thing to see. They want to make sure that no one gets gripped into that whirlwind, of course. So they are using those AoE stuns and CCs that they have available to them whenever that ability does happen. Um, their Evoker is also running um, the Living Breath. That is the word, right? Living flame, living breath. I trust so much. you on it. <laughs> Whenever the evoker just like, you know, flies over, that's the ability I mean. Yeah. <laughs> that one yeah, does yeah. He's stun. He's running that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We also saw the oppressive roar plus living breath combo earlier on, which is always really cool to see. I love it when evokers do the deep breath. There we go. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many breaths and living things. I don't know. Evoker abilities. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. You know it, it, I mean. it's, it's evoker things. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, look at Bone Buds. They're close to killing. And the best time we had in the Alcathar Academy so far was 18 minutes 24 in that crazy fast cheese run. But Bone Buds with 20 minutes and 13 seconds, not very far off. Chaz casting some life into the Bone Buds with his living breath. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that Bone Buds, dude, they looked pretty good. I was, I, you, you never really know what you're gonna kind of get with some of these lower bracket matchups. But Bone Buds, man, I thought I thought that that Algathar Academy looked fairly solid from them, man. I think it's gonna shape up to be a pretty interesting series. Absolutely. I'm really excited for it, but uh, tell us a little yeah. bit about how that run went down here. Unfortunately for the Smith, started with a wipe, right? Yeah, I mean, this triple pull and Vex area is so dangerous, right? It's just like tank It's tank damage and like the battle axe whenever it um, casts that bleed on your tank. Uh, it's like a 22 fortified, right? There, there's always a situation where your tank is going to die to that battle axe bleed. And then beyond that, this is more or less just the Bone Buds show. They they played a fairly standard route. You know, the snaps that they were doing, they, they weren't going like super aggressive with their snaps here. They were playing something that was a bit more conservative again because like bolstering. But uh, I, I think that overall, this is what Bone Buds needed to do. They needed to show that they can be consistent. They can do... This is actually a very 
route that was reminiscent of like the Thunderstruck route in here that we were talking about a little bit yesterday. It was like, okay, can they potentially go bigger? And for Bone Buds, they, they kind of looked at like what Thunderstruck were doing. They played a similar route. Uh, they're playing a similar composition as well. And I, I, it worked out well for them. And now it's a question of, are they going to be able to maintain that consistency throughout the rest of the weekend? Are they going to be able to maintain that consistency throughout the rest of the series? But if they continue to have it, I don't see a reason that they shouldn't be uh, able to 2-0 here. Yeah, absolutely. I think they looked really good yesterday, and I really liked this Algathar Academy from them as well. Like I said, I think they weren't far off from Cheese, and they definitely weren't far off from the Thunderstruck Algathar Academy that we saw yesterday with 29. It's 20 yeah. seconds difference between those two teams. And knowing the seeding of those teams, that's definitely something you have to keep in mind, right? Bone Buds came in on 14th seed and Thunderstruck came in 8th seed. So there is a little bit of a difference. And them being so close in this Elzathar Academy is definitely a feat that Bone Buds can be proud of. Now, looking at that next series, uh, Dismissed really has to make sure that these wipes are not getting to them, right? That's something you, you have to keep in mind. You're always a little bit nervous first game of the day. Uh, they need to make sure that they're approaching the Shadow Moon burial grounds with like a level, level headedness. Is that a w word? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll allow it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Just making up words on the go. You know me. <laughs> Mayhaps. <laughs> it could have been any of us. All right. Part. Um, <laughs> that Shadow Moon burial ground. It's on that uh, that twenty three setting with fortified raging quaking. Now, is this one that you think Dismiss is going to be able to kind of shake off, like what happened in the Algathar Academy, Nagura? Do you think? Do you think it's something that they're just going to be able to, like, oh gosh, because the the first pull of Shadow Moon is always just like insane. Yeah. So I don't necessarily doubt the fact that they can shake off their loss here and perform well, but yeah. I do think that um, Bone Butts just generally is a little. You know, they're the higher seed coming in, they're a little bit more consistent, and their strategies seem a little bit uh, faster. So the one thing, mm -hmm. though, that uh, can happen is that something goes wrong for Bone Butts too, right? Especially in this SPG, it's a 23 key. As you said, so many things can go wrong. So if this miss plays cleanly, I don't necessarily think they need to do anything like insanely risky because Bone Butts is fast, but they're not like... Monka speed, right? So I do think that if um, <laughs> if Dismiss plays cleanly, then they have a chance of winning if Bone Butts makes any kind of mistake. Very few teams are Monka speed. <laughs> yeah. I, <I'm, laughs> I think I'm interested in seeing compositions from these two teams. Uh, this, is, this is one of the ones that we saw earlier, and we, we saw the Fire Mage um, coming out of Cheese in this dungeon, and makes you and I were casting that. Really like the Fire Mage. Do you think that there's opportunity for other compositions i mean both dismissed and bone buds were running a very standard comp in aa so i guess i don't i don't yeah. necessarily think that they're gonna like deviate too hard in shadow moon but i mean they could i mean i'm just saying that in the time trials bone buds did bring out a shaman so i feel like that could be a thing and they also brought out enhance? the devastation evoker yeah, it was an enhance. Well, I'd but, love that. You know, <laughs> things are open. Maybe that's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know what the teams are doing in the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds 23. I would like to see it. I would even like to see the Devastation Evoker because we haven't seen too much of it. But um, yeah, that's just something that's up for grabs. Dismissed also played uh, an Enhancement Shaman in their time trials. And they also played uh, Havoc Demon Hunter. So we have a lot of options of characters that we could get here, technically. Now, if you're asking me what I'm expecting to see, I would love okay. to see that enhance. I th I still think the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds is good for Demon Hunter, just because how it's path. The first pull, not so much, but everything after that is very much like, y you can pull it around five targets, and that's kind of where Demon Hunter is very yeah. good. We saw that from Cement Gaming last weekend, so I think that's something that could be an option. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to be surprised. I think for things to watch out for here, I think that that first pull, uh, especially if they're take, if teams are taking trash on the boss, that's always something that can go wrong. Um, it's 23 Fortified Raging, like tank damage, just as a general rule across this whole entire dungeon is going to be super high. I think it's the Preservation of Ochre is going to be likely, especially with that overall talent to be able to soothe. But uh, I still think just like watch out for the uh, amount of tank damage that's coming out uh, into these teams. And, by the way, this is Bone Bud's home map. 
They got home field advantage here in the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. Yeah, and it seems like True. they're not going to give us any exciting picks here. It is going to be the Shadow Priest on the side of Bone Buds and the Rogue on the side of Dismissed. No Enhancement Shaman, Nagura. I'm very sorry. Well, still see the Rogue, though. I think that is something that we don't always see in SPG either. So technically, they could do something interesting with the Rogue. We all have to see. As Dismissed, it does do a pretty standard, I would say, like almost like life key pull here on the side mm -hmm. where they in, uh, instantly shroud those three mobs at the start, but then pull that wit spawn with those um, with the trash pack standing there with the spirits and the loyalist. While Bone Bats, on the other hand, does do one of those pulls that we have seen other MDI teams do, where you just skip all of that first area and then you pull everything into the boss and this is where you have to keep an eye on bone buds because there's so much tank damage going on with all of these uh ritual bones doing that tank frontal tank attack that does so much damage they constantly have to interrupt um the caster as well they have to interrupt the heal plus the void bolts going off as well and there's a magic diva that is being randomly cast on a group you can see it right there being dwarfed by their dk immediately using that dwarf racial getting rid of that because that debuff takes for so much damage and if it if you don't react to it immediately it can easily kill somebody especially doing those uh doing that aoe cast from the boss yeah absolutely but on the side of bone butts we're also not going all the way like other teams have done previously we're just taking half of the polls it's only 13 percent trash that they're getting into sedana here on the side of dismissed of course they took a few longer steps but like you can see they have a lot of trash on the boss and they have a lot of trash already done so while they're a little bit behind in boss hp they're actually ahead in trash hp or trash percent rather we're gonna see how it looks when we come out of this fight here once you're done with everything here thundering being cleared here by dismissed maggot actually taking so much damage here but should survive and bone boats are close to finishing the boss one more time focusing that defiled spirit but i think that should be the last one and after that sadana is going to die yeah, a little bit of a struggle there at the very end uh, for Dismissed for those last couple of trash mobs that were alive. No more defensive cooldowns av available on Maggot there at the end. Did use time dilation from their Evoker to make sure that they can stay alive a little bit longer. But yeah, definitely some issues there. No problem anymore though, as only the boss is left alive for Dismissed. But Bone Buds, because uh, as you said, they did pull a little bit less trash percentage and they pulled it into the boss, they're going to be done with the boss already. And now we'll see if they do this pull here, and it does look like they are. Some teams decided to skip this trash pack here specifically, but Bone Buds does not, as they did um, only 13% trash early on, so that means that they have to play quite a lot uh, in the rest of this dungeon. So not too much skipping going on, as Chippy actually goes down for Bone Buds, they do commit a battle rest immediately. Um, doesn't look like Chippy wants to use it just yet, but there we go, using it after all actually yeah yeah they did use it okay yeah yeah they did use it uh, i think they were just waiting for everything to be stunned we saw uh Chizizart actually doing the deep breath making sure that everything's under control and i think then he accepted making sure that there was no like random cast going out and as you can see bone butts now ahead in trash count and of course they're also finished with sedana a little bit of a skip here on the side of bone butts as Dismiss is still in fight with that boss. Yeah, Dismiss is actually taking quite some time to finish off this boss here. Um, I didn't see if the boss actually healed because that is also something that is possible on that 23, especially early on when there's other trash mobs around. If you don't finish off that at in time, then the boss does get healed and also gets a damage buff for the rest of the fight, which is definitely not ideal. You don't want to see that happen, but uh, I don't necessarily think it happened for Dismiss, but that could technically be something that uh, made them take so long for the boss. But Bone Buds now still doing trash. They definitely go a little bit slower now. We've seen some teams just pull some of these Exhumers into the next boss. But Bone Buds just um, chilling out a bit, maybe waiting for some of those uh, offensive cooldowns to come back up. And then pulling the boss maybe into some other trash packs that are around on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very curious to see how much trash they're going to take into Nalish here. Last week, 
We saw some teams opting to take both trash packs here that are uh, in the back around the pillar into Nalish before the soul gets casted. And I think that's such a good tech if you're able to survive it. We can see Druffy now taking the first pack. Hemoglobin actually going down. I think he was instantly hit by something maybe aggro. They do not have a battle rest. It is terrible for the bone butts. They're trying to, to get everything under control here, but they can't pick him back up. They're going to need to four-man it, which is definitely going to be a challenge. Now they have the the ad on the side the exhumer they have it shackled that's very good that's going to give them count they're now into the soul face and that's going to make sure that the additional trash here doesn't give them too much trouble but you're going to miss so much damage on this entire pole here just formatting it that allows this mist to actually catch back up and if you're looking at trash count they have already done that in terms of trash count they just need to catch back up on the actual dungeon progression yeah, and their main AoE damage dealer went down, right? The Unholy DK is usually the ones that are the best at these kind of pulls into the into the bosses where you have uh, all of your AoE. Oh, Chippy actually goes down too for no, Bone, but that's and a they reset. don't have a Memorous available, so they have to reset. Yeah, as you said, I do not think they can necessarily finish off all of this with only one damage dealer alive, and there we go. They okay, are but I actually reset. like this. <laughs> Yeah, I think I they should have done it much earlier. They wipe <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, I prefer they wipe it and do it again. It's going to make it easier. They're going to be faster than formatting it uh, on that 23. Now, on the side of this mist, Kevin also went down. So they're going into this boss fight without a battle rest too. Now, hopefully everything goes right for them. And that could be the 1-1 one -one here in this map. They seem to have a little bit of a different pathing to the bone buds. But so far, it's doing them favors. They're now pulling the pack here, making sure everybody survives, hopefully, before the soul shift is casted. And then they should be getting a little bit of help. Planar shift comes first, Void Vortex, and then we go into phase. Until then, they need to survive. Nature's Vigil also coming out. Kevin here, as well as Barkskin, making sure he is safe. Nothing's going to go down. And now they have the face available. Like Soaker is super close to that pack there, but will manage to get out without pulling them. Yeah, so Bone Butts, um, because they have to walk all the way back from the entrance, right? So this is a really big time loss for them. And additionally, they also made a mistake with their tank releasing on accident, just pressing that release button a little bit too early, which meant that uh, they weren't able to skip that first trash pack that they skipped initially. Um, so they had to die while the Feral Druid did dress up the tank again, and now they're going to be back to the rest of the group, resting up one more time. This Exhumer, I don't know, the tank might have to die again, unless maybe they rest up the group and then they just play it. Maybe oh, that's a better no. idea. But yeah, just uh, really unfortunate that their tank released here, um, causing them even more time loss. But yeah, they mi dismissed doing a really good job as they finished off all Come of the on. trash now that they no, had pulled on top. he got quaked! No. Oh, that was mean! You could see it on his face. The revive was so close to being cast. It was like half a second and that quaking came through, locking him out. He thought he was able to make it. You could see it in his face just being like, come on now. But yeah, team is going, nope, another quake is going to be back with him in just a second. Quaking not doing them any favors here. At least they had the mind soothers to get the tank back. That's something, right? The Shutter Priest is yeah. walking there and soothing them up, make sure the tank can come back. But yeah, this is this just cost them so much time, right? This is so unfortunate that the run back was so long. And now they have to recast rest again because Quaking had that, had interrupted them one more time. Just uh, the absolute worst timing on those Quaking casts coming in for Bone Buds here. This miss now done with the boss though. They have pretty bad thundering timing as it just now happened at the end of the boss fight here. So I'm not going to have it up for the next trash pool. But yeah, everything now in favor of this miss as they're one full boss ahead, plus 20% trash as well. Yeah, they have a really, really big lead here. And that's just, you know, in those old dungeons, you just always have to walk all the way, it seems like. 
which uh, is not always something that is going to be fun. So lots of time spent here by the Bone Buds just traversing this dungeon as the mist, uh, Dismissed also has moved on. Now we're seeing them go a little bit safer here. I think maybe at this point they know that Bone Buds have wiped. We don't know for sure if that's their normal route, but it's definitely taking a little bit of the safer approach here with the spiders not pulling everything down instantly, making sure you have the Plague Buds under control first and then taking the spider on the way it's going to die as you move into the next pack now we have seen trouble on the next bridge before it is not very easy there is going to be raging there is going to be fortified and quaking the space is not big as one of the spiders actually was not interrupted this is taking a lot of damage at amz coming in clutch i'm not sure if that was planned but definitely they have everything on the way now with all of those spiders here they need to interrupt them make sure not another cast goes out that's so much damage onto the entire team yeah, definitely don't want to have any of those casts going off as they now do aggro that worm. But keep in mind, it is bolt, uh, it is raging, so they have to worry about those um, raging spells as well. You can see the oppressive roar actually coming out from the evoker, making sure most of these spatters are being dispelled from that affix. And now they're gathering up those bats into the pool as well that also have to be interrupted. So lots of interrupts to watch out for here. And the spiders, they can actually not be disrupted. So you cannot use any kind of stuns or knocks, knockbacks for the spiders. So it's a lot more important to assign your actual interrupts for the spiders. And then the bats, they can be interrupted with typhoons, with uh, Inkebor, any kind of stun from the warrior. So that shouldn't be an issue. And they have been doing a really good job dealing with those casts from all of those ads. And yeah, this miss. May, they could they could be pulling um, the spider pack after Bone Maw back into the boss. Mm -hmm. That is something we've seen a lot. But then at the same time, they don't necessarily need to do it, uh, considering they are pretty far ahead. So we'll see what they do. If you pull it before you do Bone Maw, you, you get more account though. So the little spider links mm -hmm. are going to despawn once Bone Maw is dead. So you want to pull it prior to Bone Maw or into Bone Maw if you need those extra spider links as count. Now, something that's happening for the Bone Buds, I've been wondering how they're going to make up for the trash count that they missed in the first wing, like prior to Sedana. And we just saw them pull the second pack that's here at Nalish after Nalish, rather than into the boss trying to stay a little bit on the safer side here with bolstering, I'm sure, uh, uh, with, with raging also, I'm sure being a factor. But that just cost them extra time here dealing with the trash. And they're now trying to move towards Boma as well as we see Exoker moving towards the stairs here, trying to grab the extra trash. And you can see all of those spiderlings. These are going to be gone. Um, oh, oh, Mr. Exoker Hopper. Getting, getting stuck in the wall. Ooh, lots of casts actually going out here on Exoker. Um, two of those spits from the bats going through because... Uh, they didn't make the jump. Exoker actually going down too. They do have a Belarus available and it does look like they're committing it immediately. As you can see, some of those bats even casting still in the background because they didn't manage to get them all the way here and they didn't manage to range interrupt any of those. But it looks like they've recovered now as all of those bats did stack up. Yeah, a little bit of a scare for this miss there. I uh, think at least they didn't pull the boss, right? So... <laughs> Even yeah. if something does go wrong there, they're not going to be having like a full boss wipe or something like that. I like this. Um, I like taking it safe here for this mist and not engaging the boss. I think it's a really good idea as Bone Buds is now also in this like area. But if you look mm -hmm. at the trash percentage, there's still quite a lot behind. Yeah, they still need to do the entire bridge and then also the stairs as well as the bats. They're not going to pull them instantly because they want to have most of their interrupts ready for the spiders like you said earlier. Want to make sure that those spiders are under control before you engage those bats. But uh, we have seen teams catch up on Bone Maw before. Bone Maw has so much HP and with those 10 seconds on the Smith side, the 35 for Bone Muts turn into 25. So a little bit less that they are between those two teams. And Kevin actually going down here for this oh, no rest. They have 
no battle rest available, which means they're going to spend a lot more time on this boss here. Actually, Exoker oh, no. also going down. I think it's the spits from the from the copies of Bone Ma that are killing them, right? It's just additional spits. So that it, I, I I don't think they can play it. I think they they need to wipe. I think yeah, so as well. I think I don't the team think they agrees. Can play like this. It's the spits. They are it's trying the same to die, thing. But it's yeah, that's the same thing that killed. Um, the the team in the previous run, the Thunderstruck team, the Revoker also got spit on by the additional copies of the Worm. And it's just so much damage if both of them uh, target you at the same time, because I think they scale with Fortified. So uh, they're really, really dangerous. Yeah, and I mean, it's possible that they maybe were not having too many defensives uh, available, especially because they did this spider pull before the boss and their healer went down. So maybe seeing their healer goes down, they press all of their defensives, making sure they can survive. And then as soon as the boss is in a demission, they maybe don't have those same defensives available as they're used to. And then things just go wrong and they don't have any battle rests left. And that means they have to reset. But this is the chance for Bone Buds to come back. This is actually going to be so close between those two teams now. Because now the death timers are absolutely even. You can see both of the teams now yeah. have seven deaths. Dismissed actually still ahead, even though they just did have this wipe. Because Bone Buds still has to do the spider pull. Now Bone Buds, if they want to win this, in my opinion, they want to pull this spider pull on top yeah. of Bone Buds. Exactly. Why are we not doing that? Come like on, they're Bone doing Buds. It. Oh no, uh, they're taking a safe route, which, okay, I can respect that, but I really would have liked them to send it. I think maybe they're going to chain it just a little bit, but that would have been the way where they even it out completely. And you can see Druffy now that the Spiderlings have gone down is also moving there. Chizizar, it actually taking two of the spits from those bats. They hurt so bad, but Bloodlust is now running for both teams. Thankfully, that wasn't used by Dismissed before they had the wipe, so they still have a chance to get everything running here. Bombots need to be so careful with their interrupts. They need to have everything under control. You can see an additional going out for the spit here, but the raging definitely has to matter as well. First bat now also dying. Two more spiders to go on the side of bone butts. But the copies have spawned now. So there's additional damage going out onto the team by the copies. And they need to make sure that they have the offensives up and running if they are getting targeted by those copies. But look at the boss HP. Bone butts are pulling through. They're on 45%, blasting this boss here as dismissed is on 56 so bone butts eventually taking the lead here in a turn of events that no one could have predicted and laffer just gave me a heart attack on that feral druid on bone butt's side the the ground effect came out that smashed that this boss does and there was a spider a bet casting within that uh, the ground area and then laffer just charges in to interrupt one of those casts and i thought He's gonna die for sure getting hit by that, but he still managed Should to walk be. out last second. So really nicely interrupted, saving the group there and still surviving as well as Bone Buds is still ahead on Boston PS. Having the range PS, so there's a little bit of a difference in comp, right? We have Chippy on that Shutter Priest for Bone Buds while Dismiss is running a full melee comp. And having one X having one range GPS really matters for Bone Ma. Having a Quite a bit more damage here onto the boss and onto the ads as well. So catching up a little bit here for Bone Buds, definitely looking really good. But yeah, this boss uh, causing so many issues for both of those teams. Yeah. Oh, oh dismissed. <laughs> Taking a hit to the face as two of their players get knocked into the water. One of them is a the healer. That means they have to fight it out. Now, Bone Ma on 13%. Maybe, maybe they can eke it out. Maybe they can death strike. Maybe Maggot can survive here, but it's not going to be easy. They need to be very careful with everything they're doing. Nature's Vigil not available for 25 seconds as Bone Ma is ticking down. I think they can fight it out, but they need to be so careful not to take any additional damage here during that fight. And Bone Buds, they're moving on. They're on to the blueberries. The Void Spawns have been engaged. They are taking everything 
into that pool and they're trying to get them down. The Void Pulses are very, very dangerous here as the Void Eruptions line up for them. But Dismissed has managed to get Bone Maw down, but another 10 seconds of penalty on top might just be the nail in the coffin for Dismissed. Ooh, good sooth coming out of a Bone Butts there. Uh, making sure the Void Spawn has been dispelled from Raging just right before that AoE came through on one of the Void Spawns. Now they're gonna have to do the same thing again. They actually did stagger their damage a little bit. They are not relying on the oppressive roar of the Evoker. They're just making sure they stagger the damage enough on the Void Spawns to make sure the Soothe cooldown comes back off so they can Soothe both of these mobs with that Feral Druid. There we go, that one last Void Spawn is going down. And dismiss now also on those two void spawns though. So dismiss not too far behind. Of course, they do have the extra two death penalties on their board, so 10 seconds in favor of Bone Buds. And there we go, and they're still being engaged. They do have two battle rests available on their side in case something does go wrong. And again, they have that Shadow Priest, that ranged DPS player that has the ability to spawn all of these um, omens and dismiss yeah. another death though, unfortunately as their Feral goes down. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see how this one goes. There's all on 87% for the Bone Buds. Dismissed now having an even bigger differential in penalty on the timer up there, but they are able to kill off the Void Spawns. Now, Bloodlust is not available for either team as Kevin dies again? To what? What happened? I think I'm huh? just dying to the void spawn, um, AoE. I think it's just not being full and not... I mean, of course, as a, as a Feral, you can always go bear for it, but that's, you know, that's a damage loss. You that's don't not doing do damage, that. Nagura. Exactly. Come on. So, <laughs> so maybe just some miscommunication there or lack of defenses being used, lack of healing. Either way, Dismissed now also in their soul. But yeah, arriving on that boss a little bit late. Chippy. And this game really was back and forth between those two teams, but now it's definitely in favor of Bone Butts again. Yeah, absolutely. 50% remaining. Chippy taking a bunch of damage there from the Omens, but is able to survive the rest of the team, making sure that the Ritual of Bones goes down here. Malevolence coming in one more time as they move through the bony wall. I mean, Tettles called it out at the beginning of the dungeon. This is their home territory as Bone Butts, right? That is correct. So, I mean, no surprise they end up winning in the end. There was no doubt in my mind ever, this, throughout this whole dungeon, I always knew that they are going to win. Yeah, yeah, bone. right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But yeah, you can, you can see on Dismissed side, because they don't have a ranged GPS player, it actually has to be their healer that is baiting those zones on the ground, um, which, you know, it's not the worst, because Evoker, of course, um, being able to do things on range two. But the thing is, you cannot bait them as far away as a Shadow Priest could, because of course, Evoker does have that lower range on their abilities. And that means that it's going to be a little bit more damage in a group. But it's not too big of a deal as Dismissed is getting lower and lower in the boss. But Bone Buds 24% ahead, plus the extra time they have on those uh, less, the less, less death penalties they have on their side. So, really looking good for Bone Buds here. Yeah, absolutely. And they have one win already in the tank. That is going to be the 2 0 for the Bone Buds, eliminating Dismissed here in our lower bracket. And that also means the Bone Buds will move on and play in the series that comes after the next one. So we're going to see them one more time today. And I, for one, am looking forward to it. You see Lufer with the. Uh sense of excitement as we, we had the bone buds <laughs> taking that down in a 2-0 that was a very back and forth map i i, I had thought that uh i thought that dismiss was gonna win that one for a little while my goodness what that was a very interesting one to be yeah. watching for replay i crafted something up in the lab <laughs> um at the at the beginning it looked like bone buds they did Honestly, the hardest part of the dungeon, and they didn't wipe. Like this, this in my opinion is the hardest pull here, especially on a twenty-three fortified. They were able to get through it. Like they don't have like a tank death or anything like that. They do end up having unfortunate first death to um, Nilash was the second boss, and they pull the trash into that, and like that that ends up costing them like one death, and then one death doesn't allow the mobs that they're pulling on top of the second boss to to get killed off in time. Um, where we're gonna cut that in a second. So they have Hemo dead. 
And then, like, if you have one player dead, this pack should already be killed off or, like, get, get close to getting killed off here in a second, right, as these uh, Void Lashes start casting. And then it's just, like, they're going to wipe from this point uh, moving forward. It, it was, like, the writing was on the wall. They had a, a two-minute run back. I think they lost four minutes total to, just to this wipe. I was like, oh, okay, so this is over. And, and you know, Dismissed is uh, going to win this one. Dismissed, you know, able to get to the boss. They're They're playing a bit slow, but... It felt fine. Like they, they were capitalizing on the mistakes, and that's what we were talking about earlier. Then they had a wipe of their own, and then they wiped on, um, they wiped on Bone Maw, which was surprising. They had like the Feral get hit by the Body Slam, and then once the Feral got hit by the Body Slam, Exoker uh, started getting spat on by those ads that are up, and he takes like three consecutive spits on him, and then he just dies. So, like, look at this right here. Yeah. He he, he was casting Boom. Dream Breath even, and he canceled it, and then just died. And I mean, like that from that wipe. It would allow Bone Buds to kind of catch back up, get back into the swing of things, and then like more deaths on uh, dismissed sides kind of sealed their fate and allowed Bone Buds to be able to take this in a 2-0. This map, not as convincing as the Algathar Academy in my mind, but I think that if Bone Buds are able to get, be more consistent like we kind of expect from them, they should be able to uh, absolutely give it to the team in the next series. Yeah, I agree. I'm looking forward to the Bone Butts. Uh, they're going to meet, uh, is it Thundered or Thunderstruck? They're both down there. I think it's Thunderstruck uh. against the Bone Butts. <laughs> um, so Thunderstruck, Bone Butts doesn't sound like a good combination. So we'll, we'll see who takes that one. But I'm looking forward to it. I think it's supposed to be Thundered, but I'm not. Hold on. Let me look. Oh, gosh, I'm not positive. Uh. Actually, I don't know. It's, okay, it is, th it is Thunderstruck. Okay, never mind. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm wrong. Is it? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Uh, it's in, uh... <laughs> oh, you, you both doubting me. It's literally on the bracket, but okay. Um, if you're looking at my spreadsheet, then I just posted it there. No, I'm not sure. So. No, no. I'm not. I'm not looking. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the facts, Nagura. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we have a Breaker <laughs> and Mythic Meme Dream Team coming up next. <laughs> God, the and I both just got owned by. I'm looking at the back. Uh, all right. Uh, is there anything else that we really want to talk like about? To the make shadow burial grounds. Do, do you think That's it's like? Okay, I, think, I think it may. It's like the shadow moon is just something that we kind of look past. We're like, ah, you know, it was a map. It was a map that happened. Unfortunately, both sides had mistakes. You, you just try to be a little bit more consistent next time. There's not really too much in. I don't think look at uh, the downtime though. Merit harping on it. I, yeah. You can really see how yeah. long it took them. Like that, wipe. <laughs> that is so long that they had to walk yeah. there. Oh my god. That's crazy. It, it was like I, I swear I think they lost four minutes to that wife. <laughs> and it was it was something that I, I thought it was like completely over whenever they um whenever I they took that I mean off. I felt I felt okay about it, right? While they were running and then the quaking happened. And I was like, oh, yes. poor Luffer. And like, then the quaking happened again. And then it happened a third time. And I was kind of like, ooh. <laughs> but they did it. They took the, they took the so, dungeon. So. According to our, one of our moderators in chat, quaking had a 3-0 record against Luffer there on, <laughs> on the yeah. reses. So yeah, next mean... up, we got Breaker versus MMDT. So we didn't see Breaker play at all yesterday. Um, we did see Mythic Meme Dream Team, and they actually look pretty solid in, in their series. Yeah. What are you kind of expecting out of that series next up? Well, we kind of have to mention that Breaker is playing with two sub-ins after some unfortunate circumstances for them. They couldn't play yesterday, yeah. like you said. So it's going to be the first time we see them with two new players, which means they didn't really get time to practice. So I think that should be where our expectations are. But I'm definitely looking forward to see a new team in the MDI, that's always something that I'm excited for. I'm not sure what classes they're bringing. Then, like you said, Mythic Meme Dream Team actually looking pretty good. So I'm excited to see what they bring to the maps. We're going to see another Knock Hood, if I'm not mis- No, that's a, that's a last game, right? It's not a Knock Hood next up. Wait, I have to it's look at the facts. Ru Ruby Life Pools, it's a Ruby Azure Life Vault. Pools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Al Ruby Life Pools, Alistar Academy, Azure Vault, Knock Hood, and Temple of the Jade Serpent is that pool. <laughs> yeah, so Ruby Life Pools is always fun to watch, I feel like. Spitting the facts. <laughs> the facts. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's tough, right? It, it's really tough whenever you spend like multiple weeks practicing, and then it's just like you have a 
unfortunate emergency that like there's nothing really within your control and so it's like breaker having two subs the fact that they still wanted to come in and play is like i don't know yeah it's it's unfortunate i think our expectations have to be a little bit tempered for them but for mythic main dream team i think what i'm looking for from them is like consistent play and then and, and consistent like with what we saw yesterday as well where they looked you know they look pretty good in their in their maps and it's like if they can avoid having catastrophic wipes if they can continue to play their game plan and play their strategies uh it should be fairly solid for them yeah Tell us i think host. that's something we can break. all look for oh, yeah, as we go into the break <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, we'll be right back after this break. <laughs> That's not awkward at all. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs>
welcome back. It is time for our next lower bracket series here uh, between Breaker and Mythic Meme Dream Team. I'm joined by Zyro and Nagura, and we've got a, a spicy one here in the lower bracket, including a team that we didn't get to see play yesterday and have made. So they had to make some emergency roster swaps, but we are letting them uh, do that, and they are going to be trying their best here in the lower bracket, but that's going to be an uphill battle. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be difficult for them to win against MMDT, especially because MMDT looked so good for um, their seeding. They're coming in as the 17th seed in a time trial, uh, which is a pretty low seed. They ended up actually performing pretty well yesterday. And if Breaker coming in as a 20th seed, having issues, having to replace two players, it's going to be a little bit difficult for them. But it also depends on which players they had to replace, right? If it's two damage dealers, then maybe it's okay, right? Because it's like, you know, if you already have the strategies bringing in two damage dealers, it can work. If you have to replace your tank, on the other hand, that would be a little bit more difficult. Yeah, we're not actually sure what the what those swaps, uh, what which roles those were. So we'll maybe get to see when the uh, when the game starts. But here we can see the bans. Ruby Life Pool is of course not bannable. Mythic Meme Dream Team have taken out that twenty three Knocked. Breaker have taken out the Algathar Academy. So we're gonna see the lowest keys we could have this se this series with twenty two into twenty one into twenty. A nice little descending path. Zyra, anything jump out to you in this uh, dungeon lineup? Hmm. It always feels like Ruby Life Pools, especially this weekend, has been a very big like kind of toss up. Like, it seems like any team can win on this matchup. So I don't really know if I can. Well, you know, we don't really have that much information about Breaker since we didn't see them play yesterday. But it's really hard to get, you know guarantee a win on that map because even Monk was having issues on that map earlier today, right? So that's going to be a banger. And then Azure Vault is a dungeon that has so many different lanes and avenues through the dungeon that teams can pick and choose that I almost guarantee you that the two teams will have completely different strategies. So this should be a really interesting series to watch, especially because we haven't seen Breaker play yet, but also because Mythic Meme Dream Team didn't look that bad yesterday playing against Thunderstruck, right? They just weren't quite as clean. Yeah, I wonder if there's room in a series like this for... We sometimes see these you know, lower seeded teams, we see one attempting like full MDI sized pulls and another team kind of going with a, a slower, you know, do the dungeon in three extra pulls and have it be a lot safer. And then it just comes down to whether one team will wipe or not. Uh, because of course, these are very lethal keys. Like you said, 22 Ruby Life Pools, tyrannical bolstering. You know, that combo can get any team, even our very best ones. So I'm curious just how big they're planning to go. I expect some big pulls for sure, especially from MMDT. They looked really good yesterday, had some really nice routes, played some meta comes as well. So I am expecting some big pulls. But that also means that, as you said, lots of things can go wrong, which would give Breaker the opportunity to catch up because I'm kind of assuming that Breaker wants to go a little bit slower, right? Considering that they had those roster swaps, it's probably not ideal to just go into every dungeon doing those insane pulls without having practiced them that much with their uh, current comp they're running. So that would give Breaker the opportunity to catch up in case something does go wrong for MMDT. Because, uh, yeah, sometimes when you do those big pulls and you commit all of your offensive cooldowns, it's an insane amount of time that you lose if anything goes wrong. If any of those wipes on, on the bosses, especially like on the first boss, you need to release, you need to somehow skip the trash that you have skipped initially. And yeah, it can be a big time loss if anything does happen for MMDT here. Yeah, we're just about to get into game here, getting all of our players into the dungeon. Yeah, I wonder if there's ever room to play, uh, you know, the stuff like the... The Fire Mage, the Destro Locks that we've seen in here. I wonder what uh, what comp we're going to see out of these teams. Of course, Breaker, we we don't know yet what they're up to, so could be almost anything. Maybe, maybe we'll get to see one of those few specs that we haven't seen so far. I'd love to see a Red Paladin, but I don't think we're going to see that when it's bolstering. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a... But I don't think... I mean, Red Paladin is not necessarily that bad, right? It's just that they're... They mainly just have, like... A, I don't think they, they're, like... Funneling you can, necessarily, you or can like Templar's verdict, but it's not funnel. Yeah, you're just you're just yeah. doing your single target instead, and that's a lot worse. <laughs> yeah, I 
I mean, this is so this is a rep alley dungeon on live because they're all doing it to try and get the blaze binders hoof trinket from this dungeon. So that's why you'll see a lot of rep alleys <laughs> in Ruby Life Fools. Not for any of the uh, of the trash bulls, though. Yeah, I mean, I know you're kind of you're kind of memeing with the rep alley talk, but you know, come ten point zero point seven, that class might be uh, might be on another level. It's unfortunate that we're yeah. not going to be able to see MDI after that patch. Or are we? Do we even know when that patch comes out? Well, I certainly I know. do. Tell me. Oh, man. Well, looks like we're ready to get into the dungeon here. Oh! Warrior <laughs> oh, DPS? Huh? Oh, I love this. Black okay. Decay 2? Interesting. All right, well, okay. this is pretty crazy. <laughs> is that Black Decay also playing... Um... Oh my god, is that a bull rush? I think there's a high mounted Tauren, right? Oh that ability boy. to the left. I think I just saw a bull rush come out of the uh, Blood Decay on Breaker's side here. But there we go, a big pull on Breaker's side. They're not committing their Bloodlust actually. They're not going as big as MMDT is on their side, because MMDT did also pull that uh, bigger mob there. So they did commit the Bloodlust, making sure they have enough AoE damage to finish it off. And MMDT's comp definitely looking a little bit more standard when it comes to MDI comps. But they're running the Rogue in Ruby, which is not something that is too common. Usually we do see uh, that Shadow Priest here, or maybe a Fire Mage as well. But uh, we'll see what they can do with the Rogue. Breaker, though, having some issues with Bolstering, as some oh, of these goodness. Terra sentries are incredibly big. <laughs> oh, look how big those are. XT doesn't care, he's just tanking them anyways. No problems whatsoever. Blood DK. Gig okay, I was going to say Giga Chad, but he took 80% of his HP from a melee, so he's got to get away from those eventually, right? Don't let that Tectonic Slam go off. Nice. Got the uh, Rogue Stun on it as well. You know, you say that this is more of like a meta comp, but like, I feel like all three of the DPS specs for Breaker are like, they're definitely not quote unquote meta right now. When you think when you think meta comp, I think in my head, Shadow Priest, Feral Druid, DK. Sometimes people swap the Shadow Priest for a Rogue, but honestly, I feel like all talks about meta kind of can go out go out the window right now, because we saw earlier today, Cheese just decided, you know what, we're just going to play what we're comfortable with and look good doing it and win maps against a team that a lot of casters thought would be, you know, the third best team on the weekend easily and make it a 2-0 series. I mean, Havoc Demon Hunter, Affliction Warlock, both things that we really haven't seen a lot of in the case of Affliction Lock, haven't seen any of. So who cares what the meta is right now as long as you can play it well and play it clean? But unfortunately for them, Mythic Meme Dream Team is just looking really good. Dealt with that first pull very cleanly. Bolstering wasn't too much of an issue. And they're already on to the first boss. Already, you know, a solid 30 seconds into the boss as well. And doing a pretty good job with it, too. Yeah, let's take a look at Breaker, right? They now engage the boss too, and yeah, they engage the boss later, but they had Bloodlust available while MMDT did use mm -hmm. it in the trash pool earlier. So they definitely have a little bit of an opportunity to catch up to MMDT here. Now, their comp is certainly very different when it, when it comes to what we've seen before in MBI, but Creepy going down for MMDT, uh, they have to commit their battle rest here to make sure their healer is back up. But yeah, that is causing some problems for them because that mini boss is still up, still doing a lot of damage to the tank here with those uh, with that steel barrage. Um, actually, the other the tank ability I forgot the name of. There we go. No, it's not Blazing Rush either. I'm trying to read the spell names. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about. As MMDT did now recover though, and I think they are looking pretty good. As the mini boss is dropping lower and lower. Breaker though, um, I mean, they also pulled a mini boss on top, which again mm -hmm. is not that easy. You have more tank damage, you have um, frontals to look out for, you have extra swirlies to dodge, so it's not that, that easy. And I mean, how's Blood Decay against the second boss? Do you know that actually? Second I like, actually um... have no idea. Hmm. All, all I know about Blood Decay is the propaganda that Dorky keeps spreading about how bad it is, but it's looking fine right oh. now. They're, I mean, Breaker's doing a good job so far, right? They're keeping it close. Yeah. 10% behind on the boss. Blood Decay, I mean, it might not be doing Pro Warrior damage, but it, it's, it's keeping up. You know, it's healing itself a lot. Yeah, and I mean, if you're healing yourself more, that allows your healer to do more damage, right? So I do think it's working out for Breaker as uh, they're caught up a little bit on boss DPS. They're still not uh, quite caught up all the way. 
And MMBT also has a little bit more trash percentage on the board as well with those extra 5%. So that means MMDT can skip something later on. We'll see what they decide to do. But yeah, the Arms Warrior actually casts on uh, Breaker's side. Did do a lot of damage on first trash pool. I think topping the DPS for Breaker too. So it's really cool to also see an Arms Warrior um, in the MDI as well. And even Windwalker is something that I think at the start of... Um, Dragonflight, like early on in the season, we saw a lot of Windwalkers in high keys. And then, you know, they got less popular. I think we still see them once in a while, but uh, not as much anymore as at the start. And we haven't really seen them in the MDI that much either. So it's really cool to see uh, Windwalker again showing up. I'm going to go ahead and hazard a guess that Breaker is not going to be going for a double destroyer pull after this boss for a couple different reasons. Number one, we do know that they're, they're they're playing with emergency subs today, so they definitely have less practice with the team comp that they're comfortable with. But also, I was watching very intently at what the Arms Warrior was doing while you were talking about him, and he casted his Pubble Puzzle Box right before the second set of folks came out. <laughs> Going for the <laughs> maximum pad damage. And not having that up for a Double Breaker pull would be, uh, would be very suspect. So... We'll have to keep an eye on what the routing is for both teams. Mythic Meme Dream Team, though, I could definitely see them going for that, because when we saw them playing yesterday, they're definitely one of the teams that is a little bit less practiced than the top-ranked teams, but they still go for those pulls and routing that the top-end teams do go for. But because they're less practiced, sometimes it just doesn't quite work out for them as well. I could fully expect them to see... I, 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 in reality, they definitely could go for that pull. Let's keep an eye on Mythic Meme Dream Team here, because we'll probably see them skip a Thunderhead. Oh, they're going to the right. They're not going to Thunderhead. They're going to the right. They're going to be skipping past Flame Galay. I don't think we've seen teams we'll go for a double destroyer pull pulls. on the right side. Do they? They could I still do it. it once. Oh, they're going for it. Does look like Maybe? they're going for it. Yeah. All right. Let's see if they manage to gather it up because that is a little bit dangerous here to start. We do see the Living Bomb go out on a DK, which is a great target because you can use AMS to get rid of it. Army being used even by the Anhel DK here. Cloak and all defensives being popped, as well as the Nature's Vigil from the Feral Druid to help out with that healing. Um, the Prod Warrior also making sure all of the defensives are being used. And here's where it's, final damage is incredibly important. They need to make sure those destroyers die first. Because if any of those casters around the destroyers die, they will get bolstered. And then all of a sudden, these Inferno casts are going to do so much damage. You can see some bolster stacks already out on those Inferno casts. And you can see just how much damage it does. Their Evoker trying to keep everyone alive. But unfortunately, having a knockout from that Living Bomb, making it a little bit harder. But looking good. Not bad at all. Breaker, meanwhile, on the other side, has pulled Thunderhead and they've decided to pull it into the Destroyer. We saw this strategy, I believe, in our first weekend of the MDI, and it didn't honestly seem that bad. The only problem was that it, it, the dragons just take so much time to kill that it seems like it's not worth just pulling an extra trash pack with another pack somewhere else in the dungeon, which is why we've seen that be the predominant strategy. But Thunderhead has gone horribly wrong for Breaker here. That Rolling Thunder debuff taking out Meowsham has to use the Auk to heal himself up, but the Rogue has died through the cheat death, and the Shaman has gone down once again! This dragon is just claiming the lives of Breaker here. This is so unfortunate to see. I'm not sure if they can recover this, as their healer did have to release, and the destroyer has a bunch of bolstering stacks, and it looks like even more casters are going down around it. So this Inferno cast is doing so much damage, and without a healer here, and without defensives left, this is just going to be impossible for the damage dealers to survive. Their tank can probably survive a little bit longer, but it's going to cost them so much time for all of those damage dealers to walk all the way back here. At least some of the bolsters, bolstering stacks did um, wear off now, so they should be able to still keep the pull alive. Yeah, very unfortunate for Breaker, as MMDT is done with their third destroyer pull as well, and they are gearing up to the last couple of pulls before they can engage that second boss, which uh, we've seen teams have issues with as well. But yeah, before they get there, they still have to do that last destroyer that you can see on the left side. Mm -hmm. Mythic Meme Dream Team making their way slowly through the ring here. They've got that one last destroyer, like you mentioned, that they have to deal with. They do have to make sure they can skip past Thunderhead at the last second here. No, they're just pulling it in. Okay, that's where they're getting their extra trash count from. They aren't pulling that last destroyer with it either, so they're just going for a Natty Thunderhead route. Interesting. Okay, so... Maybe hmm. they pull it in later. What do you think? I, I think they probably do pull it in later. 
Yeah, that's probably what the play is. But the question is, when do you pull it in? Because you want it to die at roughly the same time as the Destroyer. But you also don't want to just keep it alive casting on your team, right? You don't want those extra Rolling Thunder debuffs. Here we go, it's pulled, being pulled in a half HP. So this could be scary. A set of debuffs goes out, instantly Ooh. dispelling one of them for AoE damage on the group. Creepy has the debuff plus the Living Bomb going off yeah. at almost the exact same time. Has to commit a lot of his abilities here just to keep the team alive. There's the Zephyr, he's got the Stasis prepped. A lot of tools being committed to heal the team through this pull. And, you know, he's using all of these abilities. That means that he doesn't have all of this for the boss coming up, which we've seen wipe teams this weekend. Remember, this is a tyrannical dungeon, so the trash isn't quite as scary, but this pull is not over yet. They still have a Blazebound Destroyer alive at half HP. Has one stack of bolstering on it right now that Inferno's ticking on the group with the bolstered damage. And it's going to get another couple extra stacks of bolstering, too, while this Living Bomb is out. So this is a lot of damage that's going to go out on the group. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a really scary pull by FMDT, but it does look like they're actually going to manage to do it. But unfortunately, they get one more Inferno right before that Destroyer dies. So that means they still have to heal that up because um, they are going to pull the boss in just a second. It looks like they might even pull that patrol on top of it uh, that they left on the right side there. So, yeah, it looks like they are gearing up to pull the boss into that. There's only one caster in there, um, one cinder weaver. The flame dancers are not too big of a problem because you can just AoE disrupt them. And they have a lot of disrupts in their group, so not too big of a deal. But they do want to make sure they're interrupting that cinder weaver. And uh, they also want to make sure they have enough interrupts for the destroyer at that spawns here in just a second. Because we've seen a cast of this destroyer go off earlier in a group and it did basically wipe them. So yeah, lots of uh, problems that can be caused here in this boss if you pull anything on top. But it does look like MMDT did finish off their trash pull, so they should be fine. While Breaker is now on their last destroyer pull. Yeah, and Breaker had a little bit of a questionable play there where they weren't quite sure what to do. Flame Galay was standing in the way there, and they didn't have any way to get past it. There's no Shadow Priest in the group, so they can't mind soothe it. They ended up deciding to use their Shroud. Now, the problem with that is we typically see teams who do have a Rogue on their team use that Shroud to skip past a lot of the trash after the second boss. So they'll have to not use their potions now and make sure that they can Invisibility Potion after they kill the second boss, which means they don't have their DPS pots. So a little bit of unfortunate timing for them there, but made the best of it with the Shroud. This pull is trucking them, though. That Living Bomb debuff almost killing the Rogue. Their Shaman does go down, though. He has the Ankh available. He's probably going to wait until the Blaze of Glory finishes off to go again. They didn't have any other purges in the group, so that just went off completely. The full cast went off, but everyone's back alive now, and they're just about ready to get mm -hmm. onto the boss. I mean, this isn't looking too bad for a team that is playing with subs, but there's still a half a boss behind the Dream Team. What do you think about the Ankh there? I think I would have liked the Shaman just releasing, because they're doing the boss now, and he would have just been at the same spot. I mean, either uh, way, Ankh I mean, is a better use Ankh than saving it for next dungeon, right? So, <laughs> I guess well, uh, also, for time, it's also, worth it. Ankh is also, it resets like instantly <laughs> on the tournament realm, so it's not like it's, it's not like it's something you have to think about using. I think he's yeah, Ankh three yeah. times in this dungeon so far. <laughs> Perfect, there we it go. Happens. Just just like everything. Anyway, MMDT is now down to 30% on the boss. That means they're gonna be running out a little bit of space, but they did finish off Thunderhead, so that means that they actually have a little bit more space. They don't have to worry about it too much. But they still wanna make sure that they're not um, baiting those uh, boulders onto any buggy places. Don't wanna um, don't wanna bait it on any of those ledges or on any of those trees. And it does look like they're doing a pretty good job as the boss is dropping lower and oh lower. The defensives God. are also looking pretty good still for MMDT as well. The inferno damage on the group for Breaker there was just disgusting. <laughs> Everyone dropping so incredibly low for the last couple of ticks. Shaman, from my experiences doing this dungeon on live, it seems like Resto Shaman just has the, the worst time trying to keep people alive on this boss. Every single one of these infernos just... It looks like your team is struggling to stay alive. Watch the damage coming out from this Inferno here. Everyone dropping to half or lower HP. And just the chain heals don't seem like they're doing a whole bunch. I mean, honestly, it's kind of scary to deal with this boss. They've got a few more that they have to deal with, but Mythic Team Dream Team has already dealt with that second boss. 
We're going to see how they plan to progress after this point. Do they have the Shroud available? Let's see, looks like they do. The Rogue has gone into stealth. There's the Shroud. We're we'll moving on to the last couple of trash pulls of the dungeon. Yeah, looking pretty clean for him, MMDT on that skip. And now we'll see what kind of trash groups they are gathering. It does look like they are leaving out that mini boss at the very end. They don't necessarily are in that much of a hurry, so they don't have to do that. They also kind of want to save their bloodlust for the last boss, right? So they don't necessarily want to do some insane pull here, especially because of this bolstering. And the HP difference on those last couple of trash mobs is pretty uh, big, so don't necessarily want to risk anything. And it's looking pretty clean by them so far. Breaker, though, their boss also not looking too bad. As you said, some of those Inferno casts doing a lot of damage to their group. But uh, Meow definitely doing a good job keeping the group alive there. Yeah, it just seems like Resto Shaman has the least amount of tools to prevent the damage, which means it looks like it does so much every single time it goes out. But definitely doing a good job of just keeping the players alive. Let's check out Mythic Meme Dream Team. As they get on to High Channel or Avarda, this should be the last trash pull of the dungeon for them. They probably still do have to deal with those two Storm Warrior patrols in the back that are on the bridge, but likely we'll pull end up pulling them into the boss like we've seen from so many other teams. And altogether for Mythic Meme Dream Team, yeah, look at the Inferno damage. Oh my god, Breaker. Two deaths after the boss dies. It's just brutal how much damage that does to the group when you don't have any actual preventative tools to deal with the damage. That's one of the reasons I think Evoker is so strong, right? They have so many just, like, pre-prepped buttons that you can pop to deal with that. You've got Zephyr, you've got Rewind, you've got... You can prep, prep a stasis, you've got Emerald Communion. They just have so many buttons that help deal with those massive damage events. In addition to that, they just do more damage than the other healer, so that class is kind of disgusting to see in a lot of situations. Rest of Shaman definitely sees a lot of good play, too, though. But here we go, with the Beam Beam team almost done with this trash pull, and they'll be on to the last boss very, very shortly. That's a pretty big mini boss, but it does look like it's no problem for them as they're about to finish it off. Did use um, the arcane torrent there at the very end, playing Blood Elf on their prod warrior, making sure they have that mass dispel basically on their side. They also play the Blood Elf on both their DK and the Rogue, so having three arcane torrents for all of the dispels that are required to this dungeon. Really good choice of um, racials there. Now, looking at the trash percentage, they're actually missing a little bit of trash. It looks like they pulled something on top of... Oh, they pulled the warriors, Two warriors. on top of the boss here. So that's going to be the last couple of count that they need. Yeah, that should be the rest of their count here. Mythic Dream Team doing their best to do as much damage to the dragon here as possible. They want to get that as low as possible. They want to push into phase two at 50% on the dragon so that they can burn through it as quickly as possible once we enter phase two. Of course, right now, only one flame spit debuff goes out on the group every single time the dragon flies into the air. In phase two, though, three of them go out, so you want to try to minimize that damage as much as possible, and every single one of those flame spits just does so much damage to a player's HP bar on this key level, on this tyrannical level. It's easily more than all of your HP bar, so... A lot of preventative measures have to be taken to make sure people don't go down to that debuff. This should be the last single flame spit we see, and then once the dragon lands, we should see the bloodlust come out and see the boss burned as quickly as possible. There's the army of the dead, there's the bloodlust, and we're off to the races. Let's see how quickly they can deal with this boss with the bloodlust. Yeah, this, is, this boss is going to melt in just a second. So much damage coming out of the MMDT squad here on the right. Breaker, of course, still a little bit behind. Um, a little bit too much for them to handle. When it comes to the issues that they had, I don't think it was that bad. But yeah, of course, them going a little bit slower because of all the issues they had. It makes a lot of sense. I still think they performed well in this dungeon too. As MMDT, though, did finish off the dragon. Only the boss left here, which is no problem at all. No more debuffs coming out at this point, so that's not going to be an issue whatsoever. And yeah, MMDT doing a really good job. We can compare it to the best time we've seen so far in Ruby Life Pools, and that was 15 minutes by Monka. So, you know, still still behind four minutes, but uh, still a pretty good performance by MMDT. Yeah, I mean, they 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 knew they knew the job, right? They knew what they had to do. They knew the assignment. Get in the dungeon, have a clean run. Make sure you don't make any major mistakes. 
unfortunately, you, you know you're playing against a team with two substitute players, right? So, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, maybe we could go a little faster than this, but against a team that probably doesn't have that much practice, we don't really need to do anything major, anything egregious. And, yeah, their time wasn't fantastic, but they won the dungeon, so Mythic Meme Dream Team, doing a good job, taking the first win here, see how it goes in the next map. Yeah, well played by Mythic Meme Dream Team, but of course it was really cool to see Breaker busting out some of the specs that we uh, haven't seen too much of, the Windwalker, the Blood DK coming in as well, uh, and you could see, you know, some of the pulls, uh, we're working out for them as well. Both teams taking a little bit more of a conservative start to this dungeon than we've seen other teams doing in here. But honestly, with bolstering active, I do not blame them at all for this. This is an extremely lethal area of the dungeon to go much bigger than this with, right? And you know, getting, you're still getting like 20% all in one pull. And uh, both teams did slow down, even though Mythic Meme Dream Team were using that more meta comp. They were also not interested in the really, really big pull here. But that was kind of the only place where Mythic Meme Dream Team really were all that much slower than a, a standard MDI route. They did a lot of other stuff, uh, such as this double destroyer pull that, you know, is pretty scary. This is pretty impressive uh, how well it worked out for them and their ability to to set these pulls up and, and make them work, you know. There's a, a lot of damage going out on this pull and uh, the bolstering as well here, pretty scary. I want to highlight one other thing, though, that Breaker used to their advantage, which you... Uh, so, first of all, you're playing a Blood DK, right? Not the world's most mobile spec. You've got a little bit a little bit of difficulties sometimes getting from point A to point B, getting another pull started. So one piece of technology that they developed was the High Mountain Tauren. So uh, unfortunately, <laughs> after after wiping to... to or after, ha after having some deaths here to this, this Thunderhead thing, you can actually see a couple times over the course of the dungeon, the High Mountain Torin Bull Rush, it can be used as a stop on pulls like that, but it can also be used whenever your tank is ready to go and get the next pull started. Normally, you know, a warrior just leaps, charges, something like that, but here you can see the Bull Rush heading on over, getting that next <laughs> pull started. That's, uh, that's the tech. We also saw the Volpera coming out from the Windwalker, too, so I'm not sure what the Volpera did, per se. That was some, I was spending some time... Tricks, Bag of tricks, yeah. What, they what got a nose that? for trouble, too. They do have a nose for trouble, that is certainly true. <laughs> so, actually, you know what? Maybe <laughs> nose for trouble is good against the Blazebound Firestorms? You know, it might be. That's the reasonable value. Anyways. Well, it, it hits every new Firestorm, or like every every ad on this boss, you reduce the damage of their first hit against you by like 5% of your that's health, true, right? That's actually. That's, yeah. that's true, yeah. you know, over the course of that fight, that's like 30% of your health of effective healing. I don't know. Volpera could be the uh, the new hotness, but yeah, then of course, I like it. <laughs> the Green Dream Team did eventually end the run with the the. That's kind of the standard bolstering pull, right? You don't go onto the mini boss usually with bolstering. I don't think anybody's really been messing around with that too much. So, here's a look at those damage meters. You can see the one of the challenges with the DK right is is just your your tank damage compared to the warrior tanks. It's going to be a little bit lower, so you're trying to find ways to speed up the dungeon around that. That's going to be something that, especially if Breaker keep using that DK in future dungeons, they're, they're going to need to find some time uh, because of that slightly lower DPS. Look at the HPS that the Blood DK did. True. <laughs> true. Yeah. Very true, yeah. that's uh, Although yeah. HPS doesn't, doesn't end the dungeon in the same way the DPS does. Yeah, you, you can't heal the mobs not. to death. <laughs> yeah. You could try. Unless Tettles does try. Yeah. <laughs> He's not even here, man. That's the best time to get him. It's just no counterplay. <laughs> yeah, you can see the uh, slightly bigger pull for MMDT at the start of this dungeon. Slightly more damage that they could deploy there. But look at the HPS graph, right? Breaker with the Blood DK spiking much higher on the HPS graph. So, you know, one team wins DPS, one team wins HPS. Really, we'll call this map a draw. <laughs> Is, it, is that how it works? So we're 1-1 we're one, one going to the next game? Yeah, I think so. Alright, admins. Book it. Put it Honest on the board. The call. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's an official ruling for sure. <laughs> if we had the graphic pop up with 1-1 one, one right now, I might lose it. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, right, Raptor's well. going to be muted whenever the camera is announcing it. It's a good chance. It, it could happen at any time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, it's 1-0. -oh. It's just 1-0. -oh. All right. Un unlucky. My rules change oh. is still pending. Yeah. So that means MMDT, they're going to be coming in with uh, winning either of the next two maps to win the series is what they need to do, whereas Breaker, their lives are on the line already. Unfortunate for them, their first and soon to uh, potentially... Yeah, their first game of the MDI and now potentially in danger of going into their last of this MDI. So hopefully they can they can pull something together. What map are we headed to next? Let's take a look. It's Azure, Azure Vault. Vault. Okay. If there's anywhere that could be good to go to, it could be the Vault. This is a place, you know, the other team wipes even one time. You got a really long run back in a lot of spots. But also, even if they don't wipe, this is a place where teams have a lot of different cool ideas. Maybe Breaker have something in this dungeon that will uh, will break Mythic Meme Dream Team. I yeah, wonder if so they... Different... Yeah, I, I was just thinking, uh, I wonder if they're playing this comp everywhere, considering that they didn't have much, much practice, so maybe they're just playing like their, yeah. their main characters. But then there's a little bit of an issue, right? Because they don't have a Raging Dispel, do they? Oh, yeah, Evoker is really good for for Raging, right? Because you've got the AoE Soothe. And you also have, like, Feral Druids and that can that can single Soothe. Yeah. And yeah, that, that is a problem. Now, DK is potentially somewhat tanky against the Raging mobs, right? Like, you could you could maybe live at the end there, but I'm a, I'd be very worried about some of the large, large pulls that teams like to do in this dungeon. Maybe they have a swap they can make to something with a Soothe. Did I play a rogue just now? I played monk, warrior. Yeah, they both did. What's the third? It was rogue. Okay, well, if it was rogue, they have a sooth once in a while, okay. right? Yeah, a good. single target one. So That's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not as good as the evoker. The evoker one is so good, right? The evoker one is an AOE mm -hmm. sooth. That's insanely powerful, but the rogue one is it's probably good enough, especially for a lot of those most dangerous mobs, right? Yeah. yeah for the breakers, uh, they they, they I must guess. be really sad about yeah. Nakud going away, because Nakud for you know Nakud's a great place to show off the blood decay, gripping in all those archers yeah. and stuff, mind controlling that mystic. So a shame for Breaker they're not going to get to go there. I, I want to say as somebody who's played Sorry, you go ahead. a raging, as someone who's played a dungeon with a rogue that doesn't have a shiv bound by default, you can tell when they don't have that prepared. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Nagura. That, that's that. I'm done, Nagura. What did you want to say? <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about the Blood Decay no good offensive because I I played with a Blood Decay a few times and no good and it's so good like it feels so good. Yeah. But then I mean the the spell reflect of the of the yeah. Blood Warrior on some of the bosses is just so powerful. But outside of that, Blood Decay the Griffs they seem so good. They're really nice. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get to see it in a future no good offensive. Although, like you said, that spell reflect makes it pretty unlikely. We are not going to no good. However, we are going to Azure Vault. We'll see if there are any swaps being made by either team. We'll see if there's any creative route strategy stuff that's going on here. We've seen teams do a lot of different stuff. Snapping the first pull onto the first boss area. Snapping two breakers onto the last boss. A lot of different ideas have been had. You could even skip all the frogs if you want. That's something we thought would happen in Azure Vault before the first weekend of the MDI, but then nobody ever Ended up doing that. The frogs, you can just pull so many. Ooh, oh, ho, ho. Oh, I love okay. it. The Mistweaver. And the Elemental Shaman. Oh, they're swapping. They're, so they're swapping that was their, their, uh, their roles. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was their Windwalker that's now Mistweaver. Interesting. All right, well, here we go. Take it away. Oh, let's take a look at that Elemental Shaman damage from Breaker on the left side. There we is! Look at that shaman <laughs> topping the damage. I love this. I absolutely love seeing that Mistweaver and the Elemental Shaman. Mistweaver, also a healer that actually can do a lot of damage. So we'll see how Asiro mm -hmm. is doing on that monk there. They dealt with that first one really quickly, but they do have a tender still up. And they didn't go quite as big as MMDT did on their side. Plus, MMDT also did not commit their Bloodlust while Breaker did. Yeah, Breaker just, in, yeah, that makes sense that they saved her. Check out Mythic Meme Dream Team, though. Already dropping down to the boss room here. Are they snapping as well, or are they just dealing with stuff naturally? It looks like they're just dealing with it naturally. Okay, that makes sense. We'll have to keep an eye on that. Let's talk about some of the off-meta or stuff we're seeing. Because something we really didn't talk about this weekend was 
a lot of the changes that it wasn't a big patch, but there were some slight hot fixes that buffed and buffed some classes, changed the dungeon. This was the dungeon that was changed, right? It was Umbral School, the final boss. It was wandering arcane orbs that kind of wander around. That interaction with those orbs was nerfed. They don't wander nearly as much as they did, and that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but it makes that boss a lot easier to deal with. And also, a class that was buffed this week is that Elemental Shaman. A lot of it's single target ability, so Lava Burst, Earth Shock, Elemental Blast, Lightning Bolt, those all got some pretty significant buffs in the range of 6 to 10%. Elemental Shaman had no problem doing great AoE damage and having good utility through Ancestral Guidance, which is, you know, on the same level as the Nature's Vigil and Vampiric Embrace that we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. It really suffered when it came to pure single target damage, and those buffs helped them out a lot with that. So I'm really interested to see how good it actually looks in this dungeon. Let's see what build they're playing, actually. Oh, they are playing the lightning build with lightning rod. I'm not personally a big fan, but I know that it can be pretty effective. Yeah, certainly looking pretty effective so far for Breaker, as the shaman is blasting all of those pulls that we've seen. But MMDT already on the boss they did deal with all of this trash in only two pulls, while Breaker is now on their third pull as well. That means Breaker is going to have a little bit more percentage once they're done with those tenders, but MMDT might be able to make up that trash percentage without doing one additional pull later on. Maybe they just do one huge rock pull, for example, and that would mean that MMDT definitely does have the upper hand, but we'll see in a second. Now, MMDT also ch actually cast us go down for Breaker here, and they just released. They didn't commit a battle rest because they're not on the boss yet. I think that's a good decision. But uh, what I wanted to talk about is the Havoc Demon Hunter for MMDT. Now, Singularity did play Havoc before. We've seen it in um, Academy, I believe, from their side. But we have also seen Singularity play Feral. And I really like that they... It's not just that Singularity just plays Havoc Demon Hunter and that's why they play it. It definitely seems like that they are putting thoughts into their choice here and that they really recognize the fact that Havoc Demon Hunter can be good in some of those keys. I like that a lot because um, Fragments as well, right? We've seen Cheese earlier play that Havoc Demon Hunter in some of the dungeons. And I like the fact that MMDT is just sticking to this choice, even though before Fragments has played the Havoc Demon Hunter, we haven't necessarily seen any other teams play it. So the fact that MMDT is sure in their decision to play that Havoc in some dungeons is really cool to see. They're not just blindly sticking to those uh, to that meta comp and playing the Feral. Yeah, no, it's really important to to mention that. Like, at only the ex like the, the most extreme highest levels of competition, does, does this meta stuff really matter? And even in certain situations, you can break the meta by playing something you're really good at that and you can just make it work better than other people right there's so many interesting niches for a lot of different classes right now and i hope that people aren't taking what people are doing in the mdi too seriously to heart because there's a lot of really cool possibilities with like, the new talent systems that were introduced this expansion and all of all of the balancing that's been going on for like the past two months it feels like we have new balancing notes almost every couple of weeks so yeah i think there's a lot of opportunity out there to do a lot of really cool things and you know we see a few of them in this dungeon that we haven't seen before. We've got the Ellie Shaman, we've got the Mistweaver Monk, and we've seen a few Havocs, but it's still nice to see a little bit of a change from uh, what we've seen most of the time with the Havoc Demon Hunter coming in. So, yeah, it's nice to see. And also, it kind of leans more into that aspect of just playing the dungeon safe, right? Havoc Demon Hunter is well known for being just a pretty naturally tanky class that can keep itself alive a little bit better than other classes can. And... You know, what we're talking about at the end of that Ruby Life Pools, when you're playing against a team that hasn't really had that much time to practice together, or probably any time to practice with their substitutes, you just need to stay alive and not mess up and not die during your pulls. And Havoc Demon Hunter is just, it's great at doing that. Definitely agree. It, of course, also provides magic damage buff to everyone, which is great, considering that you do have Dan Holy DK doing quite a lot of magic damage, or almost all magic damage, and the Shadow Priest and the Evoker as well, of course. So... Definitely valuable in some of those keys. Now, I would still say that the Mark of the Wild is slightly more valuable than the magic damage increase, but I guess it depends on the situation. Either way, um, MMDT now in this ring area in the middle, and it does look like that they gathered up the patrol plus one of those trash packs. And uh, looking at their side, I mean, they do have the Evoker suit, but other than that, they don't really have anything, right? And the Oppressive Roar is on a pretty mm -hmm. long cooldown. So they actually have to worry a little bit about raging on MMDT's side. 
Meow has gone down on the Ellie Shaman, but the Ankh is available. There it is, personal cooldown used. With the boss at 20%. Yeah, unfortunately, they're just so far behind Mythic Meme Dream Team here. Azure Vault is really a dungeon where having a planned out strategy that's been practiced and routing is it seems way more important than other dungeons. There is so much in-depth stuff that you can do in this dungeon that it seems like it is a very severe uphill battle for Breaker to deal with here. They definitely need some mistakes to happen for Mythic Meme Dream Team. But Mythic Meme Dream Team is looking strong, pulling double, triple trash pulls here and still no deaths on the board. And you can see the Havoc Demon Hunter is staying competitive with these more meta classes that we've been thinking of, so it's definitely working out well for them. Yeah, and as you said, the Elemental Shaman also um, keeping up with the damage on the boss there, and now of course Damage, or the damage meter on the first boss, not necessarily uh, as relevant considering there's so many small mobs that spawn. So whichever class does the most damage to them is just automatically going to look uh, better there. So we would have to look at actual boss damage to see who was the most effective on that boss. But uh, maybe we can actually take a look at that afterwards. Now it does look like Breaker is dealing with those whelplings and the Furies as well. And it's another pool where we can take a little bit of a look at the damage that these classes can do. They're also pulling the elementals on top. And then a little bit... I'm always interested in that Mistweaver damage, because Mistweaver is definitely a healer that is very underrepresented on life keys, but also in the MDI as well. So looking at a little bit at what Mistweaver can do is pretty cool to see, in my opinion. Yeah, honestly, like, Mistweaver isn't something that I've studied too much, because usually we look at, like, the meta things and what we expect people to play and really try to break down that as much as possible. I think the last time we had Mistweaver really featured in an MDI setting, I think we'd have to go back to the end of BFA, when they had Way of the Crane available as a P from the PvP True. talent uh, neck socket that they could throw in, right? And mm -hmm. that would just let yeah. them do insane burst healing and damage every minute or so in dungeons. Do they still have that similar profile, or is it more of a just a traditional? I, I do think so. Right like, I, I also don't want to pretend as if I know everything about Mistweaver, but I definitely okay. do know that they can uh, DPS well, healing basically, and the more targets there are, the better it is. So, technically speaking, their profile should be good for MDI pools, but maybe it's just not strong enough in comparison. They also do provide um, the extra physical damage, of course, which is uh, always nice to have, and. Monk always has really nice utility, especially for the MDI. Ring of Peace can be really good, especially if you have something like Spiteful or you have Sanguine. So utility that the Monk provides always very, very nice. They also, of course, have the AoE stun that they can use. But yeah, MMDT though, we should be focusing on them as they're already on Azure Blade. They did pull that last trash pack on top of Azure Blade and look at all of those mobs raging. A little bit of an issue here for their tank as they had to commit that last stack of shield wall that they had available there because uh, maybe they didn't have an oppressive roar to get rid of those raging stacks. How big is that elemental in the back? My god, that thing is huge. You can only see the very bottom of its like. <laughs> Look at it, that thing is huge! <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, they're just chaining things along. They don't really care about the raging. They're just getting in there. And uh, the other thing that's nice in this dungeon is having the Shaman available for purges. Those Arcane Fury debuffs, or, uh, buffs on the mob, can do a lot whenever those Crystal Furies are able to get their piercing shards in the tank, and you really want to make sure they don't have that 50% increased damage on them. So that's pretty nice utility as well coming out from the Shaman here. Let's, uh, let's check in with Mythic Meme Dream Team here. They are leading the way. They're already into that second phase of Azure Blade here. They had the boss at 76% in the first intermission phase, which, with perfect damage, you technically could one phase, but I don't think everything was perfectly aligned for them here. They do have the army. They did have the power infusion go off here. Let's keep an eye on that mana bar at the bottom of Azure Blade's frame there. When that mana reaches zero, the boss will run towards the center of the room and start casting an ability that starts the intermission phase. And it looks like they're kind of behind the mark there. You can see the mana bar has passed up, up the HP there, and it looks like, yeah, they're just going to have to do an entire extra intermission phase here. I think we saw Dr. J's team Thunderstruck. We saw them almost able to phase the boss from 78%, but they were still focusing down every single one of the adds. But that was with every single cooldown in the book, just to try to burn as much as possible here. Mythic Meme Dream Team aren't quite going to make it as close as Thunderstruck did, so have to deal with that extra intermission. 
Yeah, also, actually Yin going down there, unfortunately, for MMDT. They have to commit a battle rush to get them back up. Shadow Priest going down, not too ideal. Shadow Priest really good for this intermission phase with those dots that he can put on all of these ads. But uh, they should be able to recover from that death in just a second. Of course, Evokers also healers that struggle a little bit in this phase compared to other healers, just because, um, of course, with Evokers, you have to be in proximity to them so they can heal you properly. But to, to get out of this phase quicker, you technically want to spread out your damage dealers. But Breaker having issues as their Black Decay does go oh, down no. on one of those pools. We'll see if they can maybe unk and get them back up to recover, but this is definitely a pretty big time loss for Breaker here. So... Yeah, they did. They don't know about this. So there's a really interesting interaction in this ring that I'm sure not, so not a lot of players are aware of. If you instantly release in that secondary ring, you'll actually spawn on the ring. You literally have to instantly repop it, though. If you don't instantly press release, you will release back at the start of the dungeon. I'm not. This this was this was in the game like a month ago. I'm not sure if it was fixed yet, but. You can definitely yeah. use this to uh, to get back to your team a little bit more quickly because we all know how it goes. If you wipe in this section of the dungeon here, you end up playing Ring Around the Rosie with the, with the trash bombs, and you can technically kind of pull out. But uh, I don't know if they. Where I don't do you know release? Where you died, or in a specific other release, spot? You release right where their tank is, right here on the bottom on the bottom ring. Oh, okay, I see. Huh. Very tech. very Good interesting tech that I don't think people know about. <laughs> Of course, you have to talking die or wipe for it text. to be useful. <laughs> talking about interesting text at Asher Vault, MMDT is now in that frog area, and there's something interesting that, for anyone that is watching right now, I do believe this is still in the game, I'm not 100% sure though, but it has been in the game for a while before. So whenever you jump, or you get knocked in the air by anything, or you hover, or you glide, or you get hit by storming, hit by volcanoes, if you're in the air and you get targeted by a jump from these frogs, it actually can possibly make the swirly, the visual, invisible. Um, but the jump still kills you if you stand there. So, what you want to do if you do this frog pull and you pull multiple of those frogs, uh, sometimes you die to invisible pulls and no one ever believes you, right? You're, you're gonna say, oh my god, there was nothing there, look where oh, I am. No. And people are gonna be like, sure. But Yin's does go down for MMDT, unfortunately, as they use their battle rest to get um, them back up. And look at all of those raging mobs there. Their breaker is raging as well. They have to make sure they kill it before another roar comes out. But Creepy Dusk follow as well, and Yin goes down again. It does look like they can finish this pull, but yeah, not without losing a bunch of players on their side. But to get back to my point before I let you speak, Cyro, sorry. I just wanted to say, do not okay. jump on this pull. And you'll be fine. There you go. Don't jump. Yeah. We did see <laughs> Yen get Goomba stomped there. I think he got stunned by thundering right beforehand, so a little bit unfortunate. Oh. The team is waiting. Mythic Beam Dream Team, is it 100% trash count? Are they waiting for their priest to run back? Yeah, he must have, he must have released. I yep, so. here we are. Here's the team. They've got the movement speed buff from taking the teleporter at the start of the dungeon, so they'll get there pretty quickly. And yeah, they needed the Shadow Priest to be here because he is their mind suit. That's how they skip past these two breakers. So, now that everyone's here, had a little tea sock in the middle of the dungeon, get your food buff, eat the banquet, and there we go. Mind Soothe is out. We'll run around them, take the book. Important to mention, if you do this in a group... Do not be in stealth when you're running around those breakers. It increases their uh, their aggro radius, and they will see you in stealth, even though even though they're mind soothed. I've seen too many groups have a player die with those breakers that way. Little tip. Here we are, onto the third boss of the dungeon here, Mythic Meme Dream Team, making their way through the dungeon, nice and swift and clean to take this series. Only two bosses between them and a berth into the next round of the lower bracket. Yeah, and looking really solid as well. Of course, they had those four deaths on the board, but um, that didn't really cost them too much time overall. So not too bad at all for MMDT here. We can take a look at the best time we've seen so far in Asher Vault, and it is 16 minutes and 49 seconds by Thundered. So not too far behind for MMDT. They, of course, have the trash already, so that means that they only have Grey Wing and the last boss left. So they're not going to be too far behind Thundered. So, yeah, really good job by MDT as they are getting those last few frost bombs, 
They're definitely gonna get one more absolute zero, but then I believe they can finish mm -hmm. the boss off before the last. Well, Breaker. Yeah. It's too far behind. They had. Uh, looking at the boss splits, I mean, it's just gonna be such a big um, second boss split. The first one. The first one was a little bit slower because they did more trash, which honestly is fine, right? If you can do less trash later on. But yeah, the second boss split it was just a little bit too slow for them. See the Mistweaver doing one on one battle with the Draconic image. Unfortunately, the DK takes it away, and thus the glory of being the one on one. Unfortunate. Mistweaver trying to get its W's where it can. I think Medium Dream Team has had that second absolute zero that we were talking about and is into the third normal phase of the boss here. They should be able to skip that third absolute zero cast, I think, without really popping anything too major here. And they're going to have pretty much everything available for the final boss here at the start here. They'll have the Bloodlust. They don't have Army of the Dead, but they'll have their two-minute cooldowns. They've got the Metamorphosis. They've got everything up, essentially. So that boss should get burned as quickly as a 21 tyrannical boss can. And honestly, you know, well, again, this isn't the fastest time we've seen in this dungeon. I think some of our faster times this week have been just below the 17-minute mark or right around it. But, again, they understand the assignment. No major mistakes. You know, you can have a couple spot deaths here and there, but you just want to complete the dungeon cleanly. You just want to get through without having any of those big dungeon-ending wipes, and they've done that. They've secured themselves... Well, almost secured themselves a spot into the 5th and 6th place bracket, and potentially even more if they're able to win again later today by taking out this Breaker team. I mean, Mythic Meme Dream Team has looked pretty good here. Definitely are. I was taking a look at Breaker just a moment as we're doing Asher Blade. And I felt so bad for the Mistweaver. As they were in a demission for so long, you just saw the Mistweaver struggle to keep everyone alive forever. And it took the, the, the very last tick that happened on that AoE before the last ad died, to finally put them out of the intermission, finished off the Mistweaver, and they did not have a bell rest to get them back up. So unfortunately, gonna be a wipe for Breaker there on Asher Blade, but uh, I loved to see that Mistweaver and the Elemental Shaman, and uh, of course, the Arms Warrior too, really cool to see. MMDT though, now of course, on that last boss, they did pop that Bloodlust, as you mentioned, uh, used all of those offensive cooldowns as well. And they're getting that intermission phase with the crystals. They're playing it very safe, making sure they're finishing off those crystals as fast as possible. Um, some other teams we have seen just passively kind of cleaving them, dotting them up, and they um, were short. To <laughs> Is the Platicate going to solo Asher Blade? <laughs> I love that. How does this always happen every single season of MDO? We've just got yes. a Blood DK doing unholy things. Or, or Blood things, I should say, not unholy. This blood class... Things, yeah. I was going to say, like, you know, for, for a team that hasn't been able to practice, Blood Decay seems like essentially the perfect pick, you know? It's like the hero class, the solo player class. If my team can't do it, fine, I'll do it myself. That's what it seems like they're doing. <laughs> He's trying. got to rest in 20 gotta seconds, so... You got to rest, they the Ankh available, too. I don't think we'll see it. I don't think we'll see it happen though, as MMDT is getting so low on the boss. They got their last set of crystals as well that they just finished off. So at this point, it's only 15% uh, HP on the boss left. They, of course, have their enemy forces too. And it is the second game of the series. They already won one before. So that means MMDT is going to be the team moving on in this lower bracket, while Breaker, unfortunately, is going to be eliminated, of course. Really unlucky for them having to replace two players at last second. Things just didn't work out for them. But yeah, good effort and good job MMDT as they're the ones moving on. A, a team that had a lot more of the, the strats and the speed and the ability to, to set up their big pulls and make them work. But huge credit to Breaker for competing under extraordinary circumstances, right? Uh, fielding their team, giving it their best shot. Even at the very first pull, though, you could absolutely see the, the difference in time that these teams would have. And Breaker were really playing for a huge wipe on the side of Mythic Meme Dream Team. Probably several such huge wipes. You know, this first pull didn't use Bloodlust, right? Pulled more mobs. 
uh, and were able to get it taken care of, whereas Breaker used Lust and, and had a much smaller pull. That's that's the sort of thing that can, like, that. I mean, that, that's taking pulls out of the dungeon, right? Doing the dungeon in less pulls, saving your Lust for bosses, a, a much faster plan. But again, credit to uh, credit to Breaker for going at it with their off-meta comp, with their Ellie Shaman, Mistweaver, Blood DK, Arms Warrior, right? Uh, players swapping between healer and DPS between the series as well. Very cool to see. Zyra, you were talking a little bit about the uh, the lightning build. What are what's the what's the lore on that? What does that bring for the Ellie Shaman versus uh, what's the what's the alternative? It's a little bit more focused single target damage. You get lightning rod, which means any lightning bolt or chain lightning damage you do, twenty percent of that gets reflected to the target that has lightning rod on it. So it can be used a little bit as a focus single target sort of okay. funnel sort of deal. Um, so here you'd like put it on the crystal thrasher and you'd put uh... it on the crystal thrasher, yeah. And I see. in in general, like I don't know. It seems like it's a it's honestly I think Eli Shaman is definitely one of those classes that's like literally right outside of the meta. Its biggest problem is survivability. Really, Shaman just doesn't have that many tools to keep itself alive. The damage is definitely there, but unfortunately, didn't quite get to see enough of it here. Yeah, we did get to see that Havoc Demon Hunter damage. Kind of insane for Mythic Meme Dream Team. Another thing that Breaker used this time that I don't think they used last dungeon was the Storm Eater's Boon Trinket uh, on their Blood DK to help pump up that damage, try and keep up with the Prot Warrior DPS, right? And uh, and burst a little bit more of that AoE. Helps with threat as well. Very useful option uh, that they, they swapped into here. And then, yeah, here was that Thundering Wipe. Uh, as mentioned, or a thundering, you know, series of deaths, right? You get you get the thunderings done, uh, and you so you die, you take the release, and then there's a thundering. So you, you still have thundering, right? You get a thundering stun, uh, and so the tank, the yeah. healer, and the shadow priest were all affected by that one. Two of the three of them ended up dying to it. Very common whenever you whenever you see a thundering stun go off in one of these hierarchies, usually at least one death follows. Here's a look at the damage meters and healing meters as well. No surprise to see the Blood DK cranking the HPS as always. DPS also a little bit closer with that boon perhaps. And the overall damage, you know, the the warrior, the rogue, those specs putting out a lot of damage. The Ellie Shaman as well. I mean, that's that's a lot of effective DPS from Breaker. MMDT though, not not far behind actually. <laughs> I think they're. Their tank and healer kind of bring them over the over the top there, but other than that, it was actually Breaker that had higher effective DPS uh, across their uh, their three DPS players. Yeah, I think yeah. it was a little bit uh, biased towards the fact that they didn't do the last two bosses. Right? Yeah, the so two single target fair. bosses not being included in that very overall fair. DPS. But uh, looking at the damage graphs here, it's it's interesting to see that like the two big spikes that we see are actually similar in time even though obviously they were in completely different areas of the dungeon because uh, MMDT was quite a lot quicker. But looking at that second huge spike that we see there that probably happened during the frog pull for MMDT, Breaker doing also like somewhat of a big pull on their side, so having a similar spike. But yeah, it was definitely not the same pull. They were in a different part of the dungeon during that moment. Yeah, absolutely. HPS as well. You can see just always so much of that Blood DK HPS uh, keeping them winning on that one again. But unfortunately, it is the, the dungeon winning first for MMDT. So that's a 2-0. Breaker will be going home. Uh, credit to them, though, for showing up with their tough circumstances they ran into, having to swap some players out last second. Good to see them compete, and hopefully we'll get to see them again maybe in the last stand, which is next weekend as well. So... That's uh, another thing to mark on your calendars. All right, well, we do have two more series left in the day. Next one is going to be Thunderstruck against Bone Buds. Potentially setting us up here. Thunderstruck are coming in as the favorites in this one, but Bone Buds, of course, won their last series. So we'll have to see uh, how that one works out. And then we get another Thunder matchup. And if both of our Thunder teams win, then they will be playing uh, tomorrow. So... Really rooting for that outcome. I don't know about you do. That's what I'm hoping to see. You're really not going to take this opportunity to call that the Thunderdome? Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. That's uh, <laughs> that's good. I was just going to call it the Thunder Match or something. I, I don't know. The Thunder Series. You well, can use, You can use that one. Thank you. 
<laughs> All right. Well, we'll be we'll be back with uh, potentially the prelude to the Thunder series uh, between Thundershark and Bone Buds in just a few minutes. Don't go anywhere.
We are back here at the MDI and uh, I mean we are moving towards something you personally have been looking for Dratnos, uh, the Thunderdome matchup but first there will be two series between Thunderstruck and Bone Buds, and then Thundered and Mythic Meme Dream Team. Now am I correct to assume you're rooting for Thunderstruck in that series here Dratnos? Yep, because I, you think I they're the better team or because you want the Thunderdome? I will not be answering that question at this time. <laughs> okay. Zara, what about you? Can I can I uh, oh, engage wow. you in a little bit of bone buds? Oh. Wow. Okay. Okay. Neither team wanted That's to see surprising. that Halls of Valor. Okay. It... Oh, okay. Interesting. So okay. So we'll ready. have the Shadow and Burial Grounds, of course, right? It's a third time we'll see that one. Then we have the Ruby Life Pools, and if it goes to a third map, we'll have the Elgathar Academy. The Nucket and the Halls of Valor will both not be run. Yeah, no, I don't okay. remember if we've seen Thunderstruck in Ruby yet. I wonder if that's a mage dungeon for them. I wonder if that's a... Yeah, because if there are any mage dungeons, Ruby, especially with Bullstring, has got to be one of them, right? So that's going to be a cool thing coming up for us in the in the game, too. But yeah, I mean, between these two teams, they're actually fairly close in seeding, right? Thunderstruck and Bone Buds. Uh, it's our 8th seed and our 14th seed overall. So Thunderstruck are coming in as the, as the favorites here, but I don't know. This is a team, Thunderstruck, you know, the Dr. J teams and MDI's past... It's kind of a common narrative that it's a team that can sometimes lose to itself, right? They can end up uh, biting off more they, than they can chew, having something go a little bit wrong early and have that cascade into a, a bigger problem. But I'll have to see. I mean, that's going to be something that I think this is, this is a series where I'm going to be looking for that. I'm going to be looking to see how clean they can keep their runs. I mean, we saw both of the teams in Shadow Moon Burial Ground earlier today. Of course, Thunderstruck lost to Cheese. Their round didn't go as well. And then for Bone Buds, there was a lot going on there with seven deaths at, as well. Uh, if you remember, there was a little bit of quaking. They had like to run through the dungeon for quite a few minutes. So their dungeon timer is also not super clear to us because it was elongated by a lot of other stuff that was going on. So I think we're in for a treat. I think we're going to see the mage from Jay again, right? Because that was really good in the Shadow Moon Burial Grounds. And then Bone Buds now know what they need to look out for, Zyro. Do you think we're going to see any like last second shifts from Bone Buds? Or I, I doubt we'll Thunderstruck? See, I doubt we'll see too many changes, right? The teams have already played the map today. I feel like you're pretty set in your strategy at this point. You might just go back in after your match and be like, okay, here's where we made mistakes, here's what we need to refine. And both teams having done that should have a much better run this time around. So like you said, this should be a pretty good match. As for what both teams can improve upon, obviously there's a lot that Bone Buds can improve upon. They had a couple of pretty bad mistakes that ended up costing them a ton of time. Thunderstruck really, like, their run was fine for the most part. Just gotta keep it clean and go faster. They definitely have the faster route here. But like Dratnos was alluding to earlier, this is a team that's been known to make those seemingly just silly mistakes well, that cost them maps that they should definitely be win winning. I mean, it, it's tough when you when you say, like, this is a team, right? Because like, these are MDI players all in the sure. past, but it's a new configuration of players. It's kind of been a, a meme about the, the Dr. J teams in the past, but, you know, you have some players here, like Yoda, for instance, extremely consistent uh, player, formerly of, you know, Method NA and back in the day, uh, and... I don't know. I, I'm. I think this could potentially be one of our strongest Dr. J teams yet. So we'll have to see how it works out as we get underway. And the mage is indeed still there for Thunderstruck. Bone Buds deploying the the more standard Shadow Priest DK Feral Druid. Both teams starting off yep. with the pre invis pot, popping the invis pot before the the key goes in, so that they can have it and get past that first pack with the stampeding roar. And then it's going to be Shackle Undead run through Shadow Meld to get past the next one. Something like that. And then everyone will jump down here. We, we don't see Yoda. That's because he's on the opposite side of the room doing the same thing, pulling all those spiderlings together, running past the four pack. And you'll see him on the horizon here. There he is just now running down the stairs as fast as he can in cat form, and everything will get grouped up by Lamike here very, very shortly. And then we're off to the races here. Bloodlust popped. Both teams get into the boss at roughly the same time. 
sure lust will be popped up on buds there. It is in here we go. The big thing to keep an eye on here is the tank damage. They are taking so much damage from all of these reanimated ritual bones. We've seen so many tanks just go straight down to the void slash debuffs here, so we have to keep an eye on those tank health bars for both players here. We wow. do know the the fire mage does insane damage here, and all of this is done just by single target DPSing the boss here. There's so much free ignite cleave that happens on this pole here. That's why you see the boss is almost 10% lower for Thunderstruck here, though the shift has to happen. Teams have to swap to that Defiled Spirit and kill it off, otherwise the boss will heal and get that nasty 25% damage increase debuff. Okay, so Lemike is out of stuff here. Time dilation ends and charges the boss to get away from those last raging ritual bones. Bone Buds did a really good job of this as well. Their tank actually held spell block for a very long time in that pool and got to have spell block up for the raging ones. Although now it's just the boss uh, magic damage is really starting to clap both tanks. You can see the way this boss works is every time it autos you successfully, it has a chance to get like three stacks of this buff that make its next autos do a bunch of shadow damage as well. You can actually reflect one of those back on the boss, do some big damn. Uh, but mm -hmm. as a warrior, the other ones are all going to hurt. It's going to be Thunderstruck, though, putting the boss into the grave first here. Only by maybe 20 seconds, though, maybe 30, over Bone Buds on this first split. So good job by both teams getting this first pull to work. And actually, Thunderstruck still needs to clean up this, this Bone Mender as well. So when you factor that in, the two teams are on pretty even pace here. Well, with a ton extra trash for Thunderstruck. Bone Buds didn't get the double pull, right? They just went for the single pull. And yeah, that, I, th I believe that that one Minder was Dominate Minded from Soda, so it just didn't have to deal with one more of those debuffs going out during the fight. Because if that debuff goes on your tank, you pretty much instantly die, right? 50% reduced max HP plus a ridiculous amount of dot damage. You cannot have that happen to you, so they keep it off, make sure nothing happens, and they're off to the yeah, they're yeah. Doing just fine. Here we go, though. On to the next pull, ready for both teams. One Buds is going to have to make up that trash count somewhere in the dungeon. That's 14% trash count. That's a pretty significant amount that they'll have to find somewhere. Uh, they might have to pull just the second trash pack in this next room, in the second boss's room. But the pack I, I suspect that's it, yeah. Both teams. I don't know yeah. what else you could find. Now, maybe you could do that onto boss, but... We've seen teams before do both of those onto boss, but... I don't know, 23 fortified raging. That seems like a recipe for death. Although, on the other hand, you know, maybe they'll be stunned during most of their raging window because the boss does stun all those mobs uh, in its later phase, right? When Whenever it goes downstairs, those mobs do get stunned for like 30 seconds. So, looks like Thunderstruck are just starting off with the boss by itself for now. They're going to late pull in, perhaps, the trash. Whereas Bone yeah. Buds, what are they up to here? Okay. Bone Buds They're probably going to do the same thing. Pretty similar strategies, I'd imagine. No, they pull it early, but that's fine, because when you're downstairs, nothing really happens, right? They can't cast on anyone, they can't melee anyone, so they just stand there and do nothing. And actually, for a while, after coming out from the underground phase... Oh, Soda Drop taking a lot of damage, actually dying! It, what it was that? Like Did he just was... Oh! Was he getting Rending Void Lash from behind the wall so they couldn't kick it? That would be it really It looked like he was maybe getting what? MC'd, even. I'm not 100% oh, yeah. sure, mate. Oh my goodness. If you get MC'd here, is an Ignite going to spread onto you and just end you? Is that what's going to happen? Because I saw a debuff on his frame that looks like the Domination debuff, so... I don't sure. know, that'll be something to, uh, to potentially check in with the logs or with makes later in the, the analysis segment. That's going to set Thunderstruck back a little bit. That's also their battle res, oh, a valuable dude. resource they're going to be down. Look at the lineup for Thunderstruck here. They had all of their cooldowns coming up. They had Combustion, Power Infusion, Incarnation. Then, they all, that all lined up with the damage amp that they get from coming out from that underground phase, right? You get the 30% damage buff. And then they also had Thundering on top of that. So the amount of burst damage they just pumped out in that short 20 second window was insane. Opening up the gap once again on Bone Buds here with the 10% lower HP boss. And their trash is already dead. Bone Buds still has to finish their trash off. Jeez. Yeah, that thundering affix optimization, it's not something that you see too much in live keys, right? Because it's, it's pretty hard to have consistent timings, especially as you're pushing the key, the level goes up, now you're getting there slower. Uh, but in an MDI setting, you actually can, when you practice this dungeon, you know, 20, 30 times, you can make sure that like, oh, okay, we can have thundering at this spot on this boss fight pretty reliably if we're fast, if we do all this right. Uh, up until this point, and then we line it up with all our cooldowns, and uh, that's, you know, it's a 30% damage buff for 15 seconds if you if you use it to its fullest, and 
That's a lot of value. It is it is scary sometimes to hold it for all 15 seconds, but this boss fight isn't one of the ones that punishes you, right? There's not too much that can happen that will surprise you and stun you. Yeah, if I had to guess, looking back at what happened during that boss fight, see, Thunderstruck still has these two mobs here. Bone Bloods does too. Mm. But I, I wonder if they got a Dominate cast from one of those two mobs, or just one of the mobs they ended up pulling from behind the wall and they couldn't get a kick on it. Because that's, that's just a really unfortunate circumstance. But what it does end up doing is it may, means they don't have a battle res for the next four minutes, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but if, if any you know any single mistakes happen, they don't really have any, any recourse for it, right? The person just has to res, or they have to wait until they're out of combat to actually get a resurrection on them. So Thunderstruck has to play with just that extra level of safety now, because you really don't want to end up losing a match in the lower bracket when you're the favorites and accidentally see yourself just going out of the tournament early. Yeah, I mean, and you maybe were preparing somewhat for the potential, you know, lower finals or lower semis tomorrow, right? But you can't just ever take any of these for granted. The other teams are good, too. Bone Buds really not far behind in terms of theoretical times compared to Thunderstruck. So uh, even that one death is going to mean it's close. And if another thing goes wrong here for Thunderstruck, all of a sudden Bone Buds are going to be in the lead. This pull is a really Bone sketchy Buds. one that they're working on as well. Bone Blood's taking it easy here, not pulling this trash down like we saw from Thunderstruck here, just dealing with the one monstrous core spider plus the two plague bats up top. While we did see Thunderstruck pull that, plus the next two spiders, onto this particular worm into the four plague bat pack. Oh. So really gaining an advantage here, and look at the damage coming out from the team too, just making short work of that trash pack. Really well done, yeah. Another great example of a fire mage pull where you just have this worm that you can dump a combustion into and all these mobs for it to spread onto. Very, uh, very nice pull. Glad it worked out for them, but that was that was scary, right? That was four spiders, four bats. And actually it looks like there are two more bats that are, are coming in late here as well for Thunderstruck uh, that they, they left until here. So they're always making sure that they have some multi-target going on. This is going to bring them up to almost full count as well. We'll see if they what they decide to do with the pack after Bone Maw. They want to bring it into Bone Maw, which is what I think they did last time. Probably what they plan to do again. But Bone Buds also in this worm area now. And they have a lot less trash to deal with with this. Although in some ways that's actually a little bit of a, a damage loss. Lose a little bit of that funnel opportunity. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about funnel, right? People like to talk about the Feral Druid funnel. They're kind of just AoEing. I don't know how much actual funnel they're doing. But they can do some, really, but... Yeah. They can do some. But usually they, they don't. Often <laughs> they, they will be AOEing. Yeah. Just because yeah. they can doesn't mean they are. It's, they have to choose to be spending their finishers on, on bites instead of Primal Wraths to really be doing Funnel. Exactly. But, uh, if, they're, if they're doing that, they actually do quite a lot of Funnel, but it's hard to get a Feral Druid mm -hmm. to not just AoE because their AoE is so good as well. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, a Fire Mage doesn't have that choice. You just single target... And then your ignite spreads, and you know that's it. There's no more to it than that. So it, it's essentially all that thundering stun for all that thundering. Oh wow! Okay. Unfortunate. You would really like to see them there. knock at that in the puddle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a good job to stay alive, though, making sure none of the necrotic bursts go off. And oh, dodge the slide. Good movement. Very good. These mobs are entering raging now. But Velo hits them with the beautiful AoE Soothe. That's not going to be enough for Yoda to stay alive, though. Four seconds until their next res. World Marker's coming down. Yoda, of course, was their only good res. So they're going to have to do an engineering res here. Unfortunately, that's not going to work during the inhale cast. So they actually have to stabilize here. Once these two spiders die, they'll maybe be in a position where somebody can channel a res. Extra Manic Grief Torch use for Lamike. Says, thank you, Yoda, Man, for resetting my Manic Grief Torch. Oh, was that an engineering backfire? It, I think it may I think have it been. Was. It was, it was, oh, it, was wow. it was. We saw it. That does not happen very often on the tournament room because these players have that, the max level engineering. Also, isn't there just like a, oh, a tinker look at Bone Buds. to make it so it can't backfire? Bone Buds. Bone Buds. The, uh, they, their uh, their druid was in the water after maybe setting up this uh, spider pull, it's going to have to run back. And so I think there's a tinker that makes it so that they can no longer, like, catastrophically backfire. You can use knowledge points to reduce the chance of it backfiring as well. I don't think you're ever guaranteed, though, on it. 
Yeah, that's uh. Well, we'll have to see. we'll have to see. I think that I think I saw the backfire animation playing there though for Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck. I will say, yeah, trying to use that engineering battle res as somebody with level one engineering or just no engineering, and you don't have a tinker. I think I've had it backfire or fail on me four times in a row in a dungeon once when I was trying to res our healer. It just doesn't work very well. You, you need to level your engineering to to make good use of that. I gotta put those knowledge points in. Gotta go dig that dirt to get your weekly knowledge points. Alright, well, Thunderstruck are still gonna be ahead here, but this is actually pretty scary for them because they're not gonna have a battle res for the rest of the dungeon, whereas Bone Buds have preserved their two battle reses now, so Thunderstruck are in a lot more danger for the rest of this run. The good news for Thunderstruck is there's not much left of this run, right? There's the, the two blueberries and then the last boss. But the last boss is one that I see battle reses get used on fairly often, so Thunderstruck are going to be in a little bit of danger there. Yeah, oh, I'm kind of worried about this now. And if I remember properly, they don't use their Lust on the Blueberries too, so again, they really need to play it safe. I mean, fortunately, this is a section of the dungeon where if they do have deaths to the Blueberries, they can get just kind of release camp it, right? Because their res is right where the third boss was. But Bone Buds is very close behind, right? I think the biggest problem, though, or Bone Buds, is they just committed their Bloodlust to Bone Maw, which means they don't have it the blue for the Blueberries, they don't have it for the last boss. They're just so far behind. They literally need Thunderstruck to like get these Blueberries to 20% HP and then wipe. That, that's how Bone Buds comes back. <laughs> yeah, or, like or a boss wipe of some kind. Or, right? Yeah, sure. A, now, Thunderstruck do have two Soothe effects, right? They have, they have Oppressive Roar, and they have Yoda's Soothe. So there shouldn't be any raging void pulses. <laughs> wow, that one gets big right Ooh. as the void pulse comes out. Thunderstruck nearly in trouble against that, but it looks like they're going to be okay here. And this is a nasty combination of uh, mechanics happening for them, but the Emerald Communion is going to see them through. Thunderstruck just have to deal with the last void spawn here, and they'll be on the boss, and it's just going to come down to can they kill this boss without players dying. One player dies early in the fight, and they can maybe still beat Bone Buds, especially with this death coming in for Bone Buds over here. But if two players die, or more for Thunderstruck, I think Bone Buds actually will be able to overtake here, because this is a long boss fight on plus 23, and Thunderstruck do not have a battle res. They do have Bloodlust, however, so once they here. pop that, they will be able to just nuke this boss. Yeah, I want to take a look here at Dr. J's talents here. Is he running Ice Flows, or is he running Shimmer? Ice Flows is technically the higher DPS button. Yeah, he's running Ice Flows. Sh this is one of the only dungeons that I'd even consider running Shimmer for because it's really annoying not to have an instant blink to get away from those purple puddles that spawn underneath range players. And even thinking that you can Shimmer and then just like looking at the ground, pressing your Shimmer button mid-cast and then not moving is an easy way to just instantly get one shot by those purple puddles. So we'll have to keep an eye on these range players for Thunderstruck. You cannot greed those baits at all. You cannot stand directly in the center of them because they will just kill you. Yeah, it is a, on this 23 key level, very scary mechanic. Thunderstruck have two players that it can target as well, right? It can target either Dr. J or Soda, those omens, so. They're gonna have to make sure that both players are positioning well. Bone Buds, on the other hand, only have the one range DPS, so it'll only ever go under Chippy. It's actually quite a lot easier to deal with when you know it's going under one player every time, right? I'm sure he's really happy about that. Yeah, it's not, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not great to be that player, but it's at least predictable, right? You know what's happening yeah. rather than like starting a speculative cast hoping that it doesn't target you. My yeah, favorite thing to do as a range player on this fight is uh, is make sure that I'm on the exact opposite side of the room as my healer. Wait, Thunderstruck, two people got the debuff. Velo and Soda oh. both got the debuff from standing in that army. They're both going to die. Is Velo somehow able to keep himself alive through this? There's no way, right? One more tick. One more tick. No. He dies to the last tick. They don't have a battle res. They have to do 50% okay. of the boss's HP with no healer here. Dr. J needs to get as far away from these baits as much as possible. He's going to get the baits on him. He needs to not be in melee. Actually, the last bait just went out. So this is all of the ticking damage they're going to get is from these final baits here. They actually just need to burn the boss. They can't kill the wall. This boss needs to die. Oh, no. Okay. Yoda's going to go down, okay. too. So we just reset uh, our Manic Grief Torch. Uh, if we live another 30 seconds, we get another Manic Grief Torch there. Now, How does he live Warrior the can maybe live this. You just jump through, yep. 
Oh, unlucky. We jumped through during a Malevolence cast, which means we're not going to be able to start globaling the boss again for a while. These omens are now coming out under the boss as well. Oh, Thunderstruck with the Thunderstruck what? team wipe. And that means Bone Buds are now in position to actually win this game. This is exactly the way for it to happen as well. The exact way that Bone Buds needed Thunderstruck to wipe. And that's going to cost them several minutes here. And this is not what you wanted to happen if you are Thunderstruck. That is almost the worst possible way for the dungeon to uh, to end for you. I mean, it is the worst possible way, right? This is so demoralizing. Now you're just waiting for we a always... boss respawn as well. Dude, we always talk about the possibility of something like this happening. The lower seated team, you just need the better team to wipe it 5% on the boss. Always saying it as casters, not really thinking it's ever going to happen, but what do you do when it actually does happen? That well, so is unbelievable. Let's talk about why, though. It's not just this boss, right? They had to use two battle reses earlier in this dungeon. Bone Buds have preserved their two battle reses, right? They've been playing this clean. Thunderstruck used those two reses early, and if they had even one battle res there, they get Velo back up easily. They just let him die to one of the early ticks. Res him finish the boss, win the map. But because they used both of those battle reses, that went from being not a wipe to being a wipe. And, you know, that's uh, that's going to be something that's going to cost Thunderstruck here, because I don't see how they could come back here unless Bone Buds were to wipe at 8% on Ner'Zhul, which surely they will not. Well, they've just no killed off their last wall. Here. Chippy's doing a good job to make sure the baits are away from the group. And that's going to be our first map victory for Bone Buds, snatching victory from the Jaws of Defeat. Unbelievable. Going to a game yeah. two. What is that? Oh, okay. Bone Buds. I bone see. Buds I saw on the paper there, Bone Max. Buds and Liquid. <laughs> what did it say? What? It said Bone Buds love Liquid Maximum. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Shut up. I mean, after all... We said it before, the Bone Buds in Shadowman Burial Grounds is just a home play, and that's how it's going to stay for them. Eking out that win there on the last meters, it felt unreal, but they did it. So we're going to have a look at how this dungeon actually went down, because there was a lot actually going on for Thunderstruck, I felt like. Um, that, that we kind of need to talk about. So, of course, at the beginning, this giant big pull, and under, like, 1 minute 30, both teams actually had the boss sub 50%, which after last week just feels unreal how quickly they're blasting through this pull, as well as this boss. Um, then here, if you're looking at Soda, he is getting domination casted on him by that dominator that is behind the wall. So they actually got in fight with that, trying to pull it in, but because it stayed behind the wall, they weren't able to actually interrupt that cast, which is very unfortunate. Then they went really big here in that path where, uh, where Bone Buds went a little bit safer. It all worked out for Thunderstruck, but then when it came to the actual boss, there was more going on there, so uh, unfortunately, we also had uh, uh, yeah a little bit of death there. Uh, Velo here able to pull those stairs without problem, leap of faithing back with Soda's help, but lots and lots of stuff that cost them those battle rushes throughout the dungeon, which isn't ideal. So they then needed them. You can see Yoda going down here. There was a cast from the spider. There was a spit from a bat. Lots of stuff going on, being a little bit unclean, missing an interrupt. Um, and then in the end, they needed those battle rests and didn't have them. I'll show you why. It was actually a pretty clutch situation. Nurzel um, casted the malevolence. Oh, we, we don't even have it. So Nurzel casted the malevolence in the gap where the ritual of bones was killed. And Soda and Velo were standing in that gap. And because Soda didn't have an option to actually dodge out, Velo went back and rescued him out, but must have clipped the edge of the oh. wall while rescuing, causing oh. them both to take the debuff and die. It was really, really unfortunate there uh, for Thunderstruck. But, you know, sometimes slow and steady wins the race. And that's the case for the Bone Buds here. Wow, that, that rescue! I wish we had a clip of that. Yeah, that's gotta yeah. be that's gotta be a tilter, right? That's <laughs> oh, okay. Who hold up? Okay. Here we go. Potentially, hold up. are you getting it? Oh no, no, this is this is okay. The, that, this this is still after the uh, the debuff got applied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there's the final down so, of Bello. 
Yeah. yeah. It, it actually looked really <laughs> cool in the replay because you could see Vela would have gotten out. Like he could have just sidestepped, but he jumped back to Soda to try and save him in true healer passion, you know, like a healer can't just let someone die. So going back, trying to get Soda out of the pickle that he found himself in, unfortunately getting both the debuff applied and then that was it. They couldn't recover it, no battle resses. And for a second I was like, maybe the mic is, is doing it on his own, but that heroic leap unfortunately also didn't didn't avoid the debuff being applied by the wall. Yeah. But Dude, that Velo... also means this series <sighs> is still very open. Alive. It was the okay. last hit. Is that it? Here it is. Yeah, this, it this is going to be it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's boss it. So in you the see there, Bello and Soda are standing, and now the Malevolence is going to come in. Soda doesn't have an option to get out, oh. so he rescues him, but both get the debuff. It was, it, like, in theory, it was a really good play, but because he clipped that edge, it killed them both. It was Velo like actually probably... heals himself the entire debuff it's the it's the yeah, actual yeah. last tick of the debuff that kills him this the final mm. tick oh my god it's oh that's rough, so yeah. tough <laughs> well, what do you know sometimes the shadow moon burial ground goes like that uh, i also wanted to give a shout out to bone butts because we now not only had one but two player camps which i'm always very excited about so big shout out to the bone butts here i think that's really cool but we are moving on, and there's another map coming up, and that's going to be that Ruby Life Bolts. Now, Zyra, you said earlier, you expect Thunderstruck. We haven't seen them in there just yet, but you expect them to also run that mage in the Ruby Life Bolts, right? Oh, absolutely. If we're seeing it from other teams, and we don't see it from Dr. J, I, I should probably resign, because I don't even know what's happening anymore. If that happens, Dr. J will always play mage when there's, a, when there's any excuse to play it. If they don't play, I don't know what the yeah. deal is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the yeah, reason it true. works so well in this in this map in particular is you have these massive HP targets, right? Like the Juggernaut in the first pull, then the mini-boss and the boss, and then you have the, you know, Infernos, all of these mobs in the upstairs area that are healthier than the mobs around them are just great targets to just dump a combustion into and a bunch of important but lower health stuff nearby that catches fire and dies as a result. So particularly with the bolstering affix, it's a really good way to have a spec that is just pumping damage into that main target and helping keep their health bars relatively even uh, rather than getting too many of those bolstering stacks too early into the pull like a pure AoE specialist like an Affliction Warlock might. Yeah, that would be very... I mean, I'm open. We have seen a Warlock before. I'm open for a Warlock. Uh, I'm not sure if Bone Butts are going to give us one or if maybe Thunderstruck whips one out, but uh, I, I would like it. I I'm always open for fun choices. Like, I hop off the desk for once and we saw a Blood Decay and a Mistweaver Monk. I kind of feel like I'm owed more fun now. So we'll see. Maybe I get it, but Ruby Life Poles will come <laughs> here as next dungeon up and that is going to be tyrannical bolstering volcanic fastest time i believe is still the monka time with 1545 or did we have a f oh yeah they they under timed themselves so 15 minutes from monka fastest ruby life poles curious if if thunderstruck or bone buds can undermine that time Jotnos, what it's do you gonna think? be tough possible yeah I, it's a really hard dungeon to speed up much because with bolstering there's just so so much friction in terms of how fast you can go that that last pull you know the the big pulls we saw last weekend when it was 20 non-bolstering not quite as feasible but both teams are going to probably start fairly large here dr j is indeed on the magician it's going to be the bloodlust for thunderstruck bone buds are actually holding it for now Maybe going to be using it for boss instead. You have a little bit of wiggle room, you know, if it's like a 16-minute dungeon. You can hold that lust for a little bit and still get two lusts in the dungeon, so... Thunderstruck are hopefully going to be finishing this pull first if they're committing the lust to it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this actually looks like it's a, sm a smaller pull than what we've seen ah. from other teams as well from Thunderstruck, too, unless they're just killing it that Bone much more efficiently. Also. Yeah, Bone Buds have we, we no Juggernaut. The... Yeah. yeah, no Juggernaut too. But, um, you know, you can kind of tell based off of the damage spike numbers, right? Like, I, I remember specifically, we're seeing about 2 million DPS spikes for Team DPS. Thunderstruck maybe capped out at like 1.5 there. Um, 
I wonder if this is the reasoning. They're really scared of the bolstering here. You can see the Mike actually just got out of the dungeon there, out, out of that pole instantly, and instantly went and pulled the mini boss. They've got zero bolstering well, sacks on this mini boss. Yeah. Here. Like zero completely, and they're already on the boss. So whatever it is, it's worked out for a great. They moved the mini boss far enough away to outrange some of those bolstering stacks as the pack was dying. Really clever way of dealing with that affix. We've seen a couple other teams doing that exact same thing as well. Bone Buds are working on the mini boss right now. It looks like they also have a have planned to pull the boss here as well. They're gonna wait for that thundering to get applied to themselves and then start using those grief torches into boss, holding their first grief torches of the dungeon for almost two minutes but getting them to line up on that single target and with that thundering for some extra value. Still no lust yeah. out of Bone Buds. I wonder what they're holding it for at this point. So, hmm, I wonder if they're actually holding it or if it's just a UI bug. I know that there's some situations where Fury of the Ancients doesn't crack on our Bloodlust timer. Nope, it's ah, not okay. a bug. It just didn't pop it yet. There it is. There is the Bloodlust being used with the Army of the Dead. No power infusion. There's okay, no so we're just with two minutes. We're gonna go for as much as possible. Just with two minutes, yeah. All Interesting right, idea. I mean, it is tyrannical. It is tyrannical, right? And if you can do that first pull without bloodlust, and it doesn't cost you that much time, why not use it for more boss damage? You'll still get your second bloodlust on the final boss, which is where most teams are using it. And if it catches them up here, or even pulls them ahead, like it has here, why, yeah, why not? It's, it's actually bone strategy. buds that are gonna be ahead here. They are behind by a tiny bit of count, right? Like, two whelps worth of count? Yeah. That's probably not going to make a, a difference in terms of how much gets pulled upstairs, though. Both teams at this 25-ish percent going to get a little bit more after the uh, mini-boss dies here. They are going to both need to pull at least one dragon as well, right? When you have that, when you're coming upstairs with that kind of percentage, usually you'd be seeing, like, 40% before a team would be able to skip a dragon, so... Or skip both dragons, rather. So we'll see what their plans are upstairs. Looks like Thunderstruck are kind of clawing ahead a little bit of single target. Actually, no, it's going to be still tied, right? Both teams are breaking the shield right around the same time as each other here. And yeah, 1% difference in the boss HP. Both teams now finishing off that mini boss as well. Thunderstruck have been just ignoring that thing, only focusing the boss, not worrying about the mini boss at all. Let's go down for both teams and look at the HP here. These teams are neck and neck. We're on a razor's edge here. Teams rest finishing off the first boss here look at actually the same percentage across the board here i mean i'm sure a lot of this is going to come down to how they pull the second ring area does bone buds have the tech do they pull the dungeon like the best teams do do they go for the double destroyer pull are the teams pulling thunderhead or flame galay we'll have to see there's so much that you can do in the second section of the dungeon that changes the pace of the dungeon changes when you use your cooldowns just don't know until we yeah. get there here but again keeping it close a lot of good options upstairs. We'll see which ones the teams go with. It is going to be Bone Buds putting the boss on the board first. 0.45% down. But it's going to be five seconds of advantage that they've created at the start here. Their Lust is going to be up a little bit later than Thunderstruck, but that's probably not going to matter because uh, presumably both teams, you know, they'll have the Lust for whatever they want at the very end of the dungeon anyways. As the dragon flight happening now brings them up to the ring. Are they going to go left or right? Mm, it's 50-50. It is 50-50. Maybe they'll flip a coin. Do a slash roll two. To it looks like it's going to be left. Okay. okay. It's going to be left. Probably going skip left Thunderhead. And Bone Buds are starting off Bone a destroyer. single destroyer pull. Moving it towards the second destroyer. All right. Thunderstruck also looking like they are interested in the same thing here. Skipping Thunderhead. And they're going to take one destroyer. Are they just taking one destroyer? Oh, Both teams are just one taking destroyer. one destroyer. Okay. All right. Oh. Looks like Bone Buds are maybe trying to move towards chaining, but no, they're they're actually also just... So both teams here are just setting up a nice pull here, using their Vampiric Embrace, Nature's Vigil cooldowns on this pull as well. Huh. See... I the problem with doing smaller help? pulls like this is it really reduces the efficiency of the mage, right? You want yeah. things to live. You want big targets to hit as much as possible. One destroyer actually really doesn't cut it. It doesn't have that much more HP than everything else. So what they're probably actually doing with their mage player is they're combusting one of the destroyers out of like 30% HP, then just <gasps> swapping to the second second destroyer. Ooh, one death from Bone Buds at the end of that pull there. They do end up just using a battle res on him. 
interesting. Not wow. letting the full cast go through. Maybe they're really worried about the time in this dungeon. But that means they don't have another one available for the next, like, three and a half minutes. That's a... Uh... That's kind of an echo battle res right there, right? That's like a res that says, hey, we're, we're going fast. We're not going to die again. We need the time, right? We're, we, are, uh, we are being as fast as we possibly can here. That's, a, that's playing a win out of Bone Buds. I love it. They are still going to be a little bit behind as a result of that, but they are right on the heels of Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck do get the second destroyer down now. And we'll see if now Flame Goulet is perhaps on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Flame Goulet, a beautiful target to dump a combustion is? into. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks like currently far away is Flame Goulet. It's lifting off it's right now. Right Lamike is running forward, gonna taunt it in. Oh, yep, it is indeed. It's time it's dragon time. What? Is that is that the uh is that the rallying cry of this expansion? Yeah. It's dragon time. It's Dragon O'Clock! <laughs> it's Dragon 30! Alright, well, that's a that's a good combustion now for right. Thunderstruck, but now their damage is going to start wearing off as that mob is now sub-50% and starting to pulse for AoE damage that is increasing over time. A lot of damage starting to come out on the whole team of Thunderstruck here. They need to kill that dragon. They don't have Vampiric Embrace. They do have Nature's Vigil. Bone Buds also have pulled in Flame Goulet. They are also well, the about to reach for the, the curse. The pulsing damage? Oh, kill Put the dragon! Down. Kill it! And then Inferno on top of it, too! Okay, they skipped the Inferno. They, they, they killed it before the Inferno went off. That's okay. They can live through a couple more ticks of the, of the flame blade pulse. Oh, man, that was really, really scary. Oh. That Inferno cast had a sliver left, but now Bone Buds have taken that same pull into effect here. Flame Galay and a Blazebound Destroyer. They are going to get a bolstered Inferno cast off here. This is going to do a lot of damage, and the group's already pretty low. Chazazard has to do as much healing as possible to keep the team alive here, and he's really out of abilities. The only thing that he can really use here is the Emerald Communion, but he's confident enough to not have to use it to keep the group alive. Their tank is oh. so low, and he dies! He goes down! And we don't have oh, a battle res because we used off? it earlier. Oh, no. Okay, so... I mean, you can, right? This mob doesn't melee very much. You just run away. It looks like that's going to be the plan. Try not to get autoed. And they've well, done it. Okay, they've killed so it. Far. Okay. But our tank has the released tank as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, Bone Buds are probably going to try and meet their tank in this final destroyer pull, but that is a huge advantage now for Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck, notably, had Yoda die, were still in combat with like two mobs, finished the pack, and then cast an out of combat res. Thunderstruck are saying, you know what? Our battle reses are precious. That's how we lost last map, was we lost a battle res. We are not going to spend one of those things spuriously. So they actually have, are going to have two battle reses for the end of the dungeon, whereas Bone Buds still waiting for their second to recover. Yeah. Thunderstruck is definitely in a much more comfortable position than they were at the end of that last Shadow of Burial Grounds. And should be able to close this out. They just need to keep it very, very safe on all of these Inferno casts here. Make sure you're dealing with these Firestorms before they get their second Inferno cast off. Make sure you're getting good boulder baits. Make sure you're not accidentally aiming your boulders at any, you know, pebbles that are around the area. As long as they can do yeah, that, only on in a pretty solid spot. Only on absolutely flat terrain do we aim those pebbles. They are volatile. They are likely to explode. Oh, and they've gotten another nice, nice bait there, though. They do have to be a little bit careful because Thunderhead does still exist and is still flying around over on the other side. So they are going to be limited on how much space they have here. They're going to have to carefully kite towards the end of the boss area. Thunderhead has just flown away for Thunderstruck, so they're able to use this part of the room right now. Then after they bait the next boulder, they're probably going to start heading towards the exit. But then they're going to be sort of out of space, so they do need to actually get this boss dead before too much longer. Thunderhead gets Yeah, they've got enough space there. for potentially two more of the Firestorm deaths. And that's when they'll really start to run out of space for Molten Boulder Baits, as well as, you know, all of the big AoE circle that happens whenever the, uh, the Blazebound Firestorms die. Let's see how Thunderstruck proceeds here. That's gonna cut them off from the rest of the circle. They've only got this last little bit of room to deal with. This will be one of their ad bits. They're gonna do their best to bait the next Molten Boulder into their previous Fire Patches. That's well done. Bait. Is a good bait. 25% on the boss. 
Now, we kill this Firestorm, we actually ignore the next one, right? And we just go boss. Maybe we have to kill the next I mean, if you kill the next one, you're not going to have any space, right? So you're actually on a little bit of a clock here. This next boulder is aimed. It's kind of close to a tree, but it's not going to hit the tree immediately. And they are now going right into the end of this area. And this is just going to be tunnel oh, boss here for them. That's a, that's a rough spawn. They're going to need to get behind that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we're fine, actually. As long as they bait this molten boulder well, yep. Make sure you get away from that path so you don't accidentally hit a pebble. And they're good to go now. Just need to interrupt the ad and finish off the boss. Good execution there from Thunderstruck. The Inferno Dot is gone, and they are home free. Bone Buds, on the other hand, not really going for the super min-maxi strategy. Just kiting the boss around the circle, as you normally would in live keys. It's it's fine to do, right? If you're not going for full min-maxing, this is totally okay. You lose maybe 15 seconds just from running, but... That is not what Thunderstruck is going for. They're going for full min-max. Now, it's important to mention, because of the amount of trash they skip at the start of the dungeon, even though they f they, p they pull Flame Galay, they actually do need to pull this first channel that we, that we see most teams end up skipping. So they have to do all of the trash here to make up their trash count, which is going to cost them a little bit of time. But I believe Bone Buds is in the same scenario. Yeah, you can see their trash count number is essentially the same. Yeah, now this is rough for Thunderstruck, because this does mean it's probably going to be a three-pull ending of the dungeon, right? Because presumably, even though they've done all this stuff here, I don't think they can take the next pull onto High Channel or Avati, right? That sounds like a recipe for disaster. So they do still have two more pulls after this. Uh, maybe you can take those four onto Avati. Actually, maybe that's allowed. We'll see if they go for it. Yep, they are going for it. Okay, yeah. this is going to be very scary. Time dilation is used right on pull for Lemike. Spell reflection also used there. Now going to pop spell block. Trying to stay alive there. Velo also taking a lot of damage here. Time dilation, of course, was used on the tank, so not available for himself. Having to move, not able to free cast here as those little mobs start dying and charging at him. Luckily, Nature's Vigil is up. So that is doing a one lot of, the of work problems keeping this group alive. Pull. One of the biggest problems with this bowl, and this, this is what I think Dr. J specifically is going to hate the most, is when everyone has to say sack like this for all this AoE healing, the amount of Thunderclap debuffs that go out on the group is so nasty. That's a lot of haste loss. I think it's like something like 50% haste that you lose whenever you have that debuff on you. So the damage numbers coming out on the group are going to be so much lower. Like, look, Fire Mage with Combust should definitely do a lot more damage than what it's doing right now, but it's because he's had 50% re reduced haste for almost the entire pull. But Bella doing a great job of keeping everyone alive, essentially using every single button in the book. Rewind committed for the last Lightning Storm cast. He had the Emerald Communion for this one. He still has stasis that he can prep for the next one if he really needs to but it looks like most of the damage is going to be gone here just a couple extra shock blasts well get this, this last is bolstered though cast off. and this is bolstered this is a lot of damage oh. look at the buttons oh. being pressed iron bark alter time tank goes down but the trash is dead that was very 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 scary but fortunately the trash pack's dead they'll just be able to get a regular res off and have two of those battle reses left for the last boss yeah, with two battle reses, it is going to require so much more to go wrong for Thunderstruck to wipe to this boss than the last dungeon where they had zero battle reses, right? So they have such a buffer on this encounter. But it is still 22 tyrannical last boss of Ruby Life Pools. This is still very scary for them. Especially if they try and even cleave to be faster, then they will be in more danger of, uh, of disaster. Yeah. Looks like they're actually Let's mostly, see how they deal with it. mostly even cleaving here, it looks like, so far. A lot of damage is going Tell into Urkhart. pretty quickly. They committed a lot for this, though. This was every single cooldown. It was pretty much everything except for the Bloodlust. This is a bolstered Lightning Storm. It's not from High Channel or Rivati, though. They're going to they're be able to kill it off before that, I think, too. They might get one or two ticks of it at the last second here. Ooh. Not Bone quite buns. as bolstered as Thunderstrucks, though, so they're doing pretty fine. Not bad. They yeah, they actually managed to kill that first. Alive still. Yeah. They have the challenge. Well, well, alive. well done by Bone Buds. Except Big funnel. Okay, Thunderstruck right, now are going to be pushing into phase two pretty soon. Are they going to try and wait for one more dragon cycle before they do? They could just focus entirely on Karaka here. No, they're popping the lust. They are just going in here. Velo, unfortunately, getting bullied by the volcanic affix. Does eventually manage to get that flame breath <laughs> off. They've got a lot of things prepped here. You can see that Velo is stacking up that stasis. Once he has the three orbs over his head, he's ready to go. There's two of them. He uses Dream Breath on the last one, and he can pop that at any time here in the next little bit here. 
He's got it ready for the next flame spit, should they even get it. So they should be more than fine. They've got the VE Nutris Vigil ticking for this right now. This is the last flame spit debuff out on the group. You can see those three debuffs on the players. No problem whatever. It doesn't even expend the stasis. Just still has that prepped just in case. So masterful execution here from the This is what we were expecting from this team. Yes, it's not quite as fast as Monk is, but with the way they pulled the dungeon, we weren't really expecting it to, but still staying within like a minute and a half of that time is still pretty impressive considering the mistakes that were made in this dungeon, right? Two deaths on the board for them, and they're still going to take this win and bring us to a Game 3. One of the first Game 3s we've seen this weekend. We really haven't had that many three-game series. Yeah, I think yeah, there is going to be our first right. one. We are getting a third game here after a one and one between Thunderstruck and Bonebuds. That was actually pretty exciting. For a second, I wasn't too sure if Thunderstruck are going to get that one back, but a well-deserved win for them in this Ruby Light Pulse here, bringing out the Mage once more and showing it off. I think that's something you're exceptionally good at, uh, noting Dr. J's history on Mage as well. Of course, um, but in that Ruby Life Poles, there is one very important thing, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so in the replay, you'll see that actually uh, Thunderstruck pulled the mobs into the boss here, just walking through the hallway, having a little bit more trash count than the Bone Buds. The Bone Buds on their side, they actually Shroud skipped some of them. Uh, deciding not to play them and then pulling them into the boss as they win, making sure they don't have to deal with some of the chill weavers, making it a little bit easier for them, but that also meant that they had to catch up just a little bit. You can see it here. We're just going to walk on through, shroud this, so a little bit difference in route, and then they're going to take the, the fire into the boss with some of the other trash. Now, both teams deciding to go for single destroyer pulls. I thought was super interesting, something we haven't seen a lot. Most of the teams decide to go for the double destroyer right away. Here, side by side comparison of both of that single destroyer pull. I love this knock up mechanic, by the way. And then, interestingly enough, we, oh yeah, this happened as well. They, they sent that battle rest. I was super surprised by that. I thought, you know, it's the end of the pull, you can just rest or like release. Nope. They sent that battle rest, not wasting anything here. They wanted to use it right away. And then on the side of Thunderstruck, they actually had this pull here. So a destroyer and then purposefully, you could see it, purposefully pulling this dragon. Now, Zyra, what's the name of this dragon? Uh, well, people who don't want to have fun will call it Flame Gullet. But people who do want to <laughs> have not fun the... call it Flame Goulet. What do you call it, Dratnos? Flamegule is the third Whoa. evolution of this one. That's when you're. Oh, that's the one. That, I like when it's, that one. Especially when it gets raging, I think that's when it it gets promoted all the way up to <laughs> to that level. So actually, I looked it up because you know sometimes English words escape me, but <laughs> I looked up what it actually is. So the gullet, as it is correctly pronounced, is the mm -hmm. passage by which food passes from the mouth to the stomach. And another word for it is esophagus. So we can also call it the flame esophagus, which I think is also very fun. So now you have four options. I will allow them all in a, a, a nod to creativity. Chat was having a little bit of a discussion on that one. So I had to set the what's record the, straight. But yeah. What's the German name for that creature? Uh, I don't know. I would need to look it up. I play oh, okay. on English client. How hard would it be if I played on German client? I'd have to translate all of the things all the I time. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> but yeah, you can see the overall, and uh, we will be moving into that third dungeon, like we said before. Now, it is still anybody's game, but we are moving into the Algathar Academy. And just going by the stats, there is a little bit of a favor here for one team, and that is by four seconds was the hmm. Algathar Academy from Thunderstruck faster than the one by Bone Butts. But they're so close to each other, I think we might actually get a super exciting series. Yeah, now Algathar has been a mage dungeon a little bit in the past, but I think we know that Thunderstruck don't use that in here, so we're going to get to see... The old Jay Crotic, I believe, on his on his DK instead. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Really close matchup on paper, actually. This is 
on paper, I think this is the the best chance that Bone Buds had in the in the series to take a game off Thunderstruck. So if you're Thunderstruck, you got to be pretty disappointed about not two owing this one, not shutting them out. And if you're Bone Buds, you know this is your this is your opportunity here. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're going to fight for it, Zyro, right? You kind of have to, at this point, just send everything you have into that Algathar Academy. If you think about it, like, the teams are as close with their backs to the wall as you can be in this tournament. Lower bracket, 1-1. One, one. Loser of this game goes home. Winner gets to compete for one of those final two spots tomorrow. I mean, you do not want to lose this map if you're either of these teams, that's for sure. And this is a volatile map to do it on, bolstering Alathar. We've talked about this all weekend, how difficult this is to deal with, how many different tech things you have to do to make sure bolstering doesn't stack up too much. It's kind of crazy to deal with. And, you know, two back-to-back -back bolstering maps, it's... At least the teams kind of have that mindset of even cleaving things from going from the Ruby Life pools to this dungeon, but... I think Algathar is an entire different beast when it comes to the bolstering ethics. Yeah, I agree. I think bolstering really has to be something you respect there, and that definitely does limit the way in which you can pull some of these things. I really, you know, I, like most people, prefer when pulls go reaping style, and we just have, like, the, the triple Veximus pull, and just everything, all the nameplates. But uh, with bolstering, you need to be a little bit more careful with that, so probably going to see a more tamer version, although I do think Dratnos, both teams are going to go for that triple Veximus, right? Oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta spawn Veximus in one pull or else you're, uh, you're just, you're conceding so much time in that area of the dungeon. You're waiting for that boss to spawn and then you get to go do these worms, it's a really efficient thing to do, but yeah, it's, it's really scary. It's such a scary part of the dungeon and it's right at the beginning too, so you do get your cooldowns, you do get everything for it, but... I mean, we've seen teams wipe to that area of the dungeon before. It is extremely dangerous. We see, we saw even Perplexed wiping to that uh, last weekend. So, it can happen to anybody. And if that happens to either team here, that's gonna they're gonna be so far behind so early in the dungeon. Yeah, absolutely. And as teams are getting ready, one more time, Zyro, who's gonna win this series now that we've seen two dungeons? What do you who do you have in favor? Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck, Dratnos, what says you? Hmm, I think I'm gonna go with Bone Buds. Um, I, much All as right. I would love to see the Thunderdome tomorrow, I, I got a good feeling about Bone Buds. I think they, they looked solid in the other games, and this is their best map in the series by the numbers, so yeah. All right, let's see how it goes. Game is starting. All righty, so it is the uh, same comp from both teams here. The Mage is on the bench for Thunderstruck. Dr. J hopping on to J Karotic Z, the powerful DK. A lot of players going and grabbing that mastery buff, I believe. Look at this for Thunderstruck here. here. Velo uh, <laughs> Dude, the, the hops around. Like, okay. So if you do that as an invoker, what, what is Velo up to here? He doesn't have to use a potion if he does this. That's, Just, that's literally all it is. I see. Saves his potion cooldown by doing this. Very nice. And then gets to use the shocking disclosure here. Okay. All right. Yep. You know what? It's not bad. That's, that's worth. That sounds great to me. Yeah, of course, you could use Shroud of Concealment there, but we know that Thunderstruck planned to use Shroud of Concealment after Veximus to get past the bridge, right? And you can't use it for both if you're going fast. You can on live servers, though. If you're, if you're ever doing this dungeon on live, you'll probably have six minutes uh, between those two events. But check this out, Dragnos. We have an exact opposite scenario of the previous dungeon. This first massive A we pull Bone Buds is the team that commits the Bloodlust to it. We're oh. Thunderstruck. We're able to hold on to theirs for the boss. And more problems for Bone Buds, as even with the Bloodlust, they're not able to stay alive as these bolstering mobs stack more and more damage on them. Hemoglobin goes down at the last second. Fortunately, they were able to deal with the trash pack so they don't have to commit the what? They, they did it again. They just battle res. They just send the battle and res. We're out of combat. Just send an AoE res! Your healer doesn't have to get in combat! Why would you...? Uh, I don't understand. They did it, it's done, the battle res is used, they don't have one for the next nine minutes, that's the decision they've made. However, Thunderstruck already onto the boss, they've got the Ravager pack in here, plus a couple extra free worms, but they have the Bloodlust, that's the most important thing. And they're just gonna pull so far ahead on the boss because of this, I feel like. 
Yeah, Thunderstruck looking good here so far, but it's worth noting it's a scary boss and they have a lot of trash in here and it is bolstering as well. That Ravager is going to get very large. So you can see what Velo is doing is playing so that he's the farthest person. The Ravager always chooses the farthest person to jump on. And whenever he gets targeted, he's line of sighting the bolst or the jump so that it won't target him. Brilliant little strategy there by Velo. Again, you can see he's making sure that he's just grabbing these uh, orbs. Oh, gets jumped on, oh! though! And actually, it's going to be him and Yoda both going down here. Now, Dr. J does have a battle res, chooses Velo, but now Thunderstruck are down a res and mid-boss combat. Soda is taking a lot of damage here as well. Still has cheat death available, but now they have this bolstered worm causing them problems here. That thing has a lot of hit points as well. It's going to get another stack of bolstering here in a sec. Velo trying his best to keep this stabilized, but Bone Buds also have Chazazar going down. Now, Bone Buds should have a battle res available for this, but don't because they used it earlier on their uh, on their player out of combat. So Bone Buds are actually in a much worse position here than Thunderstruck. By trying to save five seconds on that battle res, they're going to lose a lot of time here because I don't know how you live this fight with Nature's Vigil expiring without a healer. I... Maybe you can. You can live through a couple of mana bomb ticks. The problem is you have to live from also taking the damage from soaking all these orbs in the room. This is one of the highest damage, damage and tick fights in the game right now. This is probably the number one healing check fight in Mythic Plus well, for healers right now. It's... I don't know how you do it without a healer. Yeah, I mean, you, you again, you have defensives, you have Death Strike on Hemoglobin, so you always have that. You have a Druid that can cast out some regrowths. You have a rogue with cheat death, and the uh, cloak has already been used. Yeah, you have two banishes, so you don't have cloaked in shadows. Oh, just barely lived into the fissure. Wow. Still alive, okay, not too bad. Everyone's That's gonna still be alive. Cheap, and the though. great thing for Bone Buds here, if they can pull this off, actually, they're not in that bad of a position, right? Because they can just have their druid res their healer up. And yeah, they're gonna yeah. get one less set of mana bombs here. It might take out the druid, but. Yo, they were able to make this work. They actually okay. have the Vigil, but they pop it at the last second there. Oh, you would have liked to see them potentially save that for the next pack. But both teams able to make it work with the player down. And Bone Buds actually made up a lot of time there, because their dead player was their healer, not doing that much damage. They had three DPS alive the entire time. Let's see how big the Shroud save helps out Thunderstruck here, because we know they use the Shroud here. They skip past all this trash, and then they also snap some of it up later on to that... That patrol, the guardian in the middle of the bridge upstairs, so that should help them out a bit here, but this is a dangerous trash pack. That once again, pulling another Ravager on bolstering can be dangerous. Yeah, they have the Mana Fiends in here as well. A lot of teams are choosing those mobs as the ones to snap up, but Thunderstruck say, you know what? We can do it with this pull. It'll be fine, but they are under very much pressure here because they don't have a battle res, so for five minutes... If anybody dies, it could potentially be the end of their pull. A lot of these pulls really need all five of their players to work. You can see they're baiting, and actually... Whoa, I love what Yoda did there. So Yoda did a little Feral Druid trick. He was the farthest person away from that Ravager by design, so he was targeted by its next jump. And he was in his incarnation, which gives you one free Prowl. So he baited it on himself, and then he, he stealthed to cause it to cancel. Unfortunately there, it looks like one actually just landed with bolstering stacks on Jay. I think it was targeting the mic, but maybe Jay was in the circle as well. So Thunderstruck are going to have to use another res here. And that's going to cost them another 15 seconds or so. It might yeah. have just been a surge cast that had like five or six stacks of bolstering, and that will one-shot you on this key level. Could so be. Here we Could absolutely go be. on to the Guardian. Are they trixing here? It yeah, looks like it, yeah. So I'm assuming the trash will be coming shortly. There it is. There it is, there, and there it's just going to be some already. worms. All right, so the nice thing about this is that by snapping these mobs rather than any mana fiends, these arcane foragers don't really do anything. Like, they don't require any interrupts. They just jump on random people and, uh, and hit them, right? So you just let that happen and uh, otherwise not worry too much about it and just keep focusing single target into the sentry. Let these things get cleaved down. Let them get uh, contribute to your funnel damage as well. That's what Thunderstruck are choosing to do here. Bone Buds, on the other hand, finishing off this pull, they're going to be a little bit ahead in count when all this is said and done. It looks like they are going to be snapping up these three. There's a little bit more of a like a live key plan in this area, something you can absolutely do on live in this area. Oh, beautiful rescue as well uh, to get upstairs. And yeah, they're bringing those mobs. Oh, are they? 
Maybe not. It's all the tricks. They should be oh, popping okay, up. Yeah. There we there go. They are. All right. Wait, nice. these are these are nasty mobs, though, right? I yeah. Mean, severing I mean, slash. They've got they've got the battle axe. They've got the mana fiend, like you were talking about earlier. This is a lot of group damage that could potentially go out on this pack. I mean, I guess the sentry doesn't really add that much as long as you don't get hit by one of the wandering tornadoes. But still, uh, this is yeah, this is definitely a lot more difficult to deal with than the mana worms. Let's keep an eye on Thunderstruck, though, because they have some really, really cool tech they do here to deal with that bolstering management. When the next set of eagles come down, they actually will use Mass Root to keep the small eagles upstairs. It's actually not on this pack that they do it. I think they do it on the next pack, and they might do it on both. But they, they really want to make sure they manage their bolstering as much as possible. Yeah, it's on the next pack that they do it with the, with the double eagles. Because when you only have one major eagle to hit, it's a little bit easier to just hard focus that one down. Let's see if we can uh, yeah. actually get like a nice little clip of them doing it. I'm sure we'll. I'm sure we'll be able to see that. They also have landslide from Velo if they need it for a similar effect. But of course, Mass Root's so great for that and works even when they're all the way up in the air. So, yep. Very, uh, very cool bit of Druid tech there. Thunderstruck are two packs ahead of Bone Buds right now in terms of timing. Although Bone Buds have killed a couple extra enemies, so they will need a little bit less count from the end of this dungeon. And yeah, there's that mass there root. You, you can, can see, see those it. little eagles upstairs, all mass rooted. <laughs> the Dreadnoughts, where are the roots coming from? That is a good question, yeah. My immersion is shattered right now by mass root working on airborne enemies. Hopefully that'll be something that can get changed soon, because this strategy, is, it's, ju it's just breaking my brain. Do you think the roots should just extend all the way to the ground? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be better, actually. <laughs> that would be really good. Well, I don't think you should be able to use mass root above concrete, right? Like, they're on concrete here. They should need to go over the grass oh. for that to work, I think. Mm. Yeah, you're probably right. Are you yeah. saying druids aren't powerful enough to force roots to go up through concrete? I guess it should, it should like, break through the concrete, right? Yeah. Permanently uh, turn it into grass. All right, well, Thunderstruck are going to be now spawning the boss here. 9.27, their timer when they've finished off that trash. Reasonably quick, given that they had a death on Veximus as well for so long on that fight. Now they just have to wait for the boss to spawn. Bone Buds are working on Eagle Pull number two. Bone Buds not going to be doing this bolstering tech. It actually looks like they're going to be just using Typhoon and uh, Volpera, or not Volpera Racial, rather, but uh, of course, Drakthir Racial, uh, to send those mobs away and just kite away from them. They're also using Death and Decay slow, it looks like, to keep them kind of slowed out there, and Ursul's Vortex, so a very different plan than just the single button mass root, but it does mean that they, uh, actually, I'm not even sure, maybe they just don't even talent mass root then. Potentially, yeah, you kind of have to go out of your way to go for that, right? So, yeah, if, they, if they've done all this, there's no way they're actually also talented into Master. But again, they're just so far behind right now in terms of actual time. Two whole trash pulls behind probably will easily translate into over a minute worth of time behind Thunderstruck. And if I remember Thunderstruck earlier, they actually were really, really good about making sure they timed their cooldown usage on this boss, plus the damage amp, with Thundering. They were really good about doing that. This time around, it's not going to happen. Thundering has already procced for them. They would have to wait another 70 seconds to line up the damage imp with the next thundering, and I'm not really sure they're going to wait that long to do it. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, they're thundering. The first intermission phase. Thundering has just gotten thrown off by that early death, right? Like, all the their planned timings for it that they may have yeah. had for this dungeon are all out the window, so they are just sending this boss on cooldown in, in a sort of way that you would in a regular group. Maybe they're checking their thundering CD to see if there's ever something good they can do with it, but... Definitely no way you wait 90 seconds or 70 seconds from pull uh, to try and set up a good, favorable overlap. And yeah, so because we saw that Vortex out of Bone Buds, that, that means they're not playing the route because those two are on the same, that's the same choice node as each other. So Ursula's Vortex, though, it's a nice thing to have for some of these other pulls. So Bone mm -hmm. Buds uh, may get some value out of it, particularly against like the Echo Knights. We'll see if they can. Otherwise, though, I do really like the mass route in this dungeon because that is so much value it brings on those eagles. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the coolest little tiny little tech bits we've seen from the teams this weekend in order to deal with the dungeon affixes. Of course, the other coolest run we've seen this weekend also come from coming from Thunderstruck with all that snapping tech they did in the Azure Vaults. Kind of a little sad we didn't get to see it again today, but hopefully we can see it tomorrow if they do end up winning this series. Proth is at 5% from them. Bone Buds haven't yet procced 
that damage amp gate yet. So it's kind of hard to tell exactly how far behind they are because they haven't really you know gotten their burn phase on the boss here. But the boss going down for Thunderstruck while Bone Bud still have it at 50% is pretty indicative of how far ahead they are here. They really just need to play this next section, two sections of the dungeon as safe as possible, not make any major mistakes, and they will end up taking this this dungeon in, you know, series. Yeah, this is uh, certainly Thunderstruck's to lose from here. I don't know what would have to happen for Bone Buds to be able to overtake on their own end, right? I think it's... I think they're no longer in charge of their own destiny here. It's going to be all about the Thunderstruck side of things, but... You know, that worked out for Bone Buds and Shadow Moon, right? Bone Buds are certainly, or Thunderstruck are certainly a team that, you know, they're really gonna, gonna need to make sure that they stay clean here. Beautiful Mass Root again comes out. So they Mass Rooted the Skitterflies that are behind them and to the left there, you can see now in front of our camera. Uh, those ones have been Mass Rooted. And then Soda sapped the patrol leader of the other Skitterflies. And by doing that now, they have both of those Skitterflies locked down. They're in position where they know where they're at and they don't have to accidentally pull them, and they'll be able to bring them both in to the boss whenever they want. Really good way uh, of managing those Skitterflies, particularly on Bullstring, where you are really not interested in Skitterflies getting involved with this. Here we go. This is our this is our gap right now. Groth just went down now for Bone Buds a minute and five seconds after Thunderstruck dealt with that boss on similar levels of trash count, right? So it's, it's going to be a rough one. Actually, I think Bone Buds is even further behind in trash count than I initially uh, I suspected. Think Bone Oh, Maybe actually, no, Thunderstruck did kill off all the small flowers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's just tra It's ju it's just boss timing. Yeah, no, I like the idea behind not dealing with the Skitterflies now, because in order to spawn the boss, you just need to deal with these Vile Lashers, right? Once the Lashers have done, the boss RP has started. And so then you can just pull the Skitterflies into the boss and do as much cleave slash funnel as you potentially could here. They have the Bloodlust too, and I don't remember from the previous one whether they opt to use it here. This does seem like a pretty suitable spot to pop it. Let's see what the plan is. Nature Vigils is up. They have the Army of the Dead, so this would be a good op option for the uh, for the Bloodlust. Yeah, Puzzle Box being puzzle used box as well. Box. You have all your cooldowns for this, but on the other hand, it's maybe a little bit less dangerous than the uh, Echo of Doragosa with Trash Pull. So maybe they want to hold mm. their lust for that. Rally's going to come out for Thunderstruck as they have a lot of enraged Skitterflies now. Not, of course, the Affix, that's not active on this run, but the self-agitations that they cast on themselves. Yoda taking a lot of damage here. Still has a stack of the bleed as well. He's gonna get it cleared by Velo, maybe, but Velo takes a big Man, spike Velo. of damage. Wow-wee. Maybe that was an auto That's about as close branch. as you can come. That, that, that must have been, because nothing else else was yeah. going off there that would have done that damage to him. And if Evokers okay, wore Leather Armor, that with. would be a dead healer. Actually true. Very, very good the Armor for types come though. into play. Oof. Absolutely. Bone Buds having a cheat death happen here. Actually, oh, their, uh, their rogue ended up taking the Swirly there, the green Swirly. So that's minus one cheat death for them. The Thunderstruck working towards the end of this boss here. Another Grief Torch comes out from Lamike. One auto from the boss goes unmitigated as a result and nearly chunks him below half. <laughs> Gotta do as much damage as possible, Grief man. Torch. Yeah, of course. All right, so they are mounting up now, and we'll see how they want to get the last 22% that they need. Looks like Here it's going to go. be a medium I mean, you pull, can mass pull and then this. a pull of the boss. Yeah. Probably something like that. Like one big pull, and then you'll pull one or two trash packs into the boss with that bloodlust. Uh, do they use the top of the uh, the staircase spot here? I think they do, yeah. So, for those of you who don't know specifically how this spot works, if you have everything, everything stacked on the staircase, you can actually stand underneath these Echo Knights and not get hit by the Astral Whirlwinds. And the, the great use of that is that means you can stay in with the bombs that do AoE damage to them and not have to worry about dying to the whirlwind. So, yeah, this is a great tech spot for people that aren't aware of that. Yeah, it's the melee DPS here that are benefiting. Velo being up on this little diamond thing, that's probably just anti-storming tech. Uh, just kind of a nice place to be for that reason. But the melee DPS are all getting to be in melee of the Echo Knights by being lower elevation than them and dodging under those, uh, those astral whirlwinds, so... Very good way to use these stairs. Makes this pull go from being one of the most dangerous ones to being, I wouldn't say not dangerous, but a lot more manageable, right? Yeah, definitely a lot more manageable. It's definitely still a dangerous pull for your tank. Those arcane missile casts do a ton of damage, okay. but it definitely makes it easier. Let's watch for the rest Yoda here. 
Actually, I, I, it's gonna be Soda probably. Yeah, okay, he blinds one mob. That mob's gonna come in later. And they're just gonna take the rest of these into the pack now. And this is gonna be, they're gonna get up to like 97% and then those last mob or two are gonna, gonna show up for them. This is very scary. This is gonna be the lust soon for Thunderstruck. Uh, it looks like they got everything. Because this is a lot more than just the four mobs or than just the one mob that they that they blinded, right? This is six mobs, so I wonder if that didn't work out for them. That being said, this is where they should be using their bloodlust, but they haven't popped it yet. Where's the bloodlust? Maybe waiting for the next waiting thundering, for thundering here. Yeah. Potentially. Oh, there's okay. a grief torch coming out, so maybe not. Oh. Okay. I would imagine you want to use it to clear out the AoE as much as possible, but maybe they just they really want to maximize their damage here. There's the army of the dead. Where's there's the yep. bloodlust? Okay. There we go. Just maximizing damage, right. I suppose. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a thundering during this bloodlust, although even if it's not quite at the start, right? Just knowing that they're gonna get full value from multiplying those two cooldowns together. And yeah, here comes the Thunderstruck DPS. 50% on the boss and dropping. Last few Echo Knights need to go down here for them, and this is still not quite going to be count, but you can see that last Invoker is coming in now. That one from outside that was blinded is going to be their last piece of count that they need, so getting the last little bit much more safely here. 38% on the boss. Thunderstruck are doing a great job here of staying safe. That last Echo Knight's going to fall for them. Yeah, doing Maybe a great 9%. job of just making sure they're dealing with the mob trash trash abilities while also not getting hit by any of the Astro Bus on the boss, boss as well. Just again, this is the Thunderstruck we were kind of expecting this entire series. And honestly, it's we got it all three games. It was just that one little moment of trying to do too much at the end of the Shadow Moon Burial Ground that set them behind. But to have the wherewithal to bring it back over a three-game series to play clean in two dungeons where you are dead to rights, you lose that map, you're out of the tournament, and you're, you're forced to go into the last stand bracket, that is a great sign, a great omen of themes to, things to come for this team, that they, that they have that mental capacity, that mental stability to keep it clean, keep it strong in the lower bracket. I'm actually really happy to see more of this team tomorrow. Yeah, me too. Well played by Thunderstruck. And also by Bone Buds, though. That's going to be Thunderstruck stopping the clock. 1936 here in Algathar. Wow. Pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. That was pretty quick. And Thunderstruck, like you said, showing up and showing off what we expected from them. Now, that's not to say that this run was completely clean, but whenever something bad happened, they were able to kind of recover it and go back and still figure it out. Like here at the beginning, we did see the bloodlust from Bone Buds, which I thought was really interesting. Like the triple Vexmos pull is definitely one of the hardest in the entire dungeon at the moment. You could see Emo even going down here, but still that's your bloodlust gone. And on the other side, we did see Thunderstruck use that bloodlust on Vexmos itself, I guess making sure that they have the most damage here into that Ravager pack, or Forager pack rather, uh, with one Ravager, making sure they have all of the damage. But for both teams, stuff went kind of a little bit wrong. Uh, however, both of them were able to recover it. Now, the Bone Buds had sent their Battle Rest prior, so they didn't have one, but Thunderstruck had one and they used it on Velo. So they had a healer and Bone Buds had no healer, but all three DPS. Both of the teams for manning that boss here, to my surprise, I mean, I am aware that you can run this dungeon without healers, because uh, Nagura showed that one off, but still, it is something different to do that in MDI speed, right? So having that actually work out for them here was pretty cool, uh, and I really loved seeing that that without healer boss uh, for the bone butts. Maybe, you know, maybe we're going to see a healerless run now that that's allowed. Just putting it out there. Uh, from then on, it was pretty much your typical Algathar run. On the side of Thunderstruck, we saw some cool tech that I wanted to highlight. I think you guys spoke about it as well. Uh, same as in the previous time we saw them, there was a mass route being deployed mid-air here for this pack. This time it was even better than the last time because the mass route is so far up. Like you can see Yoda do it right now. And the birds are just staying up there beautifully, making sure that they're not really getting in fight and you have to have a much easier time with that ball string. 
And then my favorite moment in all of Algathar Academy is when you have this boss, you have everything in there, it spawns the first little ads and you get to like blast AOE, like any class that has a good AOE rotation, I think she'll the same about that as Unholy DK main. It's just, ah, it, it feels great to have that. Uh, and I really love seeing it in the eye particularly. And then this tech, I think you guys explain it as well. Um, I kind of clowned on it the last time we saw this dungeon, but like you said, these Echo Knights, they do a whirlwind. And if you're standing like right under them on the stairs, you're not getting hit by that whirlwind because of the location difference. Like the Echo Knights are above you and you're not getting hit by it, even though you are in that attack range, allowing you to still have uptime without needing to step uh, away from it or needing to constantly CC, which I think is really cool as well. And then in the end, Thunderstruck getting that win here. But I do want to shout out Bone Buds. I think they showed us extremely well play, and I would love to see them again in the MDI. In that combination, there was a little bit of, uh, of a mix-up in their team setup from the last time we saw some of them. Uh, they actually banded together with someone from another team, and so it became the Bone Buds. And hopefully, you're going to see them maybe in the TGP or in the next MDI, but it is going to be Thunderstruck that move on, Dratnos, and I think... That just put the Thunderdome, Thunder series, Thunder, Thunderstruck game so much closer to reality. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I was rooting for this at the start of the series. Bone Buds kind of turned me into believers. I, I, I loved their battle reses as well. I loved, I loved the out of combat battle reses from Bone Buds, just going for it as just well. Send so, it. <laughs> ha have to root for them uh, once I saw them. Once I saw them with, you know, such a. Uh, such vigor in their in their gameplay but uh yeah thunderstruck I, I i'm i'm glad they made it through of course as well very happy for for them and uh very happy about the chances of the thunderdome tomorrow just one yeah. series between us and uh and that being a reality as well thundered would have to win this next one as well which i believe is our next series as well so yeah that's mm. right next series is coming up is going to be thundered against the mythic meme dream team you can see our bracket here uh the thing that dratnos is hoping for that is that thunder moves on from that game and then tomorrow as our second game after monka versus cheese we'll have thunderstruck against thunder in a thunder matchup uh that is going to leave a lot uh left to be desired but, Zyro, how do you feel about the next series? Do you also want Thunder to move on? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm Team Thunderdome. Let's get it. I want to see which one of the teams with Thunder in their name gets to uh, play against the loser of Monka and Cheese. That's going to be a banger. But, yeah, All right. You know, actually, I, I was I hoping you were going <laughs> to root for Mythic Meme Dream Team, but then chat just has to do that because I called out Thunder as wildcard, so I'm definitely rooting for them. But I think yeah, Mythic same. Meme Dream Team has played really good as well. So we're going to see how, how they look in that series as it is coming up next. And uh, we're going to go into a short break. Don't go anywhere. And we'll be right back with the last series of the day.
We are back for the final match of the day. We've already sent three teams home. It's time to send the fourth one home. Got a banger of a matchup here. We've got Thundered versus MMDT, and both are teams that have shown pretty decent amount of promise today. Thundered is one of the teams that looked really strong at the start of the weekend here, but unfortunately earlier today ran up against Munka, who are just the titans of the bracket this weekend. MMDT, on the other hand, making their way through the lower bracket relatively clean. I think before the break, Dratnos and I already gave a couple of our thoughts on this one, but uh, Tettles, what are you thinking of this series? I think that consistency is going to be the most important thing. I think that Thunder should, in theory, have slightly better times than MMDT, just looking at the seeding and then just kind of like looking at how they played across the whole entire weekend. So I think that Thunder should be slightly favored, but not enough to like overcome if Thunder or MMDT have like consistency issues where they're wiping. I think that like if any deaths or mistakes are occurring inside of the routing, that can swing things pretty heavily because the times should be close enough to where like you know i think that this is gonna be a situation where if they're like well even one or two deaths mmdt could beat thundered um whereas for thunder like they need to make sure that they continue to play clean they're a team that we talked about or they talked about in like their pre-weekend interviews and and stuff that we had uh, sent out to them that they thought that they could actually potentially come in second place on the whole entire weekend and i think that's going to start with them being more consistent sure they lost to monka but like they, they have to be like make sure that they're playing their game plan if they think that they can battle for those top two slots. Absolutely. And it's not going to be easy for them either. We're starting off on knock a defensive and unbannable first map of the series. Banning out the Algathar makes sense with the bolstering. Shadow Moon also being banned out. Then we're going to Ruby Life Pools. And if we do go to a game three, we've got the potential to see Halls of Valor for the first time this weekend. Dratnos, take us through those bans really quick before we get into the match. Yeah, so, I mean, it means that we're starting off in tw in 23 Tyrannical Sanguine Explosive Knockered Offensive here for, for the teams. That's going to be a really, really scary map. This combination of affixes in this dungeon, this key level, I mean, these are going to be some very killy pulls. And the bosses as well, extreme lethality here, especially if you're doing anything super aggressive with them. First boss area... Uh, sanguine healing is going to be the big thing to watch out for, right, Zyra? Just making sure that you don't like sanguine longbows and, and other mobs that are difficult to group. Yeah, 100%. Like the one earlier time we saw Knockout earlier today, one team had three times more sanguine healing than the other team, and that pretty much seemed to be the entire name of the game in this dungeon. But here we go, Knockout underway. Let's see how they deal with this dungeon. All right, now let's look for the tech here as this wall comes down. Ooh, they don't know the tech. The tech Slow is... fly. <laughs> you you press your two button when you see the number two on the yes. uh, on the countdown. You do that, and then you're off GCD when you, when the wall goes down, and you can immediately hit the three button and uh, speed yourself up. So a little bit of tech if anybody wants to do this. I'm not I'm not actually sure if it's faster, but you do get airborne earlier. It, it's much faster if you hit the if you hit the up into the whirling sur uh, surge. You're able to get off the ground. You know, you, you probably get to the wow. pack two to three seconds faster. Now, if you're waiting for the patrol to like kind of get closer to where this pack is grouped up, it's not going to save you any time. But for some situations, it definitely gets you to the pack uh, just a hair Ooh. faster. And look at Thunder and MMDT. Uh, Thunder do a great job of utilizing that that evoker knock that wing buffet to get the pack spread a little bit, but it saves them oh. infinite sanguine healing. Whereas on the side of MMDT, first off, they have a death. And secondly, they already have 7 million healing from sanguine. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah, this is going really painfully oh, for MMDT. No, no, Look no, at this no, sanguine no, puddle no, that no, they are no, dropping no. in the archery range here of these not good longbows. That one is gonna full heal now. Get Almost them out of 10 there. million. Wow. Get them out of the sanguine, man. Yeah, I mean, so note note the compositional difference between the two teams as well, right? Mythic Meme Dream Team have one less knock because they aren't playing a druid, right? So they don't have Typhoon. Yeah. So that's one less piece of sanguine disruption that Mythic Meme Dream Team are, are missing out on. Whereas Thunder, they have Grip, they have uh, Evoker Racials like both teams do, but they also have that powerful druid Typhoon. So that is a big so, difference between the, the two teams that might matter against the sanguine affix. Would you say they're putting the knock and knock hood? I think that that's, yeah, that's really one of the best things to be doing in here. <laughs> All right, as Thundered here, they only have one uh, one more of these ballistas left to activate before Granith does spawn. I'm interested to see their strategy for Granith. Uh, 23 Tyrannical, 
in theory, they could go like root into like dominant mind, dominant mind, dominant mind CC and and have to kill zero ads. I think that that's going to be generally the faster play for being able to kill this boss. But I'm, I'm interested to see what Thunder does uh, with their CC, how they have this uh, pull set up and how they have the boss set up. Because I think the boss, that's I, I, I think a lot of people actually lose a decent amount of time on Granite just killing so many ads. And I think that during the MDI, it's also been something uh, to watch out for. Thunder would also have that that patrol that's still active in the middle, which leads me to believe they're going to pull that pack on top of the boss. Yeah, now this is something we've seen a couple of different teams do over the past couple of weekends. With Sanguine, you have to be very careful with this, and it looks like they are setting up for it, but you really do not want to Sanguine heal a boss. That's one of the ways to lose infinite amounts of time, so Thundered are going to get their Thundering proc here right on pull. That's going to be nice for them. They're going to start is, damaging here. And, oh, Singularity down for Mythic Meme Dream Team. No battle is available. It's going to have to release and run back. So even more uh, slight problems coming in for MMDT. Oh, look at this. Okay, for Thunder, they, they've rooted the first Saboteur here. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see if they're going to continue to leave that rooted for the remainder of the, the fight or like what they're going to do. Because I think that, again, like I was saying earlier, I think that this makes the most sense is killing zero of these adds. And like once they fire the first Lance, I think that they're only going to get back to this first Lance one time. Ooh, that Saboteur actually is released. We're going to get a re-CC on it? Or what are we No, maybe do? they don't have to, right? That one was the one going back to the first Ballista. Maybe they know they can kill before they need that fifth shot, right? Or it's the... That would be very yeah. interesting. Oh, they okay, they dominate-minded uh, it maybe. Yeah, yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, they have the dominant mind on it. So now, what are they gonna do with the second ballista mob? It looks like the second ballista mob is rooted off to the side. I can't, can't exactly see it with yeah. the camera POV that so we have here. The way it works, right, is that the later ones you can just CC for a little while, shoot their ballista, the and then let that ballista get sabotaged, right? But this one, you can see that one. Okay, yeah, they're just gonna chain dominate mind on the one that is heading to the first ballista they used, because that's also gonna be the fourth ballista that they will definitely need to use again. So. Uh, yeah. That is the, the theory here. You can see Massroot staying on that other saboteur as well. Potentially possible to just keep that thing chain rooted too. And yeah, you can see there's a mass root on one and an entangling yeah, root on the other. Well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Not not too bad. I think that this uh this makes a lot of sense and then we're just leaving that one dominate minded um because they're going to get back to that ballista one time so they don't want it to be like completely deactivated, but they're not going they're not going to get any more shots off after this one right here. I think that this is going to be like the final shot that they get and do some damage to the boss and then they're going to be burning, you know, the little, the little remaining 17%. MMDT on the right hand side. I mean they they were really slow with that sanguine healing. I think that that's cost them probably somewhere in the order of like a couple of minutes even. Um and then on top of that, they have 10 seconds of depth differential. So they're, I think at this point, kind of hoping that Thunder makes a mistake in, in either the second or the third boss area trash. Yeah, that's going to be the... Uh, well, I mean, it's a half a boss here for Mythic Meme Dream Team, so maybe they can speed up over the rest of the dungeon to catch up. But yeah, Thunder are definitely in the lead here. They've gotten a solid amount of advantage. This is kind of the most amount of time you could hope to gain from a boss split if the other team doesn't wipe, right? Like, this is a lot of time. Uh, in just the first five minutes that is going in favor of Thundered. I've been trying to figure it out for a couple minutes now. What does Bazook's name mean? Hmm. Donuts? Is he like a donut fan, maybe? I think so, yeah. I think that's probably it. I think it's, um... Huh. I think Maybe he's just a fan of Timbermaw. Yeah? I don't know. It could be Dragon, not Torin, right? DNT could be that, yeah. And I don't know what the Z was the Z? for, though. Uh, there's just kind of no maybe way to be sure. Oh, maybe. Well, he is a dragon. We'll have to look into it later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because sometimes right. there there's some Torin healers that we see, but oh, oh. Mythic Beam Dream Team are Wait, encountering oh an eruption channel. What? That's gonna be a wipe for them. Wait, I missed it. What? That. What happened? Okay, so the eruption happens if you don't use the ballista on the boss. What? Huh? Wait. So maybe they got a ballista dismantled by one of the ads, right? They, maybe an ad reached the ballista, and if that dismantle saw, cast happens, that. you are dead. Well, they they let one get dismantled, and then they gripped the the ad back into melee. But I I thought that it remantled. It, it well, it takes some time though, and if you're super close to the eruption cast, you're just gonna die to it during that. So yeah. Yeah, Mythic Meme Dream Team gonna have to try Granith again, and that means that it's all about Thundered now. Thundered have gained so much time off of this split. 
It's gonna be, so I mean, something like four minutes off of the first boss split in favor of Thundered, plus a battle res in their favor now as well. Oh my god, it didn't remantle in time. Yeah. That is quite unfortunate for MMDT. Okay, well, uh, that's, that's a really bad wipe. Right, from the right side, or on the left side of your screen here, you have Thundered. Now they basically need to, they need to avoid a modern day catastrophe is what I will say. They would have to wipe, wipe what, on the final boss really late into it for MMDT to be able to catch yeah. up here? Well, I think that even one late boss fight wipe if they're clean the rest of the run, they actually still probably have a lead over MMDT. So at this point, MMDT are pretty close to needing Thundered to make multiple big mistakes, right? Or a series of small time losses plus a medium or one mistake, right? That's, that's probably what needs to happen here for MMDT to get back in this. The good news for MMDT is that Thundered are playing a 23 tyrannical knockout, right? Like, these are deadly bosses. There's still a big chance of failure on bosses like Raging Tempest, uh, like Balakar Khan, so... I mean, it's not over just yet, but Thundered have a huge advantage. All right, so now Thundered here. They're doing they're doing the Thunder Beast in this pack. This pack, by the way, with this Thunder Beast is absolute suicide on live keys. Uh, even on a tyrannical setting, it, this is a pull that, like, if you have anything go wrong, you first off your tank can die. It's a it's a pull that like is does an incredible amount of tank damage just because that Kodo absolutely sauces your tank. And then on top of that, you have like the arc blades uh, beating them up. You need to make sure that you're getting multiple kicks on both the Kodo and on that uh that named mob caster. And so it, it's that that is a pull that Thunder just did, and they made it look easy. That is that is not an easy pull that they j were able to just pull off there. And now they're now they have an easy pull. This is a a very standard live pull that you do. This is typically how the sequencing works in this area. Thunder, the way that Thunder is doing this is just to make sure that their offensive cooldowns are up for the difficult pulls and on pull on the boss, and then they are able to burn their... Um, and then they just kind of use these pulls that you are forced to do as uh, time to let your CDs come back up. It's a very smart sequencing by them, I think. Yeah, especially when you're setting up for a boss like Tyrannical Raging Tempest, right? That's got to be something that's at the forefront of your planning here. And Thundered are going to be starting that fight now. Spell Reflect is on cooldown here, and watch that Spell Reflect cooldown for Alex throughout this fight. That thing is going to be used a lot. What's going to happen is he's going to go out of range of the boss and then hit the Reflect yeah. to send in one of those Wind Bursts back at the boss. Look at the damage done right now. How much damage Eight does each of the Wind so Bursts do back to the boss? Do you know? Uh, I think you can get the better part of a million damage from each Reflect, uh, depending oh. here. So it's like... First, okay, it's not first boss of uh, underrot level of reflection. It's, but it's not like, that much. No, I mean that boss did ten percent of its health with each of them. No, it's not. It's, it's not like quite uh, that much. It's still a lot. Though. Third boss of Shrine of the Storm reflection. Yeah, we can watch here. Okay, let's let's look at the details meter here because Alex is going to run out of range here in a second and hit that reflect. Yeah, we'll watch He's that done nine million He's damage out. so far. Nine point zero four. And that's going to spike up to nine point six five. Okay, yeah. So a little bit over five hundred k with each reflect is how much he's getting from it. 500k per 25 seconds on this boss is actually a, a significant amount of damage. Um, the, the Prot Warrior is actually quite fast in this dungeon. I think that Prot Warrior and DK have some of the most interesting things in this dungeon. So for the Death Knight tanks, obviously we haven't seen a Blood DK really. They can control like a Mystic and have a haste buff that goes on your group um, that gives you 20% haste for a while. But the Prot Warrior, I think that Spell Reflection just on this boss and in the third um, the third trash area alone saves a lot of time just from like the bolts and, and everything that you're able to reflect. Well, you can also reflect the last boss's conductive spear as well, and that is huge oh my value God. brought by that's, the warrior. That's also yeah. true, yeah, yeah. Being able to reflect that conductive spear is a massive damage. The spell reflection in this dungeon is sick. It's not, it, it's it's not as really strong good, as some of the yeah. BFA dungeons, but it's, it's quite potent. It's close, yeah. If it weren't for that, I do think you'd maybe have an argument for the Blood Decay with the Mystic Mind Control, though. It's really... That's a lot of value, too. I mean, that's 10% haste, 50% yeah. uptime, right? Or 20% haste, 50% uptime, right? So, uh, in that area of the dungeon, that's a lot of value. I think Alex is going to be the only person here who can get a refresh on his uh, Raging Tempest. He, he got the, the last ball very, very late here. And so now, look at this. He's spell reflecting that Wind Burst. I wonder if he's going to be able to... Is he going to leap out to get that... 
He could have gotten a refresh, but he didn't. Instead, he stayed on top of the boss because he reflected right after that, that lightning strike. Kind of unfortunate. Yeah, that's... Yeah. We're okay, though, here for Thunder. They're yeah. nearly finished with this boss. And yeah, it's, it's hard. Some of them, it's really hard to keep your stacks of refresh uh, as well in these, so... It, it can also be impossible depending on what happens. So sometimes the mm -hmm. balls will... Uh, become unsoakable depending on where they land it, it, like sometimes if they land on a rock that's off to the outside they become unsoakable on top of that if you don't get them like spawn far enough out there are some sets where you, you just like can't get a refresh depending on how fast it goes through so it, so, sometimes it's un, it's impossible to get a refresh more often than not though as long as you're trying to soak it as late as possible you should be able to get a refresh on a couple of sets and and you just kind of as, assign people to be able to take the late ones to make sure that they're able to uh, get those refreshes. All right, so Thunder now setting up for their first mini boss pull in the Tira and Maruk area. They're probably planning to get close to 100% count in this area, maybe up to 94, and then take 6% at the end of the dungeon. But rarely do we see teams taking more than 6% count at the end of the dungeon, so. Almost all of it is going to come from pulling in this area, and this is where Sanguine Explosive Management uh, starts to be really important because you have a lot of mobs yeah. in a lot of these pulls, and some of them do not respect your crowd control, right? Some of them are not going to be knockable, so very important to be proactive against uh, against these affixes. Yeah, I think that Death Speaker is the main one who does that, that Chant of the Dead cast, that circle that makes the mobs enrage and take take reduced damage whenever they have that enrage effect on them. That's, that's the big one that's super difficult to move i mean beyond that most of the rest of the mobs you can get moved assuming that you like you know you kick the corruptors you you move them in between the, the lockout duration and stuff like that but this is going to be super precise by thunder and i think it makes sense that they're taking this a bit slow this is an easy way for them to wipe if they try to get too aggressive in some of these spots i would i think that it's reasonable for them, for them to be double pulling some of the remaining packs of trash but in between their their either major offensive or major defensive cds you know, doing a pack like this and making sure that you have perfect sanguine management does make sense. Yeah, absolutely. Something something like this can be a good way to, you know, just guarantee that it's it's going to be a little bit cleaner, right? And you're, you're not gonna yeah, not gonna really lose too much time here or run the risk of too many deaths. So now, Mythic Meme Dream Team will get their chance of dealing with the Raging Tempest, landing that reflect on pull as well, of course. And they are going to try their best to catch up here, but they are so, so far behind, and Thundered are not letting up. They are setting up another massive pull in this Tira and Maruk area. Dangerous enemies here in this one as well. A lot of Death Speakers as well. And that Shatter Soul cast, very annoying. Quite a lot of incidental damage that you have to deal with as well, and then finding your soul can actually be quite challenging when there's all this much stuff going on. Okay, Looks so like Zook is just not going to bother. He's he's not even going to bother finding his soul, just waiting for the debuff to expire. Yeah, I mean the the debuff is only a thirty percent damage down, and so like it ma it makes sense for DPS to want to uh, pick up their soul immediately. For healers, you know, it, it's important that they grab it, but at the same point, there are other things that Bazook can be doing that is a little bit more valuable, particularly healing. And a lot of spots are killing explosives, where that thirty percent damage loss isn't as important because I mean. He's probably the most important player in this dungeon, making sure that he kills off all the explosives. And on top of that, he has that wing buffet to manage Sanguine super well. He is, he's definitely, if it's not Alex on that tank, it's, it's probably Bazooka is like the second or first most important member uh, in this group for this run. Yeah, explosive and extremely healer intensive affix in the MDI, right? Like this is, it's something yeah. where all the DPS, you know, they look at it and they're like, oh, I would lose this much damage by targeting explosive for a global. And then the evokers, they're like, well, I mean, I, I guess can I Azure could just Azure it. Strike every one of them. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what they are require, are making Bazook do. <laughs> and it's, uh, more often than not, it's a, like, a group effort to be able to kill explosives. You know, the, t the tank and the healer are, are doing... We're going to do most of it, but then like the DPS should kind of chip in in moments where a lot of stuff is going on. But for the MDI, and JB has talked about this a lot, I think he is the person who's been the most outspoken about it. It's just a situation where your healer does every single one, if, if possible. And if there are spots that your your tank or your DPS would have otherwise have gotten it, JB was like, oh yeah, you should just get better. <laughs> just kill it anyways. All right, Zyro's coming in in our Discord and saying that when you're saying wing buffet, that it's it's supposed to be wing buffet, like uh, 
Isn't that like a... <laughs> like Flame Goulet. Wing... We'll have to have a, a talk with him Wing later Goulet? about it. Flame Goulet, yeah, Flame Goulet from, uh, from Ruby Life Pools. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat with Zyra about it when he gets back in here. Makes is agreeing with him. I, I, I actually think you might be right, Tells. I think there's maybe Buffett and Buffet, and they mean different things. But, you know, I'm not... I'm not 100 percent sure. We will we will have an argument about this. I'm sure at the end of this uh, this dungeon. Still a little bit to go <laughs> though here. We would never argue. It's going to be a constructive conversation about the semantics of the English language. <laughs> well, yeah. For now though, we do we do get to watch Tira and Maruk for <laughs> Thundered, even equally as exciting. This beast caller is going to go down. That's going to put them at 94% count, and that's the magic number to mean that they just need the two mini bosses at the end of the dungeon to finish out their count. Or they could skip those two and do the five pack instead. But I suspect, especially with Sanguine, you're going to just want to do those two mini bosses instead. I uh, we've seen teams uh, across oh. the weekends. Oh my gosh, dude! The, the... Yeah, dangerous Sanguine. They're beautiful. <laughs> Three different people tried to stop that Sanguine, right? You saw Typhoon. You saw Wing, Buffet, or Buffet. And you saw Death Grip, all used against that single ability. Every single one of those, every single player was trying to make sure that the boss did not get Sanguine healed there. Unfortunate thundering overlap with the Gale Arrow here for Thundered. They end up just popping defensives and tanking it rather than spreading, because if you're near somebody but not stacked right on top of them, that that is very bad. You want to be either stacked on top of everybody or far away. It's so crazy that three people were trying to stop that Sanguine from happening. Meanwhile, Baby's A-bomb limb just was having none of it, trying to yeah. absolutely grief them. They had to bust out the wingy B. I, th I think that we're legally required to call it wingy B until we get a, a ruling on the field. Yeah, the, the wingy B. Mm. Okay, we got Tira and Maruki are leaping around. They have lust for the last boss, I and I think that that's... Not only is it a safety loss, but I think it, it actually makes the most sense. This is a dungeon that we've seen have actually a pretty large span of time across the weekends. I think the first weekend we had it, we had it on like a 22 fortified, and that dungeon was around the 20 to 21 minute mark. Now with this being a 23 Tyran, this, this is going to consistently be, you know, that 22 to 23 minute run, uh, just with how knock a defense it is. And then plus or minus minutes due to sanguine healing, uh, de depending on how you play. Thundered are doing a great job, though, and I, I love Bazook making sure that he doesn't clear his Thundering and instead using that uh, Evoker Staff to try to maximize the most amount of damage while that while he does have that Thundering on him. Yeah, Evoker Staff, big value. Evoker Staff and Manic Grief Torch are the two big value, like, few second channels that you can really try and make sure you're squeezing into a Thundering window whenever possible, so... Definitely look for teams trying to optimize for that. Tira and Maruk now at 30% for Thundered. VE and Nature's Vigil both being used as they approach this Gale Arrow to just make sure that everybody's topped both before and after the Gale Arrow. On this level of key, you can see everybody gets really low there. Dude. And the, the, the single shot after the Gale Arrow will potentially kill whoever it hits if that person hasn't been topped since then. So that's those off healing cooldowns are so valuable for this. DK is gross, man. He's just AMSing every single one as well. Like, that's so sick. I I, I don't think there's any world where this, the Unholy DK can even die to the Gale era. There, there are some specs that can particularly have a hard time against that Gale, um, against that Gale era. I think Rogue is typically one of them because they're uh, because that Gale era is not faintable, so they have to take, like, elusiveness in this dungeon to oh. make sure that they have some DR versus it. Mask and he got shot, I think, three times in a row by Tira while Bazooka's practically oom um, uh ends up going down Did they just battle rest that <laughs> did huh? they let's see two yeah, battle rests available 21 minutes on the clock yeah they must have right he's got the he's that's got the, a, the dk res thing on him that's Those a bone the, buds uh, b res right there for thunder that's what i love to see teams just uh just sending the battle res i mean you have three of them right like you really ever gonna need three on the last boss fight on the other hand, if you're Mythic Meme Dream Team, and you you are you would definitely choose for them to use the battle res there, right? You're just delighted about the chance of a wipe going up, even if it's ever so slightly. I, I mean, I don't know. The, bo the boss was low. Did we really have the B res there? No, not really. Does it kind of does it kind of help our vibes though if we if we commit the B res there on mask and yeah, you're gonna get a better time as well. Feel better about yourself. That's true. You know, I, I'm, d I'm down for them to commit the B res here if we have three deaths to the uh, these two mini-bosses plus the boss, we've done something wrong as well. Uh, I think I think that's kind of the thundered 
uh, process, and it makes sense to me too. They're doing a great job. This is actually a very difficult movement uh, part of the fight, mostly because uh, both... So there's multiple charges that you saw from the boss and one of those mini bosses, and then there are multiple frontals that you have to dodge out of the way of from both the boss and the mini boss, and, and that can cause like one of those quaking catastrophes if you accidentally uh, yeet yourself on top of another player. Yeah, definitely something that they're trying to avoid here. They are going to proc Thundering here at 79%, mostly focusing damage into one of the two mini-bosses as well here. And are they going to be taking these into the intermission, or are they going to be able to kill them before the intermission uh, is the question? Okay, so... <laughs> I had to do this this week because we were, we were going to deplete the key, and... We took these mobs into the intermission, and let me say it wiped us almost immediately. I don't, I don't think that Thunder will be uh, taking them into the intermission. I think that they will probably be looking to kill them off right around the time that Balakar Khan phases. So Balakar Khan phases about that 60% mark, but it has to run all the way to that uh, that middle position to activate. Meanwhile, they have like 20%-ish HP left on these adds. I think that killing those off while the boss is phasing it makes a lot of sense. But I mean, if, if they're able to play these with uh, it's going to be sketchy moly. for Thundered. Yeah, oh wow, here they go. Three or four of the casters are now coming into these two mini-bosses. And this is actually kind of oh, sketchy sanguine, as well, because they need sanguine, to save sanguine, a kick. Sanguine, Sanguine, Sanguine. as I... well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, wait, <laughs> wait a second. Okay. We use a knockback, we use an incapacitating shout, or incapacitating roar. The Stormbolt casts now are going to be disrupted with a Blinding Sleet and a Tail Swipe. Now it's going to be a Psychic Scream. And they've done it. They've okay. taken care of those four. Oh, beautiful rescue from Bazook. Saving Maskin as well. Bazook nice is an maneuver. absolute beast. So what happened there is, first off, they elongated that phase pretty much as long as possible while saying winning those mobs. And so that phase ended up lasting forever. On top of that, Bazook had to deal with explosives, heal the phase, and then rescues Maskin at the very last second. So Maskin doesn't die. That is... That is an... Excellent oh. play by the healer on, on the side of Thunder. Baby going down, but we do have two battle reses available. Uh, he does he does receive that one from Sub Chris. Going to be taking that in a couple seconds. He loses Lust. Not spectacular, but assuming that we don't sanguine the boss here, it should be mostly okay. Yeah, beautiful death of the mini boss far away, keeping that sanguine puddle in a place where it's not going to cause a problem for this fight. Twenty seven percent on Balakar Khan now. And their reflects have been lining up nicely against this conductive strike as well. You can see the next conductive strike is going to get reflected again as well. And we can play that same little game where we look at the details damage meter here. You okay. can see how much Alex is doing right now. And here comes the next conductive strike. I actually think most of the damage comes from the dot that oh. it reflects as well. But yeah, look at that yeah. thing spiking up from that dot now. That is a lot of damage being brought by oh, spell reflection D here. He's doing DK damage right now. He's beating the DK! Makes to be fair, the DK did man. die in cooldowns. No, 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 no. Ignore with that, lust. ignore that, ignore that, ignore that. Ignoring no, 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 that, no, no, ignoring that, of course. Chat, 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 don't listen to him. He's, the the Pro Warrior is more powerful than an Unholy Death Knight. Makes us in shambles. Oh, hang on, Unholy DK. Coming out back. Wait. Maybe getting the third place here. He got PI too. <laughs> there it is. It's going to be a bronze medal for for the unholy death knight on the damage meters and a sigh of relief beating the tank thundered though uh gonna be delighted to take this first game in the series over mmdt i can't hear pretty Zahana. textbook yeah typical it's okay I'm back now. okay let's go yeah. they gotta turn my mic on sometimes sometimes we talk we're, we're a little too excited to talk about the game but yeah i know a great dungeon from thundered there Really, the tiniest of mistakes, right? A death at the end of the third boss, a little bit of a scary intermission phase, but I have a clip of exactly what happened for MMDT okay. here. You can see Creepy did use that wing buffet. You were right, I was just trolling you. It's buffet whenever you to use in this terminology. On the saboteur, mm -hmm. and he went, in th when he, he went off and he shot off the spear, but you can see at the top here, that, that saboteur is still there at 5%. It's been there now oh. for about a minute. And the team realizes right about now, uh, yo, that oh, thing's still dismantled. No. <laughs> uh, oh, so, no. So, yeah, they just, they forgot about the saboteur. And, of course, when you kill it this late, there's not enough time for, this, for the spear to rearm. 
And they don't have a spear for the eruption. That's what happened. They just forgot about the mob. You gotta finish those guys off. There's no Shadow Priest in the group or ranged DPS in the group to, to dot those up and finish them off. And that's all, that's all she wrote, really. Like, the rest of the dungeon, all Thunder had to do was play clean, play safe. And they did. They played great. Very good Sanguine man management, and if I, I would not be surprised if we look at the Sanguine healing. Both teams will be relatively low. There weren't any like super egregious moments in this dungeon where it stacked up too much. It really just kind of all came down to this boss pipe at 30%, and just slightly cleaner execution of pulls from here on out in the dungeon. Yeah, nasty, nasty eruption there for MMDT. Brutal. Brutal the, turn of uh, events for them. Sanguine management, by the way, for Thundered here was pretty spot on. I, I didn't really have too many complaints. It, it's really, outside of the last boss, there was nothing notable with uh, with their Sanguine healing. It, it's just a situation that Sanguine is so difficult to manage just in this dungeon in general. And I think that, I mean, Thunder did a great job. Oh, is this the rescue? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think so. Had to yeah, get look that at that. In. Oh, so Ooh, cool. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Also so tried to get the group it was at the actually a Thunder. Too, yeah. It was a thundering yeah. clear, I think, right? Yeah, because you saw the life grip on the druid too. So, mm -hmm. uh, nice, nice combo of abilities from the uh, the different players there. Yeah, that was one of those wow. moments where I was in the replay channel, and I'm like, "We got to get a clip of this." All right, we're done. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop back over. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, are they done? Grab that. Did they leave this intermission because that was kind of scary, right? Dude. Oh, I was wrong though. MD MMDT. You know, you didn't really see Sanguine pop up on the meters too often, but I guess just the first pull. gradually over the course of the dungeon. I guess the first pull was probably where the mo where most of it was. It was like 10 mil. Over the course of yeah. the dungeon, yeah. 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 A little unfortunate. Really? Whenever you have 10 mil in the first pull, it, it was so sad. It, it, that's the pull that's it's the easiest to Sanguine as well, just due to the longbows not mm -hmm. being able to be easily moved. That's a tough one. Well, with that being said, that is Thundered taking a 1-0 lead in the series. We're now one game away from a potential Thunder Dome tomorrow. Thunder just have to bring it home. And look I at hate, the, uh, I hate the this damage name for this. Here. There's, you don't like the Thunder Dome? What would you call it, then? You come up with something Game. better. I, oh, I don't need that gimmicky name for <laughs> Thunderstruck versus Thundered, man. <laughs> Why not? But you see, they both have thunder in the name, so it's like a... I'm, a, I'm aware. I'm aware. Yeah, Thank like, you. I'll explain it later. I'll explain it later. Yeah. How, what, how what did it come to this? Next, why, why, am I, why am I hosting the Titanforge podcast? Like, what is going on right now? <laughs> uh, We're going to make a shape with our cameras, too. Next? Oh. Make a, <laughs> He's a trying. Hey, uh, uh, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't get the... Okay, my bad. All right. Okay. All right. Anyways, so yeah, what, well, what map moving is on to our next row? map, please, please tell uh, us. That's great. If we had a graphic for that, that'd be really, really useful right now. I believe it's a Ruby Live Pools. Our third map is Halls of Velards. I know that for sure. That'd it, be the first time seeing it this Life entire Pools. weekend. But we are going yeah. to Ruby Live Pools now, and this is a dungeon that's been really, really nasty for a lot of teams. Even Munka has not been playing this safe at all. Guys, I'm not going to make the triangle. Ah, uh, we can we can make a triangle. I'm not going to make it. All right, well, <laughs> that's, that's no. a good try. <laughs> yeah, but we are going to Ruby Life Pools, and I was, as I was saying, this is by far the most variance-based dungeon we've seen this entire weekend. The bolstering management is key. We've seen the top teams, Munka, having so many issues here. We haven't seen like a full-on clean run from any of the top teams at all in this dungeon yet. So, I mean... You would expect yeah. Thunder to win this because of the pedigree, right? How, how well they've been playing, how high their ranking is. But honestly, I feel like this is a toss-up. First pull is like a grabs? gamble, isn't it? F something 50-50? Oh, yeah. Well, well it depends on how you do the so first much. pull, right? Okay. Like there, there are some teams that are doing still like 30 plus percent in their first pull, taking it into the boss at the end, trying to like range some bolstering stacks, but still accepting some others onto the mini boss. That is unbelievably sketchy, right? And that's something that, that has a high chance of failure. Other teams though, have just been slowing it down. They've just been doing, you know what? We'll just do a nice little 20% first pull. We'll get some more count later, right? We'll not shroud after the second boss. We'll do a dragon. We'll do something like that. And that's how we're going to get our count. So it depends. Yeah, this could be a map where maybe Thundered are going to go more aggressive. And if that doesn't work out for them, maybe that will be Mythic Meme Dream Team's opportunity to come back in this one. Definitely the case. And I think a lot of the biggest issues we've seen 
like you mentioned, that first pull the bull string definitely needs to be managed properly. The main thing that we've been seeing from the teams is pretty mm -hmm. much just their tank just kiting that many bosses quick as far as possible to the back of the first boss room. But we've also seen a lot of like ninja pulls in the second area, a lot of thunderheads being pulled when teams aren't me aren't meaning to, and then just the the bolstering management on the destroyers is absolutely key. You know, a one or two bolstered inferno going off at the wrong time can easily take multiple people out. So this dungeon is definitely a difficult one. You just, you just got to be super careful. Like uh, your tank, I think, is the one that's definitely uh, the high, has the highest chance of dying, particularly on the first pull. And if, if you're taking Draghar into the first boss, um, you can block <laughs> Draghar, but the boss also does an infinite amount of damage as well. So it's a situation where we've seen tanks die even at 10% HP left on the boss. It's like, so you, you have to just be super careful. Um, and I think that, yeah, the, the point that, you should be like watching as viewers is for the first five or so minutes of this dungeon. If, if there's a mistake on either end, it's probably going to cost them the whole entire run. As we are starting it up, Thunder running that mage in here. I love the mage plus disc priest combination. That's a great one. Yeah, Maskin was using the uh, the mage for some of their time trials. Often we see it paired with the Shadow Priest, but Thundered are going to be sending it along with the Disc Priest. Ooh, Disc Priest, look at the debuff there as well. Taking a Toxic debuff there has used a either a Toxic Potion or File. I wonder which one. I wonder which Toxic Potion is being used there. I think he had a Toxic File on in... Oh my gosh, as Subchris goes down immediately, we rip a B-Res, but he lost Bloodlust. He lost all of his offensive CDs. This is going to be so scary for Thundered. Oh no, Dratnus, this is, this is very dangerous. Yeah, this is uh, definitely going to be sketchy, right? You lose that player, look at the damage meter, look how much damage has been lost from that Feral Druid, and now maybe that means defensives are going to expire before this pull does, and oh, you can see kiting. Alex actually forced to kite away from the boss as well. That's not where he wants to go with this pull, right? He wants to run towards boss uh, and take the dregs of this pull into boss, but instead he's going to have to go around this pillar and start just fleeing, gets life gripped back in, <laughs> as they continue okay. this kite. But Mythic Meme Dream Team also having a, a problem here. Their Evoker is going down towards the end of this pull, though, so they'll be able to save the battle res, at least. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that it's uh, pretty reasonable to save the B res here. This is going to be... Oh, an Earth Shaper got their cast off. No way, man. The Earth Shaper gets the full cast off, wipes Thundered. Alex, Alex is still kiting away with this pack. Maskin had uh, enough of the Chillweaver's shield spell stolen to be able to live uh, that Earth Shaper cast. But now Subchris is walking back so we can single res players. This is the opening that MMDT needed. This, this is absolutely what MMDT needed to be able to uh, take this down. They, they've pulled Draghar. They're pulling it with a couple well, elves and Chillweaver. They're taking a slow Look at the count, though. though. I mean, if you actually look at this exchange, it's, it's still not even that bad for Thundered, right? Okay, Thundered here yeah, are coming true. in with 35%. Like, they're, they're going to have a little bit more count out of this opening area. They are, on the other hand, going to be minus 15 seconds from death timers. It Is looks like maybe their man? DK released, died again to the, uh, the first mob, and is now getting mass rezzed. So that's going to cost them another five seconds, perhaps, if that... Uh, is indeed what happened there. And now they're going to be taking this mini boss into boss along with some free little whelpies that hang out in that area. Here MMDT they go. They're on the right the hand boss. side of your screen, though. They've already pulled the boss. And uh, for Thunder, this is one of the most dangerous parts. Like right on pull here, um, especially with Draghar and for both MMDT and for Thunder, there is a lot of damage going out on the tanks. Uh, they, they are able to block a decent amount of it, but that Steel Barrage cast just absolutely owns. Yeah, this is something that does a lot of physical damage. It is blockable, I believe, so it's not too bad yeah, for warriors, is. but a couple of bolstering stacks, and all of a sudden that shield is uh, getting mighty small. <laughs> so got to look out here as you can see that Defiler nearly dead for Mythic Meme Dream Team. They're focusing on Melodrussa right now, though, breaking this shield during the Frost Overload cast, and I wonder if they'll kick. They will. Some teams elect to not ca not kick the Frost Overload. Just let the boss channel that rather than doing Hail Bombs and... Uh, and the Cyclone. But yeah, interesting. They're going to not do that. They are going to run into these whelps, though, and get a little bit more funnel. Okay. Always fun. Always fun, especially if you're the Feral no. Druid. When those ads yeah. get spawned. 
You can kind of see it as well. If you if you look at the Feral Druid, like, look at that energy bar. Whenever there's extra whelps nearby, that energy bar is always vibing. Whenever it's just pure oh, single yeah, target, yeah, yeah. on the other hand, look at Thundered side, right? That energy bar more often is going to be on the lower side of things, right? Well, it's because, like, Tiger's Fury resets. If, like, a, a mob nears you, uh, near you with your dots on it, dies uh, with your bleeds on it, you get, like, Tiger's Fury, which immediately regens you some, some energy, plus it gives you, like, a damage amp. Uh, plus, it makes your bleeds do a little bit more damage for their duration. Thunder has done a pretty good job of catching up to MMDT on the boss HP, Dratnos. Yeah, Thunder and R kind of zooming here. Subchris there, okay. smashing damage into the boss. They're not bothering spawning extra whelps, and what they're also doing is they are all focusing Melodressa. They are just cleaving down Draghar. Draghar is going to die for them right <laughs> towards the end of this boss fight. It's dying at almost the same speed as Melodressa, which is kind of crazy. Mythic Meme Dream Team put a lot more damage into it instead, which made their fight safer, but it also made it last a little bit longer. So Thundered are going to be coming out of boss one, slower than Mythic Meme Dream Team, but not by much. They are okay. definitely still within the range of if our route is faster from here, we can still win this without needing Mythic Meme Dream Team to make a mistake. How, do, does that also take into account the 20 seconds of death differential? Like yeah. How, how much? Okay. You, you, so you think that you think, think that there's a chance that I think that if Thunder are clean from here, faster? I think they probably still even have like a minute of mistakes to give uh, against Mythic Meme Dream Team. Like I. I suspect that the that just the end of their dungeon mm -hmm. is going to be is faster by, uh, by maybe yeah maybe thirty seconds or a minute or so. So I don't know. I mean I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that's that's what I suspect here. Just looking at like their times and other dungeons and their time trial times and such. They do have more count All as right, well, so right? They have six percent more count. That's one less dragon they have to pull. So maybe they're even just tied right now. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's something to factor in. So looking looking just at uh, both the timer off of the first boss and deaths taken into account, Thundered is around that 30 second mark behind. Um, now, I'm really interested in seeing where MMDT goes. We know that they, they are going to, okay, they likely have to play a dragon here uh, just to make sure that they're going to achieve 100% enemy forces. But which dragon and where are they going to be going? It looks like they're going to the Flame Galay side first. This makes sense. Oh. We've seen a lot of teams double up uh, the destroyers here, depending on like the Flame Galay patrol. And MMDT are already getting that done as they skip past where Flame Gullet stands and they're doing double destroyer. Very dangerous pull on MMDT side. Thundered are also going big here. They're doing double destroyer. They're doing the entire Thunderhead side minus Thunderhead. Okay. So both teams are on double destroyer here, but then Mythic Meme Dream Team are going to have to fight a dragon at some point, unless they want some of those lightning channelers from the middle, which I suspect they don't have any interest in pulling those. those Do you think those, that we're uh, gonna shock see a team... Do you think we'll ever see a team pull a bonus shock caster on purpose? I don't think so, no. I've pulled, I've pulled a few of those for fun. I don't really understand what they do, but uh, people just start dying. I don't really know why. So I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm leaving those things alone. They can do their uh, storm infusion in the middle there. That's fine by me. They, they put a elsewhere. curse on the players. They also knock players back. Uh, the, those are the two big mechanics. And the knockback is like infinite damage. And then if you don't have a D curse as well, they'll they can like wipe you. I see. Ooh, one scorchling left by Thunder. They're gonna run over that to bring that okay. with them into this next pull. By the way, something that we don't really talk about too often, the routes that these MDI teams do require you to pull every single Scorchling, and if you miss one, then you miss count in this dungeon. And so that's something that it's commonly overlooked, like just how important these Scorchlings are to grab. Because if you do see one missed, you will watch the team uh, proceed to miss count, and that, and that can be problematic. It's difficult because like on live, normally you're going over count by a little bit, you know, five to 10 counts or so. so if you miss a couple of Scorchlings, it's not the end of the world. But with how precise these MDI routes are, no, like the, the every single Scorchling just has to make sure that they get tagged at some point. Yeah, luckily they are all, they spawn in pretty predictable places, right? You know where they're at, you know, yes. you, know you grab these five here, uh, and you get the, the next few before the last boss, and uh, you get your 100% of them that way. But wow, Thundered are going to be doing a massive pull here. And there's Flame, Flame Goulet flying overhead. Hopefully they don't pull it. Looks like they've avoided it for now. Flame Goulet is going to land, and yeah, they're not going to be pulling that. Mythic Meme Dream Team, on the other hand, still do probably... It's probably Thunderhead going to be pulled by Mythic Meme Dream Team soon, right? Or did they already... Yep. Yeah, it is. Okay. okay, here it comes. 
And it is a 22 Tyran, so the trash should be, you know, not too bad. Are they going to pull Thunderhead into the Destroyer? They're, they're going to pull it into the Destroyer at half health would be my guess here, so that they can even cleave reasonably well. Okay. And look, they're saving their Nature's Vigil as well. This is really smart. Saving the Nature's Vigil for the more dangerous part, which is going to be when that Blazebound Destroyer gets added. We also saved the Cloak uh, also. that That's, again, yeah. another pretty big safety uh, feature. You can, like, pre-cloak the Rolling Thunder as it comes out to make sure that you get, like, less group-wide damage. And we don't pre-cloak that one. We'll save it for next, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I think pre-cloak is the best way to... It's the best way to play this one, so probably the next Rolling Thunder is... It might be a pre-cloak, or maybe you just know you're going to be fine anyways. You have Nature's Vigil up anyways, and uh, you just save mm -hmm. the cloak for, you know, an emergency on the boss or something. The boss we'll or see something. how Mythic Meme Dream Team He's... play this. The boss is already pulled by Thunder, though. Oh my god, dude, they're owning. Uh, okay, something that we also need to talk about. So how MDI teams tank this boss generally. So on live... You have teams that will go like all the way around the ring, right? But on MDI realms, the teams don't want the uh, additional travel time of like walking that half ring uh, to just get back to this boss area before the final trash packs. And so what they have done instead is since they skipped the dragon, they can't walk around anyways. And then on top of that, they're going to uh, occupy the least amount of space possible and summon these these ads in like the best spot. Make sure they bait the boulders near perfect uh, near perfectly, which is not something that commonly happens in my groups, but making sure that you have perfect boulder baits and add summons is is going to be paramount for Thunder to not wipe here. Yeah, so they start towards Flame Gullet side a little bit, send the first few boulders into the walls here, summon their first add yep. over on this side as well, and then they're going to slowly move. They've got these world markers down, so they got to be careful because now they're approaching Thunderhead's location. They do have a Mind Sooth available from Bazook uh, to help manage that. But now they're going to be baiting a boulder, and they bait a boulder just kind of right into the old fire, using up very little of their remaining space from that boulder. And they're going to be killing one more ad or two more after this, and they've got so much space, right? They can bait one sort of over to the left again towards Thunderhead, and then they can bait one in the corner of that wall, and, and both of those will be very safe for them as they get a boulder beautifully aimed into the existing fire as well. Okay, so we're, we're summoning the ad. We need to make sure Thunderhead's that Thunderhead's going to be flying have... back soon. They're going to land a mine suit, next. but they got to be really careful here. Actually, Thunderhead might be a a problem for them if they don't get out of here it, soon. It, it is quite close to them um, where, where they're standing currently. They do. This is like basically once they kill this ad, they're going to be walking straight towards the exit. Um, it, it should be more or less okay. MMDT. Uh, they're playing a more live-esque approach is what it looks like, where they're, they're just kind of... They're going to utilize the space that they freed up from that Thunderhead, but that's going to cost them somewhere in the order of 25 seconds of runtime. Yeah, they're going to have to go back, whereas if you look at Thundered, the reason this is the MDI strategy is because Thundered are going to end this boss fight right where they want to be. And this is, this is really efficient, but it is scary because if they are ever slow here, if they ever, like, lose a DPS, all of a sudden they they have a finite amount of space here. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was really scared of where they're tanking this because on these, uh, like, rings that you see, the boulder sometimes can do weird stuff oh. where it'll just, like, instantly explode. Uh, they got a second Inferno cast off from that ad. Dude. They were able to heal it up. Bazooka's critically oom. Bazook nearly died at the end there to his own corrupting rage file plus the decayology, the, the random decay dot that you sometimes get as well. So those two yeah. things landing on him at the same time from <laughs> drinking that toxic file. You can see he's got a, he's got that dot on him again, taking a little bit of extra damage from that, from that Dude, toxic I am, file. I am a tepid versatility enjoyer. I, uh... Yeah, crit's so good for the, uh... For the discs, though, so, compared to verse for healing and for damage. What's the deal with that wow, knock this is a big goal. into? What's the deal with that knock into Ursula's Vortex for Thunder? Is it just to try to keep the mobs HP even um, to where that High Channeler is not going to get like bolstered up? I think so. Yeah, I think that they need to make sure that High Channeler dies here first, and that Tempest Channeler dies soon after, because those are the two ones that cast Lightning Storm. Either of those mobs getting a lot of bolstering stacks is going to be very dangerous to them. So you can see High Channeler goes down, but Tempest Channeler is actually the second highest health mob here now. That mob is going to have five or six stacks of bolstering on its next Thunderstorm cast, but luckily they are able Lots. to kill it before then. 96.97% count now for Thundered. They do need to get a little bit more. 
Perhaps two, it's the two, two Storm uh, Warriors wars. from the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, wow, this is really the Mythic Meme Dream Team are also on Ravati here. They're really close behind here as well. And remember that Mythic Meme Dream Team have 20 seconds of death timer in their advantage too. So if Thunder stumble here, this actually is still a really close game. I, dude, for some reason, they MMDT looked like they were so far behind on the second boss that I think that both you and I kind of wrote them off as like, oh yeah, this is this is gonna be difficult for them to catch back up. But with that 20 seconds of death advantage, if they're able to get the boss, if they're able to get the final well, boss pulled in time, it should be okay. Are they about to have a bolstering catastrophe here? It's certainly starting oh. to look a little bit sketchy. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that thunder, mm -hmm. or that tempest channeler for sure. Thundered, on the oh. other hand, have to make a tough choice here between boss damage and survivability, right? How much do you put into the dragon versus how much do you do to Urquhart to speed up your overall dungeon? Now, they also have these two storm warriors that need to die. The sooner those things die, the sooner they'll stop losing all that haste on their tank, although I guess it's just their tank, so nobody else really cares about that. Okay. It, now thundered here. Uh... With those Storm Warriors kind of dying, the melee DPS are a lot safer. Now the only real thing that they have to worry about is making sure that they don't kill themselves with Thundering. Thundering is really, really annoying on this fight. Uh, that, that breath that that dragon does is impassable. And so, like, if you make sure that, like, if your group doesn't drop the fire in a good location or move in one solid group, you can start to run into issues where people aren't going to have clears for that Thundering. And right now, you do see the group is split up. That fire should end right before their Thundering does, so they should be able to link up and get it cleared right at the last couple of seconds. That was that was very dangerous for Thunder. That was exactly what I was talking about there. Now, Thunder actually sent their Lust on pull rather than... Uh... Rather than it was on the trash fifty percent mark on the trash pack, rather than on the fifty percent mark of the boss, so this is going to be kind of sketch for them as they get to the end here. They do have a lot of mana, but Disc Priest, you know, no power infusion, not an awful lot of cooldowns against this. I suspect we're going to see barrier soon if uh, if that hasn't already been used. Yeah, this is starting to get kind of dangerous. Karaka at eight percent, they might get another flame spit. You're getting set one more. Here. Gonna be close. Like getting... Karaka jumps into the air, dies before oh, okay. casting the flames, but though brilliant by Thundered. All right. We and now, those. even though 20 seconds of death timer separate these teams, I think Thundered are gonna be able to finish off this boss before that. Although, if you look at Mythic Meme Dream Team, they're actually not that far behind. Karaka is at 30% for them as well. So, Thundered really need to end Urquhart here and start that 20 second clock. Because Mythic Meme Dream Team are closing in as well. Uh, but they but it's not even on, on yeah. the end here. It's not even on Karaka, uh, Karaka's death, unfortunately, for MMDT. It's on Urquhart's right. death, too, which Urquhart is so healthy for MMDT. Like, 50% of this boss for 20 seconds? I, I, don't, I don't know if MMDT is going to be able yeah. to uh, make this up. The clock does stop here for Thundered, and for a few seconds, they don't know whether they've won or lost. They are going to wait with anticipation, and they're going to learn that they did manage to get this one. But wow, was it close. Mythic Meme Dream Team did such a great job in this dungeon. But it is going to go to Thundered. 2-0 in the series. Not bad. There it is. You guys can me this time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay, great. Back. There it is. Thundered will take that series home. 2-0. Incomplete the Thunderdome. Sorry, titles. I had to say it. For our match, for our lower bracket match tomorrow. So, Dreadnoughts and yeah. I are looking at our chops for that one. That's going to be a good one. But let's take a look at what happened in this dungeon here, because this was a very Ruby Life Pools-esque Ruby Life Pools. I don't think anyone's <laughs> had a perfect run on this dungeon all week, right? And it started off quick. This first pull, that Tecton Slam going off, that was like three or four bull strings next to instantly one-shotting three of the players in, this, uh, in their group. Of course, the Feral Druid can just stealth back, but man, this is a rough way to start the dungeon for him. That's for sure. I have a question. Is this dungeon hmm. and Temple of the Jade Serpent the most volatile dungeons we have this season? Where it's like more often than not, some team is going to have like a catastrophic mistake. And, and, and honestly, in most situations, both teams are going to have something that doesn't go perfectly right. It's it, Because it seems like both both this and Temple of the Jade Serpent are uh, dungeons that you do pulls that are just so dangerous. You know, you're probably right. I think this and Temple of the Jade Serpent are probably like the highest potential for that kind of variance. But I think it's also heavily you know, dungeon level specific and also ethic specific, right? When you when you okay. mix in bolstering without difficult the dungeon is already, yeah, that definitely ramps it up a lot. And I think, you know, 
even going in tomorrow with the four best teams of the weekend, I still fully expect to see a ton of wipes, but there is the time. 17 minutes and one second. Again, not the fastest time, but beating the competition is all you have to do here. You don't have to go as fast as the top end teams when you're not actually playing against them. So Thunder, you know, reading the assignment, doing the assignment, doing a good job of it, and find their way into the top four tomorrow. Yeah, I think that they're yeah. able to save probably over a minute without the, without those mistakes they oh, had early on. Easily. Maybe even more. Minute and a half, maybe. Yeah, it was a disastrous first pull. It almost lost them to MMDT. Credit to MMDT for being so close in time uh, to almost claw that one away from Thundered. But unfortunately, though Thundered are going to the Thunder Dome, MMDT are going to be going Thundered home. Not coming <laughs> back tomorrow as they've been eliminated from our tournament. Don't look at me. I see him looking at me on his other <laughs> monitor <laughs> in our feed. I do, do not look at me as you say this, bro. <laughs> How long have I, you been sitting I, on that one? About a minute <laughs> I and a half. I just have to know. Yeah. That's pretty good. I like it. Yeah. Uh, I like... Uh... Side note, I really like how we have like pretty high-level dungeons this season for MDI. In a lot of the MDIs mm -hmm. before, we've had medium, medium high-level keys, but this this season we've actually had fairly fairly high keys just as a whole, ranging from twenty to twenty-three. And I mean, we saw that twenty-two ruby life pools. The the additional levels really just throw a wrench into a lot of things, and it opens up teams for vulnerability and, in my opinion, more entertaining series. I, I think it's super cool to see how the teams adapt and. Are they going to take something that's a little bit safer but slower to make it more consistent? Or are they going to go all out for the strat that they know is like the theoretical best? And I think that uh, just varying and weighing your options is something that's super cool. And like MMDT, they played a slower first pull. They, they got a little bit less count, but the, the more aggressive strategy worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have, when you think about it, right, I don't think we've ever been this close in terms of dungeon difficulty compared to what people are pushing on live. <laughs> since Legion, yeah. right? This is, it's been a long time. And we still have the lower keys in there to get those real, like, typical past few years MDI experience, but it's been great. Dratnos, did you have a point you wanted to add on at the end there? No, rarely, rarely do I have much. I, I guess I was just going to say, you probably would get the Thundering Hero title if you timed all the keys at the same level as they're done in the MDI. It'd be pretty close. That, it's, it uh, would be close. It's insane <laughs> how high we're getting here, yeah. So... Uh, very cool to see the teams working here. It's also been an interesting weekend because we've seen so much bolstering because it's in that Ruby Life Pools and that Algathar that are in so many of our series. Uh, yeah. It's been cool. That's really thrown a wrench in a lot of the routes that we've seen over the past few weekends. We've had to see a lot of adaptation, a lot of innovation out of the teams. But going into tomorrow, now we are going to get that Monka versus Cheese upper semifinals. Winning team earns their ticket to MDI Global Finals. That's going to be an exciting series. And I will guarantee you a dungeon that we haven't seen before tomorrow. Halls of Valor 22 Fortified Sanguine Volcanic. And I think that that is going to be a really, really interesting dungeon. Sanguine is an affix that it really separates the top teams from the bottom teams a lot of the time. And making sure that you just have perfect Sanguine management, a dungeon that is uh, as deadly as Halls of Valor is going to be so cool. I, I love I love HOV. I think that HOV is so sick for MDI uh, level like speed running and how teams have been presenting it. And of course, yeah. not to be mistaken, we also have the loser of that matchup will fight against the winner of the Thunder Thunderdome Thunderdome matchup, oh not the Thunderhome matchup. <laughs> and the winner of that oh. match will take our second seed. So, got a great series of teams tomorrow. I mean, all of these teams have definitely shown off some pretty interesting tech over the weekend. And honestly, like between Thunderstruck and Thundered, I don't really know who I would favor in that matchup. Thunderstruck have shown off some really cool strategies, but they really haven't quite been able to put it together. I don't know, you have any predictions for that lower bracket matchup, battles? What do you think? It's weird because I feel like Thunder have been a little bit more consistent than Thunderstruck, but I think that Thunderstruck have, you know, in some situations, slightly faster times. Uh, I did I did pick Thundered, so I think that I... I think I'm going to go with Thundered as my uh, winner of the Thunder Dome, <laughs> as it's continuously called, even, even against my own wishes. I will name. say, when I that. chose Thundered as my wild card, I honestly thought that was Dr. J's team. I thought it was Thunderstruck, <laughs> but I said Thundered on accident. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the case for any of the other casters. I wouldn't be surprised. I made a well, mistake, but you know what? Thundered have played well. I'll stick by them. I mean, Thunder, Thundered is a team that has played together more consistently. They have like a core of three players that have played together a lot, and we know that like 
having veteran like a team experience not even just like uh individual players but having like good team chemistry is one of the most important parts whereas you know thunderstruck are the team that has been more or less like slapped together lamike and jay have played together before but velo soda yoda or i guess velo is also kind of in that um but soda and yoda also new on that team so i guess both these teams have a core of three players but i don't know it seems like thunder have just had better chemistry for whatever reason yeah i don't know i i'm i'm excited about both teams i think thunderstruck as well i think that there's a good chance that the teams even have kind of lasered in on this match being the crucial one in the bracket for both of them right uh, this one and i guess the one that follows right the lower finals because uh, it seemed pretty likely they were going to end up here getting knocked down by either Monka or cheese and yeah i uh, i'm really interested in seeing how that upper finals goes tomorrow between Monka and cheese skylark uh, played in gulch trotters which was one of the top mdi teams back you know back in legion whenever it was current and starting out in halls of valor skylark has always been good in like these these really weird dungeons sometimes we know he was like the king of spires of ascension for whatever reason and i have a suspicion that he's going to be su and look super sick in hov that guy that guy is good at old dungeons too it's great also not to mention cheese has been a team that just breaks out of the meta pretty much wherever they can right like showing off the affliction warlock i'm actually so sad that i wasn't yeah, here for that true. series because i would have loved to just gush about affliction warlock because that class has seen some buffs and it can do some pretty cool things but it was a good dungeon for them, right? Taking a 2-0 series like that, it, it looked easy for them. I mean, we'll see how it works against Monka, and we did see them actually, you know, go back to more of a meta comp. I don't know, like, look, looking at the series tomorrow, do you think they're going to tend to play more meta, or do you think we'll continue to see more of, like, the Havoc Demon Hunter plus off-meta picks threaten us? I think Havoc Demon Hunter is a meta pick. It's one of, one of two, that and Vengeance. Um, so... Okay, I... Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. You said the demonology warlock actually as well. Back in Wad. He's, he stun locked me. He actually just stun locked me. I was just. I can't believe you said that. Well, that's we'll going to do it for us today here. That is it for day two of the MDI. Tune back in tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 a.m., 1 p.m. Eastern time, or 7 p.m. CET to see which of these four teams will qualify for our global finals. It's been a great day of Dungeons. We sent four, four of our teams home. We'll see you guys tomorrow.